All right, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Horn Board is called to order. Today is Monday, June 5th, 2023. It's 8.30 a.m. <clears throat> Could you call the roll, please? Jared Hudson. Present. Here. Here. Adam Hudson. Here. Adam Here. Present. Okay, oh, there you go. I was gonna ask you to adjust the camera, thank you. So our first item under regular business is review and approval of the minutes from our Monday, May 15th, 2023 meeting, which are included in your packet. Are there any corrections? Madam Chairman, I have reviewed the minutes the meeting of uh, May 15th, and all the information is correct. And I'd like to make a motion that we accept the minutes as printed. Second, we have a motion by Mr. Roche, second by Mrs. Jackson to approve mm -hmm. the minutes from Monday, May 15th, as presented, as printed. Uh, are there any objections? Hearing none, the minutes are approved. So we'll move right on into uh, our other items of regular business, and that is consideration of applications for clemency. And our first case is Mr. Batts. Would we get Mr. Batts, please? Would you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and your current mailing address. Casey Batch. Casey Batch. All right, Mr. Batch, I'm going to read some identifying information in the record <clears throat> and ask you to verify it. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like to uh, advise our board members that Mr. Roche has asked to be recused from uh, this particular case today due to his familiarity with the facts and the participants in the case. So it will just be four of us and it will require unanimous factors. <clears throat> so Mr. Batts, you're here this morning, you're seeking a pardon with restoration of firearms. You were um, sentenced in the 18th Judicial District of Angelin Parish uh, in June of 2011 for second degree battery. Um, so, and you received a three year Paris jail sentence that was suspended all the 30 days. Uh, and then uh, in February of 2013, there was an appeal for a new trial that was denied. The judge sentenced you to serve 30 days in the West Baton Rouge Paris jail and six months house. Is that correct? Everything except for the event. Okay, yeah, thank you. Let me fix that. Um, your case this morning has been assigned to Mr. Freeman. Would you answer his questions? Okay, Mr. Bat. Um, how old are you? Okay, and uh, what's your educational level? I have an associate. Okay. Uh, what what do you have? What do you think? Okay, it was, it was in general. Okay, general study. Okay. Uh, have you ever had any other charges since that uh that arrest? Any DWIs? Any that? Did you have a seatbelt violation? Oh, I saw that where they charged you a great a big fine. So I may have gotten a speeding ticket. Got reduced to seatbelt. Maybe so. All right. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. And, and when did you get off of uh, supervision? We did everything. It was served the town. Did it? I'm sorry. Did it only two day, uh, on the very next day, two days. Mm -hmm. Had the monitor on. Kept it on for that very last day. Mm -hmm. Probably knock everything out. Was okay. You were charged with malfeasance, but you were convicted of second degree battery. Uh, I know emotions were running high that night because they had said a deputy had got his leg broke by Mr. Paul doing the arrest. Now, I'm going to ask you, you know, there's 
tons of different stories. You know, they change their statements and all of this. Today's the day to be truthful. They tell me, you know, were emotions running high? Did it have anything to do with it? Or your version of the events that night? I'm sorry, it never changed. It, it has always been, and I, I said, my God. You know, I'm saying, but I've done my job. I think I was pretty convincing to the uh, jurors that I did my job. There was no ill will. I did my job. It just happened that they had to give me to show that I don't, I've never understood how I can do my job. It's different thing in my life. Okay. Um, was there any flashlight or black object? Um, Would you, uh, I, and I, I believe I already have the answer to this, would you do anything different? Uh, the only thing I would do different is instead of going home, I pay for it right then and there, I would put my wallet. That would be the only thing I would change. I would actually call my people. I would call my captain. Right. But I, I know that they teach us in law enforcement, though, to wait 24 hours and Get your head clear, you know, where you're not thinking. Uh, what before did that happen? Okay. Uh, were you in the Army? How long did you serve in the Army? Eight years. Okay. And, and what was your discharge? Okay. I thank you for your service. Uh, How long did you work for uh, the sheriff's office prior to this happening? Eight years or so. I don't remember. I tried to put all this behind. I understand. I would say it's six or seven. Uh, where are you working at now? And how long have you been working for them? Seven years, eight years. How do you give back to the community? Do you do any community service? Our own business outside of where I work, where we work with uh, is in uh, baseball. Outside of that, we do a lot of giving back to them. Parents and parents who have to take lessons for kids. That has to be the Do you have any kids, uh, Mr. Bass? Two. And, and how long have you been married? Better not forget this one. 10 years. 10 years. Uh, you know, looking at the law enforcement, which uh, there's nothing much you can do about that, but the comments, uh, there was no comment from the judge. Of course, the judge at the time was James Beth, and now Kevin Kimball has that seat. Uh, the district attorney, Ricky, I mean, uh, Becky Shoes, speaking on behalf of Richard Ward, is opposed. The sheriff, Mike Cass, of West Baton yeah. Rouge, is unopposed. Uh, your family, Ashley Bat, your wife, is unopposed. And the victim, Stacy Powell, is opposed and says he still gets dizzy from the events that took place. Um, and you did file for appeal, as Mr. Nazza said, and I think that appeal was denied, correct? Right? Okay, I have no further question. Okay, Mr. Jones, that's how long you need. 
I'm fine, thank you. Um, why do you believe the jury had to convict you of something? Three years after I was sent I ended up walking into a grocery store and I started to rent some money. He didn't have to tell me, and I didn't ask. His comments me that they had to give him something. Did he say why? I didn't ask. Him. Because, you know, back in 2011, you could say very rare for someone in law enforcement to be convicted. And so I don't know what particular pressures would have been brought there on uh, jurors to, if they didn't believe that there was evidence that you had overstepped your bounds and that you had uh, committed a, a crime against all of them. They were under no obligation uh, to find you guilty. Was it a six, it was a six person jury, is that correct? Yes, So. All six jurors had to have agreed on the verdict. And so, you know, again, uh, I've been, I was a judge for 28 years. And typically, again, you know, if, if there was some, if there was a juror who felt strongly that you had done nothing wrong, it would have been a mistrial, it would have been a hung jury. And so I'll tell you that it concerns me that you view yourself as a victim when you went through the legal process, you were a tried by a jury of your peers, they listened to the evidence, and uh, they found that you had used excessive force against this individual, and thus they convicted uh, you of second degree battery. And so, you know, even today, as you stand before us, you're the victim and not the person who is beaten in that shower. And, and that, I'm sorry, sure that is concerning to me personally, because acceptance of responsibility for me is very much part of my decision making process. Um, Why do you need a pardon? It seems as if you're doing very well in your life. So why do you need a pardon? Can I, can I say one thing? I, I don't consider myself a victim. That's not that's, that's what I'm portraying. That's not what I'm saying. I never understood how first would say I did my job. You found me innocent, but found me guilty of beating me. And if I beat his hand intention, wouldn't that call for me to be guilty of not job and acting outside of That's only that's that's where any of that comes from. It's just I never understood how that could be. The reason I would like to have or is to have my life. I served my country, I did what I, I needed. Well, what to. aspects of your life don't you have? I, I can't take my children from you. I can't defend myself. Yeah, I got really can't do anything. I mean, outside, I can't vote. That's the biggest. The one thing that I did fight for was to be able to have that fight. But it's. The felons now have the opportunity to vote after a place. I've tried to go to register a vote and do it. I've been denied every day. Can you tell me why? It's the most recent time they attempted. Last year. And I guess also it troubles me that you said you wouldn't do anything. Because I felt I did my job. I didn't feel, never felt like I intentionally beat him more than what he did to be. I didn't well, feel what, like what I, 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 I beat him. Beating never needs. No, I, I agree. I, I, don't, I don't mean it like that. You say more you than he needed to be, never should have happened to begin with. There are lots of ways to restrain an individual, particularly when there are multiple officers that then necessitate beating or kicking or allegedly striking someone in the face with the dark. 
I mean, you know, he was already in custody. He was fighting, he was fighting in his more confined space. And okay, that made it uh, even more difficult for him to do much at all. You all were, there were three of you at least. I truly believe that three grown, healthy men could restrain a person who might might even have been impaired in some you know, alcohol or whatever. So again, I guess it it concerns me that even after going through the week process, even have after having served the sentence for the office, you still don't believe that your actions were in and that does concern me. That's all I have. Thank you, Mrs. Jackson. Have you had any contact with Mr. Paul since all this happened? There's seen him in the grocery store or anywhere like that. All right. I don't see any other questions. Is there a statement you'd like to make to us before we go? Uh, to, I guess, to be the same person all over the person of your human. I thought I can't continue to do the closing. I do decide to keep doing it. All right. <clears throat> so uh, we're we'll prepared for that, Mr. Freeman. You know, Mr. Batts, this is a, a real, real tough case. Um, you know, I, I, I asked earlier because I, I was in law enforcement 35 years. I, I may have seen you before. I used to work in West Andrew District Probation Parole. I, I don't recall it. So, um, and I know emotions run high when we think one of our own has been hurt. But the bottom line to me is that you you know you you've had a good cleansing period, done nothing wrong since then. You do give back to the community. You served your country, and I don't think you're a threat to the community. My vote is to grant his pardon with restoration. Susan Jackson. So that's um, spite my concerns about the attitude about the whole matter. I'm going to show you the break you didn't show me. And my vote today will be likewise to grant, recommend a part of the restoration of my Mr. Mayor Ball. Bats, this is a very tough case. You know, I read your file and my comments were very, very similar to the questions Judge Jackson asked you. I had hoped you would come in this morning and say, you know, I've had an opportunity to reflect. I had an officer who I thought was injured. I overreacted. I've taken some anger management. I've looked introspectively. I realized what I did wrong, and I would do something different. But you didn't say that. You said I would do the same thing I did before, and, and that and that really bothers me. Uh, you have served your country honorably. All of those things uh, were true. You appear to be a very honest man. Do you have any intentions of going back into law enforcement? Mr. Batts, I, I'm going to vote with my colleagues to grant your uh, pardon, to, uh, to recommend that your pardon be granted for full restoration problems. But I'm, I'm going to ask you to really look inward and come to grips with yourself. See if maybe you can't find some things that maybe you did wrong that night that you might change. Based upon 
your history based upon your community, and especially your service to others. All right, Mr. Bass, um, I will, because of the um, position the sheriff took, he's the one that called me in and asked for the investigation, and he's taken the position he's not opposed to your clemency application, so I'll vote with my colleagues, and uh, so, sir, on your behalf, we'll make a recommendation to the governor for part of the frustration call. Thank you. All right. Good morning. Ma'am, would you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and your uh, current mailing address, please. Your, your sound is off. Sorry. Okay. My, my name is Shannara Pouncey um, or Anderson. My address is 3002 Stagecoach Road, Keithville, Louisiana, 71047. All right. Good morning. You're here this morning, you're seeking a pardon with restoration of firearms. Uh, you were sentenced in the first judicial district, Caddo Parish, uh, in March of 2016 for a theft conviction. You received a four years uh, hard labor sentence that was suspended, you were placed on four years of active probation, and you were ordered to pay restitution. Is that information correct, Ms. Council? That's correct. Your case this morning has been assigned to Mr. Rocha. Would you answer his question? Sure. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Rocha. Good. Would you like me to call you Mrs. Anderson or Mrs. Ponce? I answer to all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're married to Mrs. Ponce right now, right? That's correct. Okay. So we're going to call you Mrs. Ponce. Ms. Ponce. Sure. Let's start off by, on March 11, 2013, mm -hmm. he went to uh, Mrs. Alarm's apartment with his aunt, Phyllis Spark. Is that correct? That's correct. And while at the apartment, you lifted a checkbook with personal checks belonging Mr. Haji Salon, is that correct? That's correct. And you wrote checks out in the amount of 600 and, I'm sorry, $762,810, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, what did you use the money for? You know, I wish I could remember looking back. Um, more than likely, um, probably something very insignificant, to be perfectly honest. Had it been anything significant, then I would likely remember exactly what I used it for. Well, um, in a statement given to the police or the parole officer, you said you took the money because Phyllis Sparks had a drug problem and you used the money to buy drugs was your friend Phyllis Sparks had a drug problem? She did. She did. That's correct. I'm not sure if that is the, was the truth at that time. I mean, if that's what I said, it may have been. It was a long time ago. Um, 
But why did you write the check out to your son that there he is him? Because I was depositing the check into his account at that time. So the money was for your son? No, no, it wasn't. But I had control over his account. Okay. I had the debit card. And so by me depositing the check into his account, then I would essentially be able to withdraw the money. Okay. Now, this is a long report that in April, when he noticed that he had two checks in his account that were not written by him. Right. And a warrant was issued in 2014 for your arrest on um, March 13th. But you were not arrested until two and a half years later, simply because the police could not find you. Is that correct? Uh I guess I mean I don't I don't know those that's you know those facts um yeah. I, that may be in the, um, last 20, in the last twenty years this uh policy you've had at least fourteen or fifteen or maybe sixteen different addresses so it was kind of difficult to find you because you were in one place. Uh, more than a couple of months, and then you moved. Right. Yeah, I was very, very unstable, very unstable during that time. And you had multiple telephone numbers. Correct. That's correct. Several addresses and several phone numbers um, back yeah. then would have in been the, last, the norm. In the last for me. 20 years. Now, it wasn't until November of 2015 when you had another financial scheme going where you used people to cash payroll checks for you that you had a payroll business, is that correct? Um, some of it, I didn't have a payroll business. I'm not sure where that came from. Um, uh, but well, what kind of business did you have in 2015? I didn't. I didn't have okay. a business in, in okay. 2015. Uh, Anderson, and I'm reading, uh, detective said Anderson claimed that she had a payroll business, but denied any involvement with the forest check. Yeah, I'm not I'm not exactly sure where, where that came from. I had no business of any sort. Um, I don't know where that came from at all. And then, and then you said, when, when asked about the two checks from Haji Salon, Mr. An Ms. Anderson reported her friend Phyllis Spark had a bad drug problem and she stole the checks in exchange for drugs. And then you refused to give them any more information and then you were arrested. Is that right? That's correct. So why didn't you tell the police why you used to owe the check? You know, at, at that time, Mr. Roche, I didn't have the, the clarity um, or, nor the wisdom that I have today. So I, I'm not sure at that time what my mindset was that convinced me that any of those actions were okay. Um, mm -hmm. Um, it's not, there's no doubt that I was probably not truthful to um, the officer when I gave that statement, you know, at that time. Um, the, the truth is Mrs. Spark, Ms. Sparks did have a drug problem. Um, her and I did agree together. We decided that we would take the checks, um, we would split the money. But I, again, I, I think I may have justified it in my mind where all of those things were okay. Okay. Now, when you were arrested, uh, you were charged with the theft of the checks and what, two counts of forgery? Correct. And possession of marijuana. Is that correct? That's correct. 
And you made a plea deal in March of 2016, some three years after the crime was committed, and you pled guilty uh, to the two counts of forgery and theft. Is that correct? No. No, that's not correct. The forgery was dismissed and I pled guilty to the theft. Felony theft? Yes. And under another situation, you were found guilty of possession of marijuana also? Correct. And a part of that plea deal was that you were to pay full restitution for the forged checks and the two checks that you wrote out on Haji's loans account. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, great. And the total amount of that restitution was $4,599.15. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, let's go over your application now. You're currently 49 years old. I am. And You've been married, what, four or five times? Four. <laughs> four. You're, ma you're married to, uh, your married name is Taylor. You're married to a Mr. Hart, a Mr. Anderson, a Mr. Brooks, and Mr. Ponce. That's correct. And, uh, you were sentenced in March of 2016 to four years, and all of that was suspended, and you did four years of active supervision. Correct. Now, in question number three, it asks if the applicant was placed on probation or parole. Was this period of supervision revoked for any reason? And you answered no. That's correct. It wasn't revoked, but in 2019, a revocation hearing was ordered right. Right. and scheduled. Right. And you failed to appear. Mm -hmm. A warrant was issued for your arrest. And by the grace of God, and fortunate for you, you were able to pay that restitution before you were arrested. Is that correct? Um, mostly correct. It, it actually, what what occurred was the Miss um, Smith, which which was the officer at the time, realized I was never notified of that court date. So she she called me like to say, hey, hearing is happening now. So she knew because I wasn't notified, I wouldn't be able to make it. And so her and I, you know, just arranged that, okay, well, the warrant will be issued, but, you know, we'll work it out. Um, I was just at the, I think the very end um, of payments, I needed to make one payment. So her and I had an arrangement that I would make that payment and she would take care of, um, the the warrant or whatever occurred judicially and and that's what happened i guess some idea that you were behind on your papers and that's why the revocation yeah one, yeah that's they, they, right. wouldn't, they, they wouldn't revoke you for just one payment you would be behind. right right i think my payments were they were generally more or less not not monthly they were like lump sums maybe like um eight or nine hundred you know at certain intervals um opposed to the regular monthly schedule and i know why you are applying quite important you want to get your notary um status back active but why do you need a file for overall security, um, just general security and protection of my, my home, my property. Um, and, and that is one of the reasons I think when I applied, this was, you know, it was a few years ago, um, I, I applied before the pandemic happened. And so 
my application kind of, you know, got lost in the in the pandemic shuffle, so to speak. But you know, since then, I've developed what I I believe are more um, important reasons um, for my need for a pardon. Um, I overall, my attempt is to restore um, my character, and that road to redemption has led me here. Now. I want to let you know that your application is on schedule because there's always 18 to 24 months in between your applying and a hearing is scheduled. So basically, you're pretty much on schedule and you will not be lost in the shuffle. That, well, that's just what I was told when I called. Okay. All right. Yeah. Now, Question number eight. Question number eight says, besides the offense in which you're seeking a pardon, have you ever been arrested, taken into custody, held for investigation, or even questioned mm -hmm. or charged by any law enforcement authority? And you answered, my prior arrest was an arrest in December 2006, and that was for the possession of marijuana. And you said your son had a sick or laced with marijuana, and it was in your home, so they arrested you, but it was dismissed. Is that correct? That's correct. And then you listed a 208 arrest in Shreveport, Louisiana, for bank fraud at Regions Bank. Is that correct? That's correct. And basically, that was this, this also, because you couldn't understand why they would charge you an account that basically uh, there was nothing wrong with you. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. They were, they charged me with bank fraud because someone else wrote a check that didn't clear the bank. I, I think it, it was something to that extent. But that charge was dismissed, right? It was dismissed, yes. Okay, and the, and the statement that follows that arrest is, to my very best knowledge, these are the only arrests besides Crap. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now, why did you leave off your 1993 arrest for theft? Oh, you know, I, that's, oof. I didn't even think about that. That, that, whew, that was a long time ago. Well, the question said, have you ever prior yeah. or after the offense you applied for a pardon? Give us yeah. that. Give us the jurisdiction and give us the uh, result of that arrest. So I didn't that, remember that. That was no process. Yeah, it, it was. I, I didn't remember that, Mr. Roche. You guys have to. Okay, then, it. And what, then why did you leave off the March 10th arrest, 1999, for simple battery, which you got convicted of? And it goes as a misdemeanor conviction. Simple battery, March 10th, 1999. I did not remember those things that happened in the 90s, Mr. Roche. I didn't even consider that okay. those events even occurred um, okay. in a very long time ago. March 30th, 1999. Simple battery, mis misrepresentation at Brooklyn. Fifth, you were convicted, you pled guilty, simple battery, and you pled guilty, theft. Do you remember that? I do, I do. You know, back in the 90s, Mr. Roche, simple battery, I don't know, we didn't have the, the domestic laws. Ms. Ponson, the question say, any prior 
uh, offenses after the one you're seeking a pardon for to list in question number eight. Okay, now, 2012, resisting an office. That's only 10 years ago. You didn't list that. You, I'm, I'm sorry, you, you said after these 2016 arrests? No, 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 no. The question said, any prior or any arrest after the offense that you're seeking a pardon for? Right, then this was prior, correct? Okay, okay. 20, 2012. Resisting the officer. You didn't list that one. That's prior to the offense that. Um, that's, after the, that's after the offense. The, that was in, you said it was in 2013 and the arrest date was 2015 or 16. So I'm confused. Okay. Let me, let me, let me recite what the question said. List any arrest, any investigation, or you questioned by a law enforcement officer prior to the one you applied for a pardon or after that one. What is saying, Ms. Punk, is the okay. list. All okay. other risks other than the one that you seek important for. I, I understand. I understand. So we've gone, we've gone over yeah. three arrests already or four arrests right. that you right. didn't risk. Right. Those, Mr. Roche, those are that that resisting an officer. That's that's from the same arrest where the conviction is. I'm not there's there's two different dates. There's a date in 2015 and 16 where this is, 2012. this is 2012. In Shreveport, Louisiana. Is there a charge other than resisting an officer? Because I, I, I just, I don't, I don't really, I don't recall what. It was what the, process. It was an all process as a part of the fee deal that you made in 2016. Right, right. So that's what I'm saying. That they, they were, it was all stemming from the same thing. Miss Ponce, it's an arrest. It is. It. You should have listed okay. it. Okay, let's go on. Then in 2016, you had an arrest for identity theft. Remember that? Uh, yes, it's the same thing. Yes. It was all it was one arrest. It's a separate, it's a separate arrest, but it was a part of a plea deal to be dismissed. If you plead guilty to felony theft, am I correct? Yes, you're correct. Okay. So <laughs> actually, you didn't give us the information that we needed because, because of what? Well, because I understood them to be the same. I, I, I see what you're saying. The it was a arrest and and then they rearrested me. Um, I think it was a month later, and it was all the same thing. And so, because they were dismissed as part of the plea deal um, for the the actual conviction, I lumped I suppose I lumped them together um, inaccurately. Um, yeah. okay. under so that, you know, that, the same that, event, so to let's, speak. Let's continue going over your application. One second. Let me get back to it. Now, you say that uh, you attended Southern University in Baton Rouge and you worked 
working on a degree. When did you start working on a degree? Um, 2014, I think, maybe 15. So, so have you completed that degree? I've not completed that degree. Are you working on that degree? I am. I'm working on the degree. I recently um, reached back out to Southern University so that I can finish uh, my bachelor's degree. Are you enrolled in classes? Were you enrolled in classes last semester? No. Do you intend to enroll in classes for the summer session? Um, I just finished my FAUSA application for the 23-24 um, school year. I'm not sure if that will include the summer semester. Now, Ms. Ms. Powers, why, why would anyone have 15 or 16 different addresses in 20 years? I was very, very um, unstable back then. Um, I moved a lot. I didn't own my home. I didn't own, own any property. I didn't have a, um, a job. I didn't have any responsibilities that would really, um, you, you know, just, I don't know. I wasn't, I just wasn't very accountable um, okay. during that, that time period. Okay, how many, how many jobs have you had in the last 20 years? Maybe six. Six, okay. Are you still, are you still running a company called All Care? No, no, okay. I, I didn't, I'm, I'm not. Okay, and what's your current employment? I work for legal aid. Okay, and how long have you worked for legal aid? Um, since March of this year. March of 23, okay. And what, what job did you have before that? Um, All Care of Louisiana since 2017. Okay. Now, in question 14, it says, have you ever used illegal drugs or abused subscrip subscription drugs or alcohol? And you said no. That's correct. But despite the possession of marijuana. You say that you're currently under treatment with Tabaxo. That's correct. Open your problem. Right, right, but it wasn't it wasn't from drug abuse. It was um, a result of a physical dependence okay. after a few, um, surgeries that I had, and so instead of going to pain management, it was a better option. And so my doctor and I decided to go that route. Are you still being treated with Suboxone? I, I take something similar. Um, so this Sometimes. treatment's go, this treatment's going on for the last two or three years. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and, and probably will for life. Okay, okay. Uh, tell us about the student loan that you had in default in twenty twenty one. Yeah, it's no longer in default. Um, I can't remember the name of what it's called, but it, it's no longer in default. Um, okay. You paid the entire twelve thousand dollars back? No, no. Um, there's a name for what it's called. Um, but during when when the pandemic hit, I can't remember what it's called. But it it's not in default. Um, it, it's something where they basically take everything that's in default and kind of rearrange or restructure the payments so that the loan is no longer in default. I just can't remember the name of what that's called. How oh, long before you pay off that loan? Well, I, I just signed on to get another one. So it's going to it's going to be lumped in um, with with my new financial aid application. So it's kind of undetermined right now. Thank you. Uh, tell us about the bankruptcy, uh, the 
fifty-one dollars. Ooh, it's a long time ago. I think I have had um I had maybe a lot of medical bills or maybe credit cards or unsecured debt and things like that. And I filed a chapter seven, um, maybe about 15, 20 years ago. Okay. Uh, tell us about your com community work. You said that you were a community activist. So tell us about your community work. Well, I, I definitely work for legal art, legal services. Um, I do a lot of work in the community for uh, people who are who find themselves maybe straddling the fence with making a decision like I made. Um, I do a lot of mentoring for those people. I help people with expungements and clearing their backgrounds. Um, so that they can remove barriers from employment and housing um, and systemic issues that the uh, African American community really, really faces. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Ponte, for answering my questions. Uh, for the record, the Cattle Parish DA's office is, is adamantly opposed, and I'm going to read a statement, if I can get to it, from uh, D.A. Stewart's office. And it says that the Cato D.A. cannot agree to a pardon for this case. The offenders, probation history, is not stellar. A probation officer had to motion and honor a revocation hearing at some point because she failed to pay restitution. The offender also had a bench warrant issued for a period of time for not showing up in court. She has multiple open forgery cases in one identity theft case that was dismissed as a part of a plea deal. Our office is opposed. My report says that the sheriff of Kettle Parish is unopposed. That is not the case. Sheriff Prater's office submitted a letter in strong opposition, and he is definitely opposed to the restoration of firearms. Uh, the victims of your crime had no opinion and refused to make any comment. Your financial status is unstable, and most of your Criminal activity involve financial crimes. You need to establish a sound financial base for at least five to eight years. You need to stabilize your lifestyle. You've had 14 or 15 different arrests, multiple telephone numbers, bankruptcy, loan defaults, there's negative accounts on your credit report. You're currently being treated for opioid uh, problem. Uh, your performance on supervision was poor. Uh, you have a five criminal background. You have 10 arrests, one felony conviction, and three misdemeanor convictions. And Simply, Ms. Ms. Ponce, you did not fill out your application correctly. I do have a decision, and I will give you my decision at the appropriate time. Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Roshai. I don't see any other questions by my colleagues. So, um, Ms. Pouncey, is there a statement you'd like to make to us before we vote? Um, yeah, just I, I just wanted to say that um, 
I, I agree with mostly everything you've said, Mr. Roche. Um, although I, it sounds like a lot of what, what you're referring to, it's just simply not true um, as of today. Maybe it was true a few years ago when I submitted my application, but those things are just simply um, not true. I have had stability, employment stability since 2017. The only need for the most recent change was because I had medical issues and I was unable to work um, you know, for a short amount of time. Um, uh, my bankruptcy was nearly 20 years ago. Um, I, I certainly don't see it as a negative thing that um, I'm responsible enough to be treated for um, a physical dependence to opioids. It certainly wasn't born out of you know anything that I did incorrectly. So I just wanted to say that you know my my actions are evidenced. Um, my change is evidenced by my my current actions. And I don't want to be judged by by my prior actions. Um, thanks. Okay, thank you. We are prepared to vote. Mr. Roche will be voting first. Ms. Ponson, it's been it's been very enjoyable talking to you, and I do believe you when you say that in the last one, two, maybe two and a half years, you start to stabilize your lifestyle. But I'd like to see five to eight years where you have uh, no loan defaults uh, and basically just stabilize your life a little more. But based on a what I would say is a lifestyle that is not stabilized enough yet, opposition from the DA's office and law enforcement opposition. My decision is to deny your request. Thank you, Mr. Ruffin. Mr. Maribel. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, my vote is the same. I think you, you're, you're in the right direction. You're moving in the right direction. Uh, you've, got, uh, you've got a little more work to do. And uh, I, I'm not sure what you mean by your physical dependency on opioids. I mean, that's an addiction, whether it was by prescription drugs or otherwise. That's why you take the Suboxone. So uh, I do believe that you need a little more time to be stable and to show that uh, you are moving in the right direction. My vote, likewise, is to deny. Mr. Freeman? Uh, due to lack of cleansing period and prior criminal history, my vote is to deny. Mr. Jackson? My vote is the same. I don't think you're there yet. You are moving in the right direction. But you know, you, you gotta have a little more evidence of change. So my vote to make it all sorts of things. All right, Ms. Pouncey, and I do agree with my colleagues, all of them, you are moving in the right direction. We just need a more sustained period of time. So my vote today also is to deny. We wish you well. Good luck to you, ma'am. Thank you.
All right, good morning. We are, uh, the Pardon Board is reconvening. We're now at the Madison Detention Center. Would the staff at Madison introduce yourself for the record? Oh, All right, we're waiting for uh, Madison to connect to audio. Just stand by. Can this, is the microphone? Madison, Madison Parish, you're going to have to press the microphone button and connect to the audio, Madison Parish. And you got everybody connected? Madison Parish. We can't hear you. We, we can't hear you, sir. Calling back in. You need to turn the microphone on, uh, please, officer. Yeah. Right. Now it's, it's muted. You have to unmute your microphone. Make sure your audio is connected. Can you hear me? Yes. No. Sir, okay. would you, officer, would you introduce yourself? Tell us your name for the oh, record. Thank you. Sir? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Sergeant Washington here at Madison Parish Correction. All right. Thanks, Sergeant Washington, for accommodating us this morning. And yes, Ms. Reese, would you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and DOC number, please. My name is Jimmy Varese, DOC number 484458. All right. Good morning, sir. And you have counsel this morning. Would uh, counsel please introduce yourself for the record? Good morning, board. My name is Joylyn Hollis here on behalf of Mr. Jimmy Burris. We'll uh, let you wrap it up at the end, if that's okay with you. That's perfect. Thank you, ma'am. All right, Mr. Burris, well, uh, I'll read some identifying information into the record. <laughs> Ask you to verify that information. Your case has been assigned to Mr. Freeman, seated to my far right. Uh, so he'll take the lead on the interview. We, uh, I want to acknowledge some folks who have joined us by Zoom. We have your parents, Ms. Darlene and Mr. Tommy Baris, uh, your sister, Shavia Baris Lopez, Jamie Giardina with Keep It Real, and Belinda Parker Brown with Louisiana United International. Good we morning. will allow your parents and Ms. Lopez to speak on your behalf. Uh, and you're allowed to make a statement before we turn it over to Ms. Hollis. So wrap okay. It up. okay. So, Mr. Varese, you are seeking a uh, commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced in June 2004 in Arlene's Parish for an armed robbery uh, conviction. You received a 27-year sentence. Uh, you do have a good time mandatory release date, which is in December of 2025. Is that information correct? Correct. All right. Would you answer Mr. Freeman's questions, please? Okay, Mr. Varese. Um... How old are you? 40. How long have you served on this charge? 19 years and eight months. How many times have you been arrested beside this charge? One, two. Uh, I want to say twice. Twice, maybe. Right, but no conviction. You all first fell in the offender. Yes, sir. Yeah, I only had one arrest, by the way, but... Uh, that it could be twice. Uh, so you were arrested for armed robbery. Uh, obviously, you used to work at that restaurant. Yes, sir. Now, how long you worked there? Mm, I worked there for about eight months, eight and a half months, roughly. Okay. Did they dismiss you for using the telephone? Correct. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you ever used any drugs, alcohol? No, sir. Okay, no drugs, alcohol. No, sir. So why did you commit this crime? I mean, what was the motivation? I can I committed the crime. Uh, I got I got fired, and I want to say that I got mad, I got angry, and I waited like a month. A month after they fired me, and I went back and robbed them. 
I want to I want to see I want to see with buying me being made angry. And said so I went I went back and robbed him. Robbed the restaurant, the gumbo shop. What, what did you do with the money? Uh, I went to I bought her and I bought my girlfriend a ring. We got tattoos of each other's names. Uh, I bought some clothes for her infant daughter, and that was about it. <laughs> then I got I got arrested the next day. Okay, well, you did a lot of shopping real quick, huh? Well, I ain't gonna say it was a lot of shopping, but <laughs> I I I didn't enjoy it. Yeah. I didn't enjoy it. Okay. Uh, yeah, you, you look at the uh, law enforcement, uh, the judge. You only had a. Uh, your only conviction is the instant offense. Uh, the judge uh, had no comment. District attorney uh, takes no position. Uh, the sheriff of Orleans takes no position. Uh, the superintendent has a, a policy of opposition. Your family are Darlene Thompson Maurice, your mother, is unopposed and will assist you in any way. Uh, the victim, we spoke to Gary McAllister, the current manager of the gumbo shop, and uh, he is unopposed. Uh, the manager is unopposed. Uh, the owner at the <laughs> now deceased. So uh, you have no supervision record. And uh, that that's the Leo uh, statement. Um, what is your job in prison? Uh, I'm I'm currently idle. I mean, I was just transferred to uh, Madison uh, Correction. I'm currently idle right now. Okay, how long have you been in Madison? I've been in Madison. I want to say a little over four months. Okay, where were you before that? I was at Franklin Franklin Parish in in uh, Winsboro, oh, Winsboro, Louisiana. I was a cook. Okay, but how long you stayed in Winsboro? Five and a half years, right at six years. Okay. Uh, you had any write ups while you were at Winsboro? No, sir. Okay. Um, The uh, deputy was in there. Did y'all have y'all have any problems with Miss Maurice? Any write-ups? Is someone uh, still in there or not? Yes. Uh, 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 yes, sir. Uh, do y'all have y'all had any problems with Mister Maurice? No, sir. Okay, and he's been there about four months. Yes, right sir. At, right, right at four months. We never had a problem out of him. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Your risk is low, you need is moderate. What's your transition plan? Where are you gonna live if you get out? I'm gonna live with, I'm gonna live with my parents. Okay, do they have your job lined up? I mean, you're young, you're definitely eligible to work. Yes, sir. And okay, where are you gonna be working at? When, with my younger brother, Clarence mm -hmm. Thompson. What does he do? He owned a vending machine, a vending machine um, bit, uh, company. Okay. His own. All right. Uh, you have plenty of letters of recommendation. I'm not going to uh, get into those. Uh, I see uh, what, what club were you members of while you was in prison? Oh, I was, in, I was a part of, part of the JCs. Okay, what did you learn from the JC? The JCs and the JCs give back. Oh, uh, we we used to help the elderly mostly in um elderly inmates. We used to throw them bingo games, give them uh, hamburgers. Oh, uh, 
Wash their wheelchairs for them. Pushing uh to the uh infirmary, begging for it, volunteer. Uh, I was uh my position was the sergeant at arms, and then I I made sure it's order in the order in the in the whole room. Make right. sure everybody go go to these seats correctly. Make sure the noise the noise down. That was my position, sergeant oh. at arms. All right. Have you taken any classes? Yes, sir. What Wait. have you taken? I took. I have a, I have a list right here. Okay, give, give me a couple of them that you learned the most from. I learned I learned the most from Cage of Rage because that's what. That's what led me to committing a crime. And then I learned, I learned how to control my feelings. I learned to think before I do, I do anything. Um, most importantly, I, I like I like the going home staying home because they had visitors coming to the prisons and I wanted to learn defocus because they was also enemies but they're successful on the street. So I wanted to learn, they focus on how they do that. So I used to talk to them a lot. I like, the narcotic, I like the narcotics anonymous and alcohol is anonymous because All right. those people have the real life stories. And even though I didn't use drugs, I still want to learn they focus, they focus also, which I thought was real great, was real great. And I learned how to write my first check. My first check with uh money smart. Mm -hmm. My very first check. What is your educational level, Mr. Burris? I graduated high school. I said I don't know if they go to bed, but it's over there doing the first. Okay. Uh I have no further questions, Ms. I have a couple of questions. Mr. Burris, when when we I've noticed in your record that you total loss of good time of 318 days is that right yes, yes ma'am and, and and so but you have been able to restore 300 of those hours oh yeah i i got back i got back the whole 318. Oh, I well, I, well maybe i missed some of it but i, I see that most of it was when was your last write-up august 1st 2016. Where were you? I was at DCI, Dixon yeah. Correctional. Is that where you, you lost most of that time? Was at DCI? Yes, ma'am. In, 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 in the early part of my uh, prison sentence when I was young. And you had a hard time with Justin. I do see in the record, we have a very good letter from the transition specialist in uh, Franklin Parish um, uh, commending you on the uh, programs that you were able to take advantage of, uh, and and they believe that you will do well if released. How are you different from the man that was at DCI? I am I am different because I didn't pay attention to my surroundings mostly, to where the to where I don't stumble, uh, going backwards. You know, so the whole goal for me is to move forward. Be alert, be responsible, and uh, so just to just to remain on the on the task at hand, which is returning home, regaining my freedom. And that, um, twenty years is a very long time, but it's up to that person what you do with your time. Either you could go backwards or you could go forward. You could pick one, and so yeah, I chose to go forward. I mean, I heard. Uh, my victims, you know, I think about them every day. I, every day I wake up in prison, I'm a, I'm reminded of the crime that I committed, because uh, they also served twenty served twenty years with me. Also, my parents also served twenty years with me. So the the, the focus is always going forward. All right, good. Well, I don't see any other questions, so we're going to hear from your 
So let's hear from them. Uh, Ms. Darlene. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. What would you like us to, uh, to know? Uh, just it's like over the years, um, I've seen the growth in Jimmy through the phone calls, the letters, um, you know, the visits when we were early, able to visit during the early years before we got sick and the many accomplishments. He has tons of certificates. I want to say maybe about 15 where he's uh, completed different programs. And that shows that Jimmy wants to change his life for the better. Um, and I, I really believe that Jimmy is sorry for the crimes that he, he committed uh, 19 and a half years ago. Um, he's very missed. I mean, I would just love to spend some quality time, you know, with my son. You know, I, I, I think I just know he's sorry for what he's done. And he just became a better person Pleasure over those here. years. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tommy Barriste? Uh, yes, ma'am. Go ahead, sir. Is there something you'd like to say? Yes. Uh, uh, I've been on uh, dialysis for uh, four and a half years. And I just uh, received my kidney about a year ago. And, you know, my body is getting uh, worse. And uh, yeah. I would like to spend the real time I got with my son. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And Ms. Ms. Lopez? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you all for your time. It means a lot to our family. Um, I was 10 and a half years old when my brother was in prison, and I'm 29 years old now. Um, a lot has happened in those 19 years. I mean, I remember the last conversation my brother had as a free man, him telling me that he wanted to take me to Celebration Station um, after seeing my report card and hopefully you know, now that I understand his crimes and I understand that how sorry he is for his crimes and that he is a better man, hopefully we will still be able to get to take that trip to Celebration Station um, mm. with, upon his release. So thank you all for <clears throat> listening to me and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, um, Jimmy, Mr. Maurice, is there something you'd like to say before we turn it over to Ms. Hollis? Hearing, hearing my family, hearing my fellas, 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 I mean, hearing my family see what they see is not just makes me makes me ever want to be the best Jimmy that I can always that I always can be. It always been in me. I mean, it didn't have to take 20 years for, yeah. for me to change. One mistake caused me 27 years of my, of my life. I mean, so, I, mean I heard a lot of people in the, in the process. And at the time, I wasn't thinking about nobody else around this but mine. That's why I did. That's why I, did. I just want to. Put smiles on, on people's faces. I. That's the person who I am. Seeing other people happy. Putting other people's feelings first. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Hollis. Good morning, board. I am Joylan Hollis. I'm here on behalf of Mr. Jimmy Varese. Just want to wrap up. Um, all of the points that were made today. 
the main of which is that Mr. Jimmy is not the same person he was when he committed this crime. One of the things in preparation that we talked about that he didn't really get to touch on is um, his actions. Um, that if he had the opportunity um, to apologize and to go back into the world, that he is going to earn his freedom through his actions. He's going to think um, before he speaks. He's going to think about how he um, moves in the community. Um, one of the things we have is we have Creep It Real Ministries, as well as um, Miss Belinda Parker Brown, who's a part of Louisiana International uh, United International who have wraparound services. As you can see, he's also um, has a family that he's going back to in St. Helena Parish. Uh, there's not um, any return to the place where the incident occurred. Um, and he's looking forward to the opportunity to prove as he's proven on the inside, hasn't had a write up in years um, and has done a good job. He wants to feed people and, you know, put smiles on their face, like he said. So we humbly ask that you. Thank you. All right, uh, I think we are prepared to vote. Mr. Freeman will be voting first. Okay, Mr. Burris, uh, I will say I did enjoy your interview this morning. You have a good prison record. You have a good letters of recommendation. Uh, your whole future is in front of you. I mean, not but what, 40 years old? 40, uh, correct. Uh, 40. I, I got you. And uh, so my vote today is going to be to commute your sentence to 22 years. The grant to 22 years. To make you immediately help. Thank you. Ms. Maurice, it was certainly a, a delight to speak to you. I don't think I've ever seen someone as positive and up as you are after having served uh, the amount of time you served in prison. And something tells me that when you were sergeant at arms, you took that pretty seriously. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I did. I did. I did. I, yeah, I, and I was very impressed by you today. You you served time well. Thank you, ma'am. Deserve to be released. Thank so you. My, you uh, the grant of com to recommend a commutation for twenty two years, Mr. Ray. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Maurice, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My vote is to commute the sentence 22 years with pro eligibility after serving 19 years. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mayor Bella. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Maurice, uh, uh, it was a pleasure listening to you. Uh, it's clear to me that you learned your lesson. Uh, you indicated uh, uh, as best you could what you did. You were angry, and you were very honest with us today. My vote is likewise the same to recommend grant of commutation to 21, 22 years. Good luck. Thank you, sir. Uh, my vote also is to uh, recommend that the grant of commutation of 22 years with eligibility after having served 19 years. I think we have to specify the parole eligibility okay. because of the um, yeah, I, I, I would yeah. concur with that I as well. Okay. So uh Mr. Varis, we're gonna make a recommendation on your behalf that your sentence be commuted to 22 years and that you be parole eligible really immediately after having served 19 years. So good luck Thank to you. you. Good luck Thank to you. you. All right, I think that concludes Thank our business you. Madison. So uh, we will um, sign off at Madison. It's 9.54 a.m. Do I have to go back and put your name? I'll put it. No, I'll do it. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, board.
Thank you, everyone, so much. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Thank you. You all did. You all did a thing. All right, good morning. Good morning. Pardon Board is reconvening uh, at State Police Barracks. Is that where we're at? That's a different look, different setup. Uh, it is Monday, June 5th, 2023. It's 9.57 a.m. Good morning with the Barracks staff. Please introduce yourself for the record. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Go ahead, sir. Oh, uh, Captain Patrick Washington. All right. And Lisa Frazier on classification. Okay, that's everybody. That's All right. Name. So, Mr. Ronald Washington, now it's your turn. Tell us your name and DOC number, please, sir. Hey, good morning, ma'am. My name is Ronald Washington, DOC number 590136. All right, uh, Mr. Washington, you're here before the pardon board this morning. You're seeking a commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced in St. Tammany Parish, 22nd JVC, for two counts of armed robbery. You were sentenced in September of 2011. You received a 20 year sentence on each count, and those sentences are running concurrently. Uh, your case has been assigned to Mr. Roche, uh, but before I turn it over to him, I want to acknowledge we have some guests that have joined us. We have uh, your mother, Miss Janetta Washington, uh, brother Harry Sims, sister Tina Washington, brother Matthew Washington, another brother Leroy Washington, and your fiance Amanda Thacker. And we'll be hearing from Harry, Tina, and your mother at the appropriate time. Also joining us in opposition is Mr. Clark from the uh, VA's office in St. Tammany, he will be speaking at the appropriate time as well. Uh, before we wrap it up, uh, Ronald will allow you to make a statement before we vote. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So, as I mentioned, your case has been assigned to Mr. Roche. Would you answer his questions? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Madam Chairman, fellow board members, we have Ronald W. Washington. DOC number 590136. Mr. Washington is here this morning seeking a recommendation for a parole eligibility date. Am I correct, Mr. Washington? Yes, sir. And he was sentenced under state statute without parole eligibility. He is now served a 20 year flat sentence for two counts of armed robbery. 
Mr. Washington pled guilty on September 16, 2011, as charged with two counts of armed robbery only two months after his arrest. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. And you, you pled guilty, you knew you were responsible for the crime, and you just pled guilty and started serving your time. Is that correct? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I take full responsibility. Uh, okay. He received a 20 year sentence for both counts of armed robbery, and those two sentences were running concurrently. When he was arrested on July 9, 2011, he had two female co defendants. The first co defendant was Brooke Jane who pled guilty to two counts of second degree robbery and was sentenced to 20 years at DOC. Ms. Brooks' sentence was suspended based on five years active supervised probation and that probation was terminated on May 29, 2015, some eight years ago Satisfactory. The other co defendant, Michelle Johnson, pled guilty as charged to two counts of armed robbery, was sentenced to 25 years at DOC. Ms. Johnson is still incarcerated with a good time release date of July 14, 2035. Mr. Washington is currently 36 years old. At the time of the robbery, he was 24. As of July 7th, 2023, he will have been incarcerated for 12 years. Mr. Washington, tell the panel exactly what happened on July 9th, 2011. Let's start with your co-defendants getting a manicure that they knew they didn't have the money to pay for. Tell, tell us what happened. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. When we left the house that morning, we were, it was uh, Bruce's birthday. It was the next day. And we, were, we was going to, we was going to Bourbon Street. But before we went to Bourbon Street, we stopped at the, at the um, nail salon. We, but Michelle was gonna get her, Michelle and Brooks was getting their nails done. I was gonna pay. I had a card that I was I used a debit card. So they text me, they text my phone when they were complete to come in and pay for it. I went in to pay for it and I pulled my wallet out. I didn't have my card with me. So by me not having my card with me, I told I told my victims that I'm good, I would go to Piggy Yoon and pick up and pick up the money, pick up the card, and get the money, and I'll and I come right back. But it, it didn't go that way. I um, I had it to where they asked me to leave my license, and I told them no. And they said, well, you need to leave your license with me. So I said, well, look, I'm just, I'm just going to go. And they said, sir, we can't let you leave. And I got upset. I was um, I'm not proud of it. And I take full responsibility. I was on, I was on mind altering substances at the time. And you know, I was I was drinking and you know, I was taking um Xanaxes. And when I told him you can't let me leave, that's when I I pulled a gun out on him, pulled a gun out, and I told them to get me there. Who was this was why did you ever go to person? So ever, ever since <clears throat> ever since 2005. I always kept a, a gun on my person because somebody I, I mean, I've known for years since since we were kids came behind me with a crowbar and hit me in the head with a crowbar I and mean, that's what happened to my eye. And I, after that, I always kept a, a gun on me. Did you have a roommate? No, sir, I did not. Okay, go ahead. But when, after, you know, 
So we took, I took their money. I took, I took my victim's money and we left and we got caught immediately afterwards. Okay. That's pretty much the way it was presented to me in my report. Um, Mr. Washington. Yes, sir. Oh. <laughs> application statement to question 13. You say, and I quote, I know what I did was wrong, but while I did not physically harm anyone, is that true? Okay, can you repeat that, sir? You say, I know what I did was wrong, but while I did not physically harm anyone, is that true? Well, I physically, I physically harmed a lot of people by just the crime that I committed. Because I mean that that leaves, you know that that. Oh, that so Washington, let's get down to it. Did you hit the victim over the head with the gun? Yes, sir. Victim and card three thousand dollars worth of medical bills for the damage that you did when you hit him across the head, not once but twice with a gun. Why would you say you didn't cause anybody physical harm? Yeah, can, can, if I if I if I could be just honest with you today, please. I, I was I was on. Opioids, and I was taking, I was taking Xanaxes on a regular basis every day, and I'm not, I'm not using that as an excuse. So I'm, I'm hoping that you don't get me wrong on that. Oh, not, I'm not. All right, so, but I only remember bits and pieces of the situation that what what what, what happened. So when, when it, at the time I didn't, I did not believe that I hit him, my victim, Mr. Jimmy. I didn't believe that I hit him with a gun, but when he said it, when he said it later, later on down the, down the road, stuff started to come back to you. You start to remember bits and pieces of what happened later on in life, and stuff just started to come back. And I and I know that he wouldn't lie about that. And I apologize to all parties involved about you know for 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 my actions, Rhino. I appreciate your honesty. This is the day that you need to be honest, and I appreciate you being straightforward and answering my question. Yes, sir. Uh, opposition in this case comes from the 22nd JDC District Attorney's Office, and a representative from that office will be making a presentation a little bit later in this hearing. Uh, you also have opposition from the St. Tammany Sheriff's Office, and both victims of the old robbery are adamantly opposed. Uh, criminal history, uh, Mr. Washington only has two arrests. The first arrest was in Picayune, Mississippi, and uh, 2009 for civil assault, and he was found not guilty, and uh, the uh, charges were dismissed. And this is the only other arrest on his record. Let, let, let's talk about alcohol and drugs. When did you start using drugs, Mr. Washington? Um. I started using drugs in 2005 uh, after Hurricane Katrina when I got hit over the head with a crowbar. They uh, they prescribed me lower tabs. Before how, that, how how old were you? I was 17. Okay, and after Katrina, you got assaulted by someone who hit you across the head. Yes, sir. Tell me about that. 
I was um I, right after Hurricane Katrina, I was um I was sitting down in our neighborhood, picking you in Mississippi, and with me and a couple of me and a couple of the fellas who were playing spades, and a guy came over that I've been knowing his name is Neville Thomas. He came over and we we, we talked for, for a little while. He left. He left. We got we had some words with each other. He left and came back and came behind the building and hit me in the head with a football. I had to, I had to go to the hospital. I had to be rushed to the hospital. Once I rushed, uh, it was right. It was the day after Katrina, so the line was very long at the hospital. So they they pulled me in immediately, and uh, they put me on the stretcher and and airlifted me to Alabama because I was losing so much blood and. They, they um they prescribed me they prescribed me lower tabs and that's when I first started to to use to use drugs and narcotics but I, before you know, prior prior to then I, I never used any drugs. I was seven years I was seven years before the robbery. How long did you stay on lower tabs? Legitimately. Um, it, it 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 uh it advanced. I went from lower tabs. I, I started drinking alcohol. I um I started using uh, Xanax. Xanaxes, and I was taking about ten Xanaxes a day. And I'm thankful to be able to even tell the story because of the you know the amount of drugs I was using. Have you ever had substance abuse treatment? Since you've been incarcerated? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I've taken AA in it. And what else? I've taken I've taken a program um and um it's a pre-release cover covers somewhat of that as well. Have you taken living substance. in balance? Have yes, you taken sir. have you taken living in balance? No, sir. Celebrate recovery. Celebrate recovery? Yes, sir. You've taken celebrate recovery? Yes, sir. And what did you so, get out so, of substance abuse? What did you get out of celebrate recovery? I, um I, I've learned, I learned, I've learned a lot, but one of the main things that I've I've learned was the triggers. They, they they tell us that we have triggers dealing with our dealing with our and our addiction. And our addiction. By having our addiction like that, like certain things that we go through in life, we, we have to be careful about. We have to be careful about because we can fall right, right back into that same slump that we were once in. You know, they say once you are you're an addict, you're always an addict. <laughs> and that's what I was gonna ask. Are you a drug addict? Yes, sir. I believe. And, and what is your own going to ride to plan to stay away from drugs and alcohol? I had my my sister, my sister looked up some things for me, some NA classes, NA and AA classes, where like if you were if you were to grab me today, that I would go, I would go to uh, Lafayette, uh, Sunset Lafayette, and they have um, a lot of NA AA classes up there in certain different places. So I would like, I would like to continue. Continue going on with substance abuse and doing different programs. And in the 12 years of your incarceration, Mr. Washington, think back. Have you ever received a write up for incarceration or application? Oh, oh I'm, so, I'm sorry. At that word, except. Uh, have you ever received a write up for intoxication or for contraband for having illegal drugs? Yes, sir. When? Yes, sir. I was I was in a dog program in 2000. I want to say this was in 2013, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the guy on the yard on the dog yard and the dog program with me. He had he had what, what you call prison name Mojo. 
Ojo. Ojo. And, and so when the guards, the guards came out and he was calling his name, it's a guy named, named Jarrell, Jarrell Harold. And when he called his name, he was out in the yard. So I, I went to go get him for, for, for the guards. So when I, when I went to go get him, he passed the stuff off to me. And immediately when he gave it, when he, when he, when he put it in my hand, I immediately dropped it. Now the lieutenant over there, I want to say his name was Lieutenant Miller. He said, look, I seen what happened. I said, I know you didn't have anything to do with it. He said, but I have to lock you up. I have to push you, I have to uh, lock you up in the blocks. He said, because it touched your, it touched your hand. So because it touched my hand, he said, but, but I'm going to put the right up in your favor. That way, once you go, this, this happened on a Sunday. Mr. Ward. Yes, sir. I, I understand that situation. Now, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. In, in the 12 years of incarceration, have you had ever used illegal drugs or alcohol? No, sir. No, sir, I have never. Because it took, it took away so many years of my life and I hurt so many people and I'm not able to be there for my family like I want to. And I buy and I hurt, I hurt people from doing drugs and alcohol and I don't want to ever, ever put anybody through what I put people through. Now, Mr. Washington, at the time of your arrest, you were addicted to prescription drugs. How did you manage to wean yourself off of the drugs that you were on without being, uh, having an organized drug program? So, so to be honest with you, when I got in close, when, when I went to, into Covington and St. Tammany Parish, I didn't know what was wrong with me. My body wasn't functioning. I, I didn't know what was wrong. I was making sick call and they telling me, oh, you good, nothing wrong with you. Like I felt stuff call, crawling through my skin, my, my skin. And I was, I was going, I, I was going through the process of not having, I was going through withdrawal, yes, sir. And I, I never knew what was wrong with me. It was only until I was talking to another gentleman that been through the same thing that he told me, he used the word dope sick. He said that you're dope sick. That's what you're going through. Your body not able to function without, without these drugs. But I, I just, I just exercise. That's all. That's, I just, uh, you know, I try to always burn the sweat, and, but I vow never to touch those, you know, touch that again, like any kind of mind altering substance. Uh, let's, let's go to your annual report. I just want to put some information. You're currently 36 years old. You've had 12 write ups in the 12 years of incarceration, but all 12 of those write-ups were in the first three years of your incarceration. Uh, you have minimum custody, you have a low risk assessment, you have a GED program, uh, you complete a GED program, uh, and just call off some of the programs that you've completed. I have I have I have pre-release. I have the uh, AANA, uh, Cage of Rage and Anger Management. I have life prep, life skills, life prep, sub substance abuse, domestic violence and abuse awareness program. Yes, sir. And twelve step program. Yes, sir. Uh, tell us about your transition plan. Tra 
Transition like Dallas, as you said. So you plan. Transition plan. What do you plan to live and where do you plan to work? Well, I, I plan on living in Sunset Lafayette with my sister Tina Washington. I have a um a guy, a guy that he owned a bricklaying company, and I used to do labor work for bricklayers. And he's willing to teach me also how how to uh to lay bricks. Oh. Your institutional record is very good. Um, you have all good comments from your work supervisors and your supervisor, and very good remarks from your classification officer. Uh, Captain Washington, would you like to make any comments? remarks or have any concerns or observations about Mr. Washington? Yes, sir. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Um, to the family, hey, y'all. Uh, it's in the two plus years that I've known Ronald. Um, we have a funny little thing. We say we're cousins because we got the same last name and we're kind of built the same. Um, but he is a very hard worker. He is very dedicated to his, his craft. He volunteers to do extra work whenever asked but the most important thing i would say is family um we visit every sunday and every sunday somebody from his family's here every sunday you can count on the washingtons to pull up about three or four tables and hang out together and, and fellowship and bond and play and they're always usually the loudest people in the room it's because they're laughing so much and enjoying one another so for me it's important that if we have an opportunity for one of our guys to go that they have a good family support, it is without doubt that I can say that he has an excellent family support. And I'm pretty sure mama ain't gonna let him screw up again. Thank you, Captain Washington. Yes, sir. Mr. Ronald Washington, yes, you're, very, you're a very impressive young man. But the one thing that impresses me most of all is your disciplinary record. You had 12 disciplinary write ups in 12 years, but all 12 of those, and I'm thinking about class B write ups, the serious write ups you've had in the first three years of your incarceration. You've been housed at the state police barracks for almost seven years with a zero tolerance for any shenanigans. Now, I'm not talking about a write up. We're talking about any negative activity is not tolerated, and you would have been removed immediately. That impresses, that impresses me more than anything that you've done. Um, I have a recommendation, and I will share it with my fellow board members at the conclusion of this interview. Thank you, Mr. Washington. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Rochelle. I don't see any other questions, so we'll um, hear from those who will be speaking in support. Could we first hear from Ms. Janetta Washington? Hello, good morning. Morning. Hello, my name is Janetta Washington, Ronald's mother. And um, I just want to say that I'm impressed with him and where he has come from. And Ronald is approved for today. I am behind him 100%. I am do, I will do anything and everything that I can to keep him on that straight and narrow. Well, yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Um, um, and I have my son Leroy here, and he's just sitting aside of me. All right. Yes. So next, we want to hear from uh, Harry Sims. Hi. Right, good morning. Good morning. I just want to say that Ronald is the youngest of my mother's children, and his presence his presence is very much missed. I pray for his pardon. And he always have and always will have my support, my full support. And 
um, I will help him whenever needed. I just want him to get home. Thank you. Perfect. And then we have Ms. Tina Washington. Good morning. I'm Ronald's sister, and I just want to stress the fact that we will, my family and I will be here for Ronald to support him in any and every way possible um, that we can. We, we, we're prepared to to help him transition um, back into society and we're not gonna he's not going to mess up again um I feel that in my heart he's a different person today um and I've also been looking into na and aA meetings that he can attend in the area if he's released to come live by me but he would be released um in Sunset, Louisiana area. So thank you for allowing us to speak today. Ma'am, thank you. And then we'll hear from the DA's office, Mr. Clark. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Brian Clark on behalf of the 22nd Judicial District Attorney's Office. Uh, my office is opposed to any pardon in this case. Uh, as noted in the letters from both of the victims in this case, they have suffered uh, severe both mental and financial uh, ramifications as a result of this crime. And furthermore, I'd like to point out that uh, Mr. Washington's statement again to this board was that uh, he did not physically harm anybody. This is obviously false. One of the victims was pistol whipped not once but twice during the commission of this crime, uh, resulting in him having to have medical bills as well as uh, injuries from that. Uh, for these reasons, the state would oppose any pardon in this case. Thank you, Mr. Clark. All right, uh, Mr. Washington, for, for a point of clarification, you do have a, a good time release date in 2027, is that right? Yes, ma'am. Is there a statement you'd like to make to us before we vote? I, I appreciate y'all for giving me this opportunity to speak with y'all today and just be able to tell my story. and. And I do in address addressing y'all. I don't. I don't want to address. I don't want to address anybody the wrong way. But I, I want to take this opportunity to really apologize to the victims involved for the for the crime that I've committed in the way that I hurt them. I never. That's not me. I'm open to know that's not me. And I, I know that it doesn't mean much coming from me. But I just want them to know I apologize for the, for the, for the harm that I caused them. And that's all, that's all I have to say about that. I've, I've been waiting to do that for years. Glad you had the opportunity to do that today. We are ready to vote. Mr. Roche will be voting first. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Washington, based on your family support, you had 15 letters of support in your packet uh, from family members, classmates, church members, and just friends who are in support of your uh, early release. Uh, based upon positive remarks from Captain Washington, almost seven years at the State Police Barracks with a zero tolerance for any misconduct, good program, excellent disciplinary record, good transition plan, excellent work evaluation, my recommendation is to recommend to the governor parole eligibility after serving 65% of your sentence, which is 13 years. That is my recommendation. Thank you, sir. Mayor Bella. Uh, my vote uh, is likewise the same for the same reasons. Mr. Freeman. I concur for the same reason. Jackson. I concur, and uh, as do I. So you've received a unanimous vote. So you, on your behalf, will make that recommendation to the governor. Good luck to you, sir. Thank, thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you to you all. Captain Washington, that concludes our business at the barracks. We're going to sign out at 1029. Thanks for helping. Thank you all.
All right. Good afternoon. Good morning. Pardon Board is reconvening. We're at David Wade Correctional Center. Today is Monday, June 5th. It's 10.32 a.m. With the staff at David Wade, introduce yourself for the record. Jerry Goodman, from Warden. Brian Kimmel, Assistant Warden. Kristen Harper, Conservation. Crystal Seymour, Conservation. Carolyn Malcolm. Jamie Wien. Thanks, everybody, Mr. Knott. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Horn, would you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and your DOC number, please. Good morning. My name is Leon Horn, DOC number 354432. All right, Mr. Horn, good morning. I want to acknowledge the folks who joined us uh, by Zoom. We have Lisa Early Coppin, Tisha Horn, uh, Leslie Horn, all who will be speaking in favor, and at the appropriate time, we'll ask you to do so. Mr. Horn, first, I'm going to read some information into the record, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Freeman, seated to my far right. Your case has been assigned to him. Uh, Mr. Horn, you are here this morning to see the commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced in Washita Parish, the 4th Judicial District, in May of 1995 to a life sentence for second degree murder. Uh, Mr. Horn, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. Could you answer Mr. Freeman's questions, please? Okay, Mr. Horn. Uh, how old are you? 71. Okay, and how long have you served on this charge? 27 years, 26, 27. Yeah. 27. Okay. A little bit more. 28 uh, 28 July, yeah. Um, what's your educational level? But, oh, wait. Oh, high school. Okay. Um, have you ever had any other convictions besides this conviction? No, sir. Uh, any other arrests? <laughs> any other arrests? Yeah. No, sir. That's it besides this conviction. No, sir. Okay. Tell me, tell me what happened. Okay. Um, Obviously, you was having a confrontation with your wife. So tell me what happened on that day. Well, yeah, I just this is where it started the night. We at a.m. in the morning. You kept calling and harassing, and, and it just got me off to a bad start. And then the next day, I was waiting on my daughter, who had been coming by every morning to pick up the car to go to school, and she happened to show up. Things went wild from there. And uh. I don't know. I tried to stop her so I can tell my daughter to go by the dealership and pick up the car, but they had to go have a service on that day. And I, after I got to a stop sign, I saw the van come around the corner. And the, no, I noticed the wife was driving, and I tried to stop her, and she wouldn't stop. She just looked at me and went to laughing, and, and I already been having a bad. So I guess it just went wild, and I just that's when I caught my charge. It just went wild. Okay, so obviously I have vehicles a couple times. Is that correct? I, I'm big about it. Say yes. it again, Mr. Freeman. We did that didn't come through very good. Okay, did y'all uh kind of ram into each other? Oh. oh yes, sir. I did, yes, sir. Okay, and you initiate initiated that part of it. Yeah, trying, I, to stop. I, trying to stop her, yes, sir. Okay. And then you you shot, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yes, sir. Okay, how many times did you shoot him? I shoot, I really don't know. They said several times. I really, uh, I don't know, eight, nine, something like that. I don't know, really. Were you on drugs, alcohol at the time? Oh no, sir. I said I don't fool with those. He's one. Okay, you never did drugs, alcohol. No, sir. Mm -hmm. What was the relationship with your wife at that time? Were y'all separated? Yes, sir. We had been separated about a month or so. About a and, month. Uh huh. And I, I hadn't heard from her nothing like that, so I don't know. How many kids do you have? Three girls. Okay. Do you have a relationship with all of them? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Try hard to. Okay. Um, 
In fact, one of the baby girls were living with me at the time. My girls were living with you at the time. Uh, you know, looking at the uh, opposition and, and recommendations, we got uh, the sentencing judge is opposed. Uh, the district attorney is opposed. Uh, the sheriff is opposed. Uh, the chief is opposed, which we expect law enforcement. Uh, unopposed is your daughter. And I mean, she's considered one of the victims in this case. Matter of fact, she's even uh, going to uh, offer you a place to stay. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, All right. Um, what is going to be your transition plan? I mean, you're going to live with your daughter. Uh, you're going to try to work. You're going to draw Social Security. What are you going to do? Uh, I'm going to try to work to get my own place up so I wouldn't have to live with her. What, what did you do prior to your arrest? Where did you work? I was an academic refrigeration man and a truck driver. A deputy, uh, I reserved deputy for years. Reserve deputy, you said? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, your risk is low. Your custody is men. You've had one write-up. That was in 8 of 96. I'm not going back to even talk about that. That was... Mm -hmm. You first first put in jail. Uh, what's your job at the prison? What do you do? Well, uh, a mechanic, I guess you call it a technician on the, in the laundry. Um, kind of uh, community involvement you have at the prison. Oh, sure. I get on. I mean, everybody. <laughs> I know. I mean, do you, are you belong to any groups? Oh, yes, sir. Okay, what do you belong to? AANA -A 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 and uh, Anger Management. Why, why you belong uh, to AANA -A -A if you didn't have a drug problem? I just want to get in a club. I mean, I just don't. And these, What'd you learn from anger management? Big point. What do you like about anger management? Or what'd you learn from anger management? Oh, I oh, that. Find out there's always, it's, there's a lot of cuts to get out of stuff. If you just use it, you can get out of it and save a lot of time. It helps. It helps. How do you feel about your crime? You know? Oh, it's, that's something I, you know, something I deal with daily. Daily, I mean, it's. I don't think it, it, it'll it'll never leave. It'll never leave. It'll be there forever. And I'll never forget it. How long? Uh, how long were y'all married? Or together? Twenty-four years, off and all, on. All, all three of your children are with her. Yes, sir. Uh. You know, you took very limited classes. Is there any particular reason why you didn't take many classes? Well, my job, I mean, it, it had a lot to do with it because it works to like really 24-7. You're on call at all times, seven days a week. Okay. Uh, Warden, what do uh, you have to say about uh, Mr. Horn? Well, Mr. Freeman, uh, I'll answer a couple of your questions there that uh, uh, Leon, the reason he's in the AANA program, he helps administer that program. Uh, and, and he has to, we require program participation to keep his honor card. And that's primarily the reason he's in AANA is in the afternoon, the evening club that meets. He does not have a uh, documented history of any alcohol or substance abuse, but he has he has a good rapport with a lot of the inmates at this institution. And he he, he uh, um, 
provides a level of stability in that program is very welcomed by the administration of this institution and we encourage your participation in that. Leon has been here at uh, Wade since 1995. Like I said, almost 25, almost 28 years, It'll be 28 years in July. When he first got here, he started in our N5 protection unit because of his uh, past employment and position with the Washita Parish Sheriff's Department. He'd been with them for a number of years as a reserve deputy and a uh, uh, part-time deputy with that <clears throat> law enforcement agency there in Washita Parish. He moved to general population in 2011, and uh, he obtained his trustee status in 2013, March of 2013. He's been a trustee for over over uh, 10 years now, and he's a longtime member of the Honor Inmate Program at this, at this, at this institution. Uh, Leon doesn't have any mental health issues or medical issues. He's, he's a very healthy 71-year-old individual. And throughout his entire incarceration, he's never had a positive drug test or never had an issue with any kind of substance abuse whatsoever uh, uh, throughout, his, throughout his entire incarceration, the last 28 years. He's got an excellent work evaluation and he's been issued competency, competency certificates in uh, laundry management, laundry supervisor. As you mentioned earlier, he's got excellent conduct and excellent institutional record. Leon's got a very positive attitude. He's a very pleasant individual to be around. You mentioned that one write-up he had. That was in 1996. That was almost 27 years ago. He participated in the programs that, uh, that we felt was most appropriate for the crime that he's convicted of or, or, or that he's incarcerated for. That was anger management, cage of rage, victim awareness. He's uh, active in the faith-based community at this institution as well, and, and he does uh, provide mentorship at the AANA program. He's got his release plans well established with his daughter in Maryland. I think her name's Patricia, and I think she's gonna be speaking in a little bit. And uh, y'all know me pretty well. I've been with the Department of Corrections for almost 40 years, and I'm a pretty good, ad pretty strong advocate for public safety. And, uh, you know, I can honestly say without reservation that I believe that uh, Leon Horn, if he's given the opportunity, he would be a law-abiding citizen that would make positive contributions to any community that he lives in. Uh, Leon's the type of individual that uh, you would probably want as your neighbor, Mr. Freeman, if you could pick your own neighbor, Leon would be one that you'd want living in your neighborhood. He's a, he's a, he's a good, decent individual, good man. Uh, I know the crime he committed was, uh, it is what it is. I mean, it was a very serious crime, very uh, uh, life altering for a lot of people, including his children and himself. And, and it took the life of his wife at the time. And over the years that I've known uh, Leon Horn, he's expressed remorse, uh, uh, quite a bit of remorse for, the, for his actions that landed him in prison. He's uh, a very somber individual, very thoughtful. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, Mr. Freeman has probably no, no kind of machine he can't work on, and he does a tremendous job for us in our, our laundry. He's probably saved the institution thousands and thousands of dollars over the years by maintaining our, our, our laundry equipment and fixing any issues that come up with them. And, he does preventive maintenance on all of them, and he's uh, he's a very, very valuable asset to, to this institution. And I think if he's given the opportunity to uh, release from David Wade Correctional Center, I don't think, uh, you know, if his, if his interstate compact agreement to Maryland's approved, I don't think the people, the good people in Maryland have anything to be concerned about with uh, Mr. Leon Horn being in their neighborhood. I might have it open to any questions you may have, Mr. Freeman, or anybody else on the board. I think you covered it all, Warden. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Um, we'll hear from the daughters. We have all three of them here today. So we'll start first with Miss Lisa. We'd like to hear from you first. Good morning, um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today about the impact of my father's actions on our lives. Um, I will just say that 
particularly at the time of trial in 19, in the spring of 1995, there was so much heightened sensitivity to uh, domestic violence incidents pursuant to the OJ Simpson trial that January that in my opinion, my father's case became a media bliss for the domestic violence cause. And because of that, I've always felt that no one bothered to hear from the children and to find out how we really felt. So for that reason, I'm truly grateful that we've been given this opportunity today to speak on behalf of our father. Uh, we were extremely sad and are still very heartbroken uh, to have lost our mother so suddenly and tragically. But all of our lives since then, my sisters and I have shared some raw emotions and feelings about all that happened as we've tried to understand what happened and be at peace with it. And maintaining our relationship with our father has been a critical part of that healing and that reconciliation. Through the years, we've been able, by, uh, through our visits with our father, um, you know, at Wade, uh, conversations over the phone, uh, we've been able to um, have some tough conversation and express some candid thoughts with him about how we feel. Uh, I can recall when I arrived in Monroe the night of the incident, I told my sisters then that we should not destroy our lives any more that, than they had been destroyed already uh, by harboring hatred against our father because he is a great dad. Uh, he was then and he still is now. When we need advice, counsel, lifted up, we can reach out to him now and still get the support and love of a father. So as I've acknowledged already many times in several statements, um, he's a great dad uh, by many accounts. We all agree that you know he was perhaps a bad husband, a not so good husband, but we can't change that now. Um, when we look back, we look back retrospectively and we realize some valuable life lessons. Uh, and we just believe that our healing and our lives continue to um, get better uh, from this incident if, if our father's sentence is commuted and he is um, able to you know, be returned to us. He has a granddaughter now who's never been able to see him uh, uh, unless behind bars. So you know, I'm, I'm hopeful for her that she will be able to experience the person that he is as we did as children. Summarily, I love him. I will always love him dis despite all that has happened. As my father, I have forgiven him. And if released, um, uh, my sister and I, Katisha, are both in Maryland and we, we are welcoming him uh, home to Maryland to live. We've researched um, a reentry program for here, here in Maryland. In fact, Katisha works, uh, used to work with the, the, the organization and we have a, a contact who's uh, a, an official with the organization that's willing to work with us to, to, get, to get daddy uh, some employment. Uh, but I have no doubt that, that he will be able to successfully uh, reenter society because my dad's always been a jack of all trades. Uh, he can, in our opinion, can fix anything, a car, uh, a broken washer, a stove, or whatever. So I, I have no doubt that um, he could uh, rejoin us and resume, uh, help us all to resume a sense of normalcy in our lives. So uh, thank you very much again for this opportunity. And as I said, when I started, I uh, fully support his applica application uh, for the commutation of his sentence. Yes, ma'am, thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Katisha Horn? Yes. Go ahead, ma'am. Uh, thank you, as my sister said, for this opportunity to speak. I, too, fully support commutation of sentence for my father. I am his youngest daughter. I was 15 when my father was convicted. And theoretically, I feel like I lost both my parents in one day. But my father is still here and very present in my life. I talk on the phone with my father at least once per week. Even as an adult at 43 now, I still need my dad. 
I still consult with him before any major purchases that I make. If I need brakes on my car, I still talk to my dad because he is the best advocate and supporter for me. And since this tragedy, I've been under psychiatric care that my doctor has confirmed that is related to separation from my father and abandonment. So I fully support his commutation of sentence and him being able to return and do good things in the community and be a part of our family and be the great dad that he has always, it will always be. And I will be the voice of freedom for him forever. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right. And then we have Ms. Leslie Horn. Good morning. My name is Leslie and I am the middle daughter. Um, and I'm here also today to express my support for commentation of sentence for my father. Um, initially in the beginning, you know, I had a mixed emotions about going and visiting with my dad. But um, after support and comfort from my family and much prayer, you know, I began to be in a better place emotionally and still remain today. Um, I I visit my daddy quite often, driving over to um, David Wade. Um, I look forward to the picnic visits and going to seeing him and seeing his joy when I surprise him with something new that's out to eat or some of his favorites. And then he's really surprised and so happy whenever I take my daughter with me to visit him, which is his only grandchild. I try to visit at least once a month. We email quite often. And then I also travel and take some of his friends that he's had for a long time, just not able to drive long distance. I drive them over to visit with him as well. Um, I love my dad. And I can say that there are still so many of my family and my friends that love him and they express their concern for him often because I still live in the area. I run into people all the time asking, how's your dad? Tell him I say hi. I wish your dad was here to fix my act. You know, I need. I wish your dad was here to fix my car. And a lot of the guys in the neighborhood are like, if if your dad was here, you know, my life would be so much better because he was just that influential to those around us in the neighborhood. As my sisters have already said, he's a great dad to me and my sisters. He was our biggest supporter when I played basketball. He was out there playing with me in the neighborhood. He would always come to my games, make sure I need I had what I needed. Mm -hmm. um, all I saw was uh, all I've ever known is a man that go to work. He worked, worked, worked every day and make sure that we had the best of everything. We had the best vacations. We had the, went to the best schools. You know, he made sure he was in the best teachers' classes. And so when all of this happened, it was a shock. It was a shock that all of this happened. Because I could have never imagined that this happened and certainly not imagine that this was happening by my dad. But I believe that this, that he has served his time, uh, and I don't believe that he's be a danger to society. There are those that believe that our support of our dad is disrespectful to our mother, but we can't live our lives with pent up emotions and frustrations. We must live with love. We must forgive as God has forgiven us. And that's what I live with every day I wake up thinking what would Jesus do? He has forgiven us and I must, and I have forgiven my father. Nothing would bring my mother back, but while we have a little time left on this side, I would appreciate, and we would appreciate the opportunity to spend more time with our father. And we're hoping that you would grant him his commutation of sentence by his application. Thank you. Okay. All right, Mr. Leon, is there a statement you'd like to make to us before we beg? Your closing statement. So, what about tell them anything you want to tell? All right, man, I want to thank you all for your time. And, man, so much I like to say, but I can't tell you. Ah, man. Thank you. Sir. All right. Um, I think we are prepared to vote, Mr. Okay, Mr. Horn. Um, you, you, uh, you have a very, very good prison record. You had, 
outstanding comments from the warden. Uh, really, truly, that's the most I've ever seen him speak on someone. You have your daughter's support, which is very, very important. And I want to thank them for showing up and, and speaking today because it, it makes a big deal in our decisions. So my decision is to grant uh, and commute your sentence to 50 years with immediate parole eligibility. Thank you. Uh, my vote is the same for the same region. Mr. Rush. Mr. Horn, I'm three daughters first. I also had three daughters. And my wish is that they are as wise as you are. So how my vote is the same. You can move to 50 years. With immediate and I do concur, uh, Mr. Horn. My vote is the same. So, on your behalf, we're going to make that recommendation to Governor Tony. Right. Oh, I'm sorry, Tony. My, my vote is likewise. Right. Sorry, I voted. <laughs> All right. So, it's unanimous, Mr. Horn. Good luck to you, sir. Warren Goodwin, that concludes our business at your facility. We're going to move on. It's 10 58. Thank you. Y'all have a good day. Uh -huh. Thank you.
Okay. All right. Um, good morning. The park board is reconvening. We are at Louisiana State Penitentiary. It is Monday, June 5th, 2023, and it is 11.03 a.m. Would the staff uh, there at the penitentiary please introduce yourself for the record? Uh, Deputy Warden Rochelle Ambo. Reginald Admiral Classification. Carmen Chipley, Offender Records. Is everybody? Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. And we have before us uh, Mr. Derricks. Would you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and your DOC number. Jerome Derricks, 113381. All right, and Council, would you introduce yourself, please? Good morning, Emily Lubin, on behalf of Mr. Derricks. Okay, and we'll uh, let you wrap it up for us at the end. Yes, please. Thank you. All right. Let me, uh, before we get started, I want to recognize the folks who have joined us. We have in support, we have the parole project, Mr. Hundley, um, who will be speaking. And we have Wanda Miles, uh, who will also be speaking. I have, I'm going to just read my list real quick. Uh, folks who are in support, but will not be speaking. Frank Cushenberry, Ron Hicks. Uh, Lois Cushenberry, James Law, Albert Howard, Gary Miles, Roxanne Winters, and Eddie Talbert. We also have here in opposition with us in Baton Rouge, we have uh, representing the victim, Taylor Nason. Excuse me, I'm on Zoom and I'm joining from Nason. Taylor's on Zoom. Oh, Taylor's on Zoom. Okay, thank you. David Nason, and then representing the uh, district attorney's office, we have the district attorney, Mr. Ricky Davin, and also with his office, Mr. Bart Morris. Uh, and at the appropriate time, we'll uh, ask for those speakers. First, let me just read some identifying information, uh, Mr. Derricks, and we'll get started with the interview process. Ms. Levy, did you have a comment? Yes, um, Mr. Frank Cushenberry is present here, and he would like to speak as well. Okay, thank you. I have it. All right. Um, Mr. Derricks, you're here seeking a commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced in uh, the 23rd Judicial District, Ascension Parish, uh, in May of 1986 to a life sentence for second degree murder. Is that information correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. Your case has been assigned to Mr. Marabella. Would you answer his question? Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Mr. Derricks. My name is Tony Marabella. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Mr. Derricks, how old are you, sir? I'll be 58 September 18th. And how long have you been in prison on these charges? A little over 37 years. And uh, how old were you at the time of the commission of this offense? 20 years of age. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about who you were at 20 years old. Uh, had you finished school? How far did you go in school at 20 years old? Yes, sir. I completed high school in 1984. Okay. And were you working at all? Yes, sir, I was. I was working, at, I was working at the plant in St. Gabriel at Seba Geige. Who were you living with? My sister, Wanda Cushenberry. Now, you mentioned in your, your documentation that you use drugs. What kind yes. of drugs do you use? I smoke marijuana, and I also took pills. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about the marijuana. When did you first start using marijuana? When I was 16 years old. How often would you use marijuana at 16? Probably every weekend. And what about the pills? When did you progress to the pills or how did you get to the pills? When I started running track in high school. Okay. What, what were you using? Black Mollies and Speed. How often were you using those? How old were you when you were running track in high school? I was 17 when I started running track and I would use Speed to boost my agility and use mollies to calm down. In January of 1986, what kind of drugs were you using and how often were you using them? Marijuana, mostly marijuana. 
Now, on this particular day or night, morning, uh, were you using drugs then? Yes, sir. What were you using on that particular day? I was using marijuana that I thought was marijuana, but it had been dipped in PCP and in bombing fluid. How did you find that out? When the guy that I got it from later, the, maybe three days later, told me what I had, that's when I found out that it wasn't just a regular joint. Well, tell me what happened. Let's talk about it. I want you to be very honest with me as best you can remember what happened on the, the morning of January the 26th of 1986. Yes, sir. I had a routine of when I get off from work, I would always go to the car wash, wash my car for the weekend, and I'd always get something to smoke. I smoked that day, and I went to the Waffle House. Now, when you're talking about smoking, we're talking about smoking marijuana that you're talking about? Are you talking about, what are you talking about smoking? The, the, the PCP, the, the marijuana that was dipped in embalming fluid and PCP. Right. Go ahead and continue. I went to the Waffle House where I was at in my car. Miss Nason approached my car. She was having problems with her car. I got out of my car and I hit Miss Nason. I then put Miss Nason in her car and drove to Bluff Road where I left Miss Nason at. Tell me why you did this. I really don't have an idea why I was doing what I was doing. All I know is that the time that it took me to get to the Waffle House, a lot of time had elapsed and it felt like I was driving on the clouds and I was having this trip that I've never had ever had before because I was used to smoking marijuana, but I did not know ex what this stuff was. And I just didn't really know where I was at. I don't know Miss Nason, never knew her, never seen her, never even went in the Waffle House. What did you beat her with? A tire iron. Where did you get the tire iron from? I had the tire iron in my car when I left the car wash. And I remember having the tire iron in, inside where I was at when I left, because while I was going through this trip, it's like things were attacking me. I was just out of my mind. After you dumped her body in the woods, what did you do then? After I left Miss Nason, uh, on, off of Bluff Road, I got back into my car, in her car, and went back to my car and just drove around until I wind up back at my sister's house and passed out. And when I woke up a day and a half later, she told me what I had, what I, what did I smoke to have me in that type of uh, condition? And I told her that I had smoked this stuff and it just took me on a trip. Let's talk a little bit about how long you've been in, what you've done while you've been in jail. When you were, before you came to prison, did you get any sort of treatment for your marijuana use or your uh, use of the, the, the pills? No, sir, I didn't. Were you drug tested regularly at your job? On the streets, no, sir. Well, didn't you say, where were you working at? I was working for a construction company at CB Geige. We did labor work, and that's where I was working at at the time of this. They, they didn't drug test you at all? They, no, 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 sir. Uh, okay. So let's talk about what you've done while you've been in prison. Uh, <laughs> what kind of programs have you taken since you've been in prison dealing strictly with substance abuse? We'll talk about other things. But right now, dealing specifically with substance abuse, what have yes, you, what programs have you taken or what have you done with reference to substance abuse? Yes, sir. In 1993, I started taking a um, 12 step program. In 94, I took the AA program. In 2017, I took the um, Living in Balance program, which I believe was the better program. 
of them all. And every Friday night we have like a small group. And this is this is to, to this date. Every third Tuesday we have a small group. The guy comes off the street and it's like a, a, a support group that we have back in the camp where I'm at to talk about the things that we went through on drugs and how it affects us even to this day. Let me ask you this, what would be your plan to stay sober if you were released in the future? What would you do to make sure you don't go back to using marijuana, finding yourself smoking marijuana, laced and whatever? Keep a good support group around me like I have today and find a, a, a counseling program because I believe that I still need some counseling to help me deal with the, 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 the withdrawal sometimes that I have about having to live through this stuff. I mean, it just, it, it, it's, it's, it's hard to describe how to live with something that you know you've done and, and what calls me to do what I do. And I just need, I think I would need counseling and I would seek that out. Have you taken any sort of programs that involve victim awareness or things that, that get you to understand or at least come to some understanding of the harm that you've done to the family of Ms. Yes. Lisa? Tell yes, me sir. that. I've taken the victim awareness class. And when I went through the class, it really opened my eyes to all the people that were involved in the crime that I committed because I had no idea that so many people were affected, you know, from the police department, the coroners, the law enforcement, my family, their family, friends. And I didn't realize the, that, that, that impact that I had by committing this crime, that it will affect so many people. And it helped me to understand that, you know, I just didn't have a right to invade in somebody else's life like that. Tell me a little bit about the programs that, uh, the, the clubs that you belong to. I understand you've done a lot of work in, in Toastmasters and other programs like that in prison. Tell me what that's meant to you and what, what you've been able to do while you've been in there. The Toastmasters, Toastmasters helped me to be able to relate with people helping to understand that we're not all the same and that you have to first understand where a person coming from before you can be understood by that person also. That's just one of the um, programs that I've did with Toastmasters. And uh, Thinking for a Change, Cage of Rage, all of those programs was really helpful to me in becoming a better person. And I, have, I have a list of all the certificates and achievements that your lawyer has submitted to us. Tell me a little bit about your faith-based programs and what you've done and what that means to you and what, what you've gotten out of it. In my faith-based programs, it helped me to be more compassionate towards the people that I live around because even in here, I see that I can be helpful to those around me. And it, it gave me the understanding that there is a higher power that I can depend on, that I can call on when I'm going through whatever it is I'm going through or having a bad day. I know that I can look within myself and I can see the spirit working within me that brings me over to where I need to be. And you've had uh, 15 write-ups since you've been in prison for 37 years. Uh, your last one was in 1999. Have you had any write-ups for intoxication? <clears throat> Never. Now, prior to committing this very horrible crime, you didn't have any prison record at all, did you? No, sir. I've never been in trouble with the law or anything. I never had a juvenile record or anything. What would be your transition plan if you were given a commutation and, and allowed to, to get out at some time in the future, 
Where would you go? What would you do? Who would you live with? Where would you work? I would transition to the parole project to get the help that they've offered to give me and help me find the program that we, I was discussing about counseling and maybe AA, some type of sobriety group. And after that, I would live with my nephew in St. Gabriel. Now, Mr. Derricks, uh, very understandably, you have a lot of opposition against your release. There's nothing you can do about that. Family of the victim in this case is adamant about uh, your, your release. They, they certainly don't want you out. Law enforcement, uh, very understandably, is adamant against your release. There's nothing that uh, you can do about it, but that's, that's something that, that needs to be said, needs to be uh, put on the table. Uh, Warden, what can you tell us? Warden Ambo, what can you tell us uh, about Mr. Uh, Derricks? Uh, sir, all the programs that you mentioned are true. He has several others. Uh, he has an associate degree in pastoral ministry, and he also has a BA in Christian ministry. He's the Cap F minister, and he also ministered to the death row offenders. Uh, he has a Christian band that he participated in. Uh, and he's very instrumental in all the programs that we have back there at Camp F. Especially we have the pause program. Uh, most of the time he's there uh, talking to the tourists uh, when they come and do the tours and everything. Uh, I do believe that Mr. Derrick is a changed person from the person that he was in 1986. Uh, just by the reputation that he has here at the prison now uh, with the ministry and everything. So, um, I really think he'll be a good fit to, uh, to be back into the community. Thank you, Warden. Uh, Mr. Derricks, uh, in addition to the comments by the Warden, I've seen uh, a lot of support that you have, not only from your family, but from other uh, uh, supervisors and staff members at, at prison. Uh, Madam Chairman, I think that's all the questions I have at this time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Bella. Mr. Rush. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Derricks, good morning. Good morning, sir. Mr. Derricks, I want to revisit Mr. Maribel's question. <laughs> Why would you beat a lady who needs assistance who is just asking for help to give her a, a boost in her battery and you conveniently had a tire jack iron at your disposal. Why would you beat this person to death? Then put it in your truck of your car. At the time you were arrested, you say you heard this person moaning. She was not dead yet. And you jumped and you dumped her in the woods in a swamp in Ascension Parish, knowing that she was still alive. And there was a hospital within one mile of that location. And you said you didn't know why. You have to, you have to give me something. Mostly everything that I was doing, I was doing out of fright, sir. I wasn't thinking rationally when I was doing what I was doing. No, Mr. Maribel, you didn't even remember. You knew what you were doing and you were right. Is that your story? Excuse me? Excuse me? You knew what you were doing and you were frightened, so you dumped the body. Correct. Then why would you attack her in the first place? I really don't know, sir. Like I said, I wasn't in my right mind when I was doing it. I, there was no reason. There was no reason at all for me to do what I did because it wasn't like I was in the, in the, in, uh, uh, planning to do this or anything like that, sir, at all. I had no reason. I was just letting the drugs just take effect. But after you did it, the drugs were off. And you no, heard sir. Her. No, sir. But you heard her moaning. 
you were frightened, so you jumped the bike. I was frightened, sir, when this was going on. All of this was in the same day, sir. I understand that. What I'm saying is, momentarily after you beat a person to death, you realize, oh, I did something wrong. I'm frightened. I'm fearful. Let me get rid of the evidence. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Shane. Okay, we'll hear from the support now. Mr. Hunley, could we hear from the Parole Project? Thank you. Andrew Hunley with Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, here to inform the board uh, that if Jerome Derricks uh, is to be released in the near future, that he will be a client of our program. Uh, <clears throat> first and foremost, we must say that th this, is, this was clearly uh, a senseless crime. Uh, and, and it's very difficult to, you know, to hear about it and, and question what Mr. Derricks was thinking when the crime was committed. Uh, from Parole Project's perspective, we are looking at the person that Mr. Derricks has become since his incarceration. Um, went to prison at the age of 20 and he's been there for 38 years. Uh, for 38 years, he has demonstrated a record uh, of growth and rehabilitation. Um, I, I know Ward Nambo and, and the board clearly uh, has described uh, the, the programs and uh, the jobs that he has. I think uh, what I should highlight just a bit more is the level of community service you know, for decades that he has provided um, as in his role in the chaplain's department. But overall at Camp F, uh, he has been viewed for years and years as a mainstay and a leader at Camp F. Uh, and, and we feel um, very confidently if Jerome were to be released that, that not only would he be uh, a law-abiding, tax-paying citizen, uh, but that he would be the same person that he is at Angola at Camp F uh, in his new community. Uh, if he is released, Parole Project commits uh, to providing him case management, giving him that initial housing, and also assisting him uh, in his reintegration into the community. Your consideration is appreciated. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Frank Cushendary. Yeah, well, he said just go straight down with it. Yeah. Next speak. No. Yeah. Y'all can sing? Uh, yeah, they can sing. They could probably sing better another day. Yes. One more down, Frank. One more down. Hey. Hey, perfect. All right. Go ahead, sir. How you doing? Um, Jerome is my uncle. Um, I've been, about the last 20 years, been a strong advocate to him, you know, talking to him, being a He's been a role model to me, even in his situation. And I've been there every step of the way. If you need anything, somebody to talk to, advice, we give it to each other. Um, if he get a favorable recommendation from you guys, I'll provide a place for him to stay, help him get a job, different things. Anything he need, I'll be there to help support him to keep him on the right track and keep him doing what he's supposed to do. Thank you, sir. And we have here with us Ms. Wanda Miles in the separate podium. Good morning. <laughs> and well, today I'm here on my brother Jerome Derrick's behalf. And I will say at 20 years old, what the person he was back then, he's not that person anymore. I apologize and I'm sorry for the decision that he made and he allowed the drug to alter him to do something that, of that nature. But he has a great support. He has a strong value. It's almost like while he was placed there, God got his attention to do and get on the track that he should have been on. Had he not wavered or wavered, he would have been a better person not in here in this situation now. I thank the board for allowing him to be 
a part of this today. And he's not, for the 38 years, we have always been by his side. We've always been there to support him. And I was very remorseful for what he's done. And when Jerome do come home again, like my son said, he's going to be on the right track. And I just want to say, I'm a retired warden from the women's prison. And just seeing the rehabilitation that a lot of them have went through and the things they did and the seasons they made when they was younger at the age that they didn't even know they were thinking to do those things, they have been, and so have he, have been doing a lot of what he need to be doing. And I think when he's going to come home, he's going to be a better, he's going to be a great person in the free world. And he's going to bring a lot to it. We've already got a church home for him to get ready to transition him back out there to give back to the public and to reach back to those that need to have that support that they need to have. And I thank y'all for allowing me to speak. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for drinking. Okay. Um, now we'll hear from uh, opposition. And uh, could we hear from? Uh, Kaylin Mason, she's on Zoom. Do we have her with us? Hi, good morning. Can you hear me okay? We can. Wonderful. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. Um, so my name is Taylor Nason, and I am the granddaughter of the late Beverly Nason. Um, I'll keep my comments and my remarks brief and direct um, because that is just the type of person I am. I came in here today not knowing if I was going to be opposed or unopposed. Um, quite frankly, I wanted to hear um, maybe some remorse um, or maybe some, I don't know, insight of, as to a why behind it other than just an excuse of to a joint of marijuana being laced with no concrete um, evidential fact behind that either. Um, so I'm very disappointed that you were given, Mr. Derricks, the platform um, and the opportunity to speak directly um, about how you have rehabilitated and, and focused on the victims and you completely brushed over that question. Um, so that I'm very, very remorseful to see that that is what we have come to today. So with that, um, I do firmly believe that you have yet to take full accountability of your actions. Um, so with that, I do suggest that you uh, do serve your full sentence. I do um, commend you, though, for what you have been doing, the work that you have done. I do not believe that you were the same person that you were uh, 20 or what you were 20 years old. I don't. Um, that's just not realistic. Um, however, I do believe in facing the consequences of your actions, especially for something that is so brutal, senseless, and also has um, monumental and generational trauma that has been passed down from it. Um, so thank you, board, for allowing me to speak today. Uh, that is all I have to say. All right, thank you, Dan. Uh, Ms. Melissa, you want to go next or rather um, Mr. Nice? Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Yeah. Hello, I'm David Nason. Sorry. Um, and what we've been put to you is you just can't even measure it with anything. It's just going to be all horrible. We count my days prior to, you know, after the murder. <laughs> if we didn't know it had taken place, uh, just my life to buy the work I had. I said, the law of the house, all this issue is murder. And next morning, I come in from work. My car is not here. I have all these. I have no idea where she's at. This is what I would tell you about her part. So for days, we don't know where she's at. We got a car full of blood on the interstate. That's it. So that's my morning. Yeah. 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 So that morning, this is beyond strange. So I started getting phone calls that a friend of mine that had law enforcement I asked him, he owned this certain car. That's it. So now I'm freaking out something I don't have no idea. So we'll wake her up because she was asleep because I got off four or five in the morning. Anyway, let's go 
So when your mom had the night before, she said, hey, she was at the house. That's the first thing I did. So we ride over there. It's a Sunday morning, I think. It was like the back part of the lot empty. So I said, let's just pull around here. And I saw all the police out front. I wasn't. So we get out. She starts screaming on her side of the truck. She goes, oh, my God. I just stepped in all the blood. Well, can you imagine this whole parking lot? We park in the spot that my wife's car was in. And she's stepping in the blood. And she's going, oh, and you see all these foot tracks all around. You can almost see where you drove the body around the corner. Yeah. Uh, now we go get the police officer. You come back here. This is something that you don't have no idea. What's going on. Okay, so then. Things kind of start picking up when finally they identified who, who did it. But for a week, I don't know where my wife is. And that's it. You just can't imagine because you don't know what happened to her. You just got pieces of it. It's just, that was not good. Whatever. Slot that happened. And this is the guy that did it. So, you know, we got grandkids that we never see her, and you know, all this generational stuff that you never can have. We don't have any reason why it happens. It's just beyond comprehensible. And if one human can do that to another, well, you're supposed to be helping her. It's just, it's crazy. I can't make any sense of it to this day. We've got to keep coming back here. It's really making me mad. It's fine. We can come back here. We cut a deal. I, Drop first degree off the charge. Let's do second. He went to the fight. That's what it said. That was like no brain area. I'm not even if he can get out later and get anything. It's like in prison. Here I am, second time in five years, trying to keep this guy in prison. What did? Why do we have to do this as a family? Like, why? Where's the law at? We, we had the law on our side. I was like, it's coming against us. I hate it. So as a victim, we get to be a victim. Again, we can't put this in place. We can't. We're going to come back here five years from now if something won't happen today that he's got to stay here. So why did her and I got to do this? No one. If we go home today, we still got a lot all the way to Florida. They can. We're going to keep doing this until we die. Uh, one of us does, I mean, it's just horrible. Why are we going to relive this? This is the same thing. So, while I'm happy, he's found God. I'll be behind God in the I sure didn't know God when he got me. So, I can only buy into so much of this success story. All saying that he's a new guy. He's, Become one with the Lord and do the Lord's work. Can't take away all of that, but that's still the guy who really would be my wife today. So, how can I sit here and go, sure, let it go? He's never going to do that again. Who knows in his quarter room? Not him. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for hearing us. Forgive me. <laughs> my name is Melissa Mason. That's my name. My mom gave me that name. I named after her. I don't mean she was my everything. She was my girl. If she was somewhere. I was with her. I went out. Strong parents took my mother from me. Brutally. Violently. Horrifically. 
Today we stand here all with the voice, but she doesn't have one. We have to be in that place for her. I am, I cannot say enough of how that's, I'm happy for him that he's taking these classes and he's learning these lessons and he's doing those things and he is touching lives. And he can do that right from where he is. Our gifts to him, if you want to call it that, because there are no winners here. Not in this room. There are no winners. But I don't, I don't get a call. I don't get a hug. I don't get a letter. I didn't get to go to my mother for advice. No dances. A prom, a homecoming, no first dates. She missed my graduation. I, it took me years just graduating from college because I had to I couldn't finish the trauma. The trauma was awful, and I still, I still finished. So I can make her proud, even though she couldn't be there with me to watch me walk. I gave birth to three beautiful children. And you know who was there to hold my hand? A nurse. She never got to hold any of her grandbabies, see her grand, great grandbabies, nothing. She, she doesn't get anything. She wasn't allowed anything. She was breathing, still had the opportunity to a life. One different attorney could have dropped her off at a hospital. I could still have her. Instead, my father has to identify an absolutely unidentifiable body. A blood-soaked car. We have to say there are, there are consequences for every action. And his consequence with life in prison without the possibility of parole, that is what we all agree to. And that is what I am asking just that justice be served and that sentence be honored, that it stand, that he stay where he is. I have lived the life in survival mode. I've been, I've been in trauma counseling for years. And you get to a point where you think you're able to heal. And then it's just like scalp wound and it just scars and it becomes generational. You're, you're afraid to let anyone leave your site because you don't know if they're ever going to come home. You don't know. She came in. I spoke to her, she gave me a hug and kiss, and I woke up the next morning expecting to see. None of us ever did, and I couldn't even lay a, I couldn't even lay a rose in her hand in a casket because I couldn't see her. There's, I thought, when I can just concrete tombstone that I need to go to, and that's it. That's what he left us with. And I just ask you, please, let us stand and stay where he is and please allow us to heal. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Babby. Morning, honorable members of the board. Appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak before you. I rise today in opposition. This gentleman's rule. Let me see. This crime occurred in 1986. In 1986, I was a senior at LSU undergraduate. So, uh, trying to piece together what happened in 1986, my author 
this whole has always been a challenge. Well, but I could decipher a few things. Number one, I made an error whenever I filed an opposition paper with this board. I said this lady's daughter was a young child. She was she was 15 years old, she was a young child to be. But as I was sitting here thinking, listening, I was like, you know, it's even more traumatic for her being 15 because she was two weeks old, two months old. What does a two month old know? This girl actually had to the investigation, the identification, the trauma. She was a, she was a teenager. It, it, it so, you know, so for that uh, for that era in my opposition, I do apologize, but it is really worse than I thought based on the age that that young lady was found this happened. The reason I'm here for, for, for these victims who have never recovered, they've been at them. The other reason I'm here is because just the very nature of this crime, there is there there are there are murders and there are murders. All murders are evil and they're terrible. This one, and I think it's been addressed by this board. For what? I mean, did she make you angry? Did she did she do something to you? Did she try to harm you? It was she walked up to his car, asked for help. No problem, I'm to help you. Pull out a tire to be in the death. Put her in. His her car got into her car, drove out of the parking lot of that facility. Instead of turning left and going uh, half a mile to the hospital, turn right, dump the body in a rural part of the Central Barrow to the swamp. And at the time he dumped the body, she was alive. She was gasping, whimpering. That's his testimony, not, not mine. That's 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 what his statement said. And I um. Uh, Prepared for these, I used to try to talk to the detective. And the detective in this case is now retired, but um, he's told me about this case. He said, This is a case I'll never forget. And I'm like, Why? Was it the uh, nature of the victim? He said, No. He said, um, When we discovered the body, she had leaves and sticks in her hands, grabbed, like clutching life. He said, That's just something that thing. Was was something that that would make me forget. That's the reason we're here. This is a heinous crime. He was charged with first degree murder in 1986. He was he pled guilty to second degree murder. Death penalty was taken off the table, and he's paying for a life prison sentence. These people were asked to give by my predecessors. I that you know, I wasn't in this. I wasn't around it, but apparently. He talked to them and said, look, we'll do a second degree murder for you, life in prison. So they gave, they gave a lot. They gave death penalty to life in prison. And now that those goalposts being asked to be moved again, and that's just something they cannot take. I, with my victims, am happy that this gentleman is finding God and doing some of the right things. But one of my victims said, I'm out for you can just as easily do that where you where there, there is consequences for those actions. This beautiful lady just got off of work at a uh, at car problems, walked up to somebody for help. And I would also ask you if you decided to look at the facts. He said that he was going on vendor and smoked some weed that was laced with other. Actually, he had left the ballroom. Driving home, said he had a trouble, walked in the parking lot, of, and was actually sleeping. And that she actually woke him up to ask for help. So I don't think that exactly dovetails into that. Um, he was just partying with drugs to the point that he um, lost his mind. That also, that's, that is not in the state. So that's new evidence. That's, that's, I must have missed it. One of you, I didn't see it. Many of you, I want to thank the board for, for letting us speak and I'll see you all. Thank you. Yes, sir. thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Derricks, is there a statement you'd like to make before we uh, turn it over to Ms. Lee? 
Yes, ma'am, Ms. Renatson. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Renatson. First, I would like to apologize to the family for the hurt that I've caused. And I know that truly this was a horrific incident that was perpetrated by my hands. And I don't know what, I, what else I could do to show my remorse. Five years ago when I was on the board, I was terrified of even sitting here before the board. And Judge Combs got my mind together when he told me that I was almost there. And I didn't understand what he was telling me then. But those five years, I had to reflect on what he was actually telling me. And I now realize that what he was telling me is that I had to own up to what I did and understand the hurt that I had caused this family and to take full responsibility for that. And I did that and I made a promise to stay on the path that I was on and that I would help those that I come in contact with because I know that there are still purpose in my life and I wanted to show that. And I didn't just want to be another statistic, just somebody being in prison. I wanted to be somebody that could make a difference whether I'm in prison or not because I truly know the person that I am and my family knows that I'm not a bad guy. I did a bad thing, but I'm not a bad guy. And I just, you know, wanted people to understand that I don't want to be remembered as a murderer, but that's what I'll be remembered for the rest of my life. And I have to, I have to live with that. But even though that I would be labeled that, it doesn't mean that I have to let that become my reality and that I can still be. Uh, good in this world and do good to others and help those that I know that needs help. And I'm truly sorry for what I did, but I would just hope that you would see me for the man that I've become today and what I strive to be tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Yes, thank you. When I first met Jerome, I was really inspired by him, by his integrity, his honesty, and his true commitment to service. And as, as has been said, he entered prison at 20 years old, immature, an addict, and really out of control. And he is now matured into a 57-year-old man who is a pastor, a minister, a volunteer to help others, a teacher, of classes like Victims Awareness and the Step Up Program, and a leader here. And turning, turning to the crime itself, there is absolutely no doubt this is horrific. It's senseless. It's difficult to hear. I cannot imagine what the family is going through and still impacted by this. And unfortunately, there's no easy answer, and Jerome would be lying to you if he gave a motivation that wasn't there. He was out of his mind on PCP and embalming fluid. He was seeing, seeing things, having hallucinations out of his body, out of touch with his reality. And he committed this senseless act. And he does take responsibility for that. It was him who was in the mindset, who was out of control, who did those drugs, and who has to live with that fact and is remorseful for that act every day of his life. And while he cannot provide the family or anyone with an easy explanation for that and for his, his actions, for his out of control actions while he was on those drugs, he has committed to changing that, to taking those substance abuse classes, to dealing daily with his problems with addiction, with developing his inner strength in order to not have anything like that happen again. Throughout his time here at, here at Angola, he has given back to others. He makes rounds to check on the elderly. He ministers to death row and to Camp F, conducts multiple services a week, works for decades now as a chaplain's clerk and an inmate minister since he was in the first class of the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. 
he he is an artist and he uses the art to affect others as well as a musician with the camp f gospel joy singers and he truly um from his time tutoring others and addressing the literacy problems here he realized that he could have a change and that he needed to improve himself in order to then give back to others and he has done that he has improved himself he is remorseful and re rehabilitated and if he were to rejoin the community he has his transition plan with the parole project he has his family support community support ranging from business people to professors at Loyola all people who are eager to support him to see him succeed and to see him really thrive he has a job lined up with victory enterprises he would continue to stay sober and to go through the process that he needs to to re-enter society he's been a trustee for around three decades now and he has truly shown through years and years of consistent service to others and self-improvement that he is a rehabilitated man and i would ask this board to recommend commutation of his sentence Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are prepared to vote, Mr. Arabella. Thank you, Madam Chairman. First off, I'd like to thank everyone who uh, spoke here today, especially the family of, of the victim. Uh, you have shown us today absolute devastating effects that this horrible sense is sad. We appreciate you being here. Talking to us, the courage that it takes to be in the company. Um, I've been in the criminal justice system for 50 years. And, um, it doesn't get any harder than this. These, these are very, very tough, very, very emotional. I was a prosecutor, as Mr. Babin is today. I was a public defender, I was a defense lawyer, I was a judge, and now I sit on the pardon board. And everyone has different roles as we sit here. Uh, I can remember as a sentencing judge listening to the horror of the crime and what my responsibility was and what I needed to do in terms of, of, of uh, giving a sentence. Our role is to look at the facts of the case. All facts are horrible. All cases that come before us are horrible. The victims that are suffering day after day. Our responsibility is not an easy one. Our responsibility is to look at everything, try to make a determination as to whether or not, in this particular case, Jerome Derricks has done enough to earn a commutation of sentence. And as a look at what all he's done, Good comments from the law, and he's taken excellent programs. So he's a low risk, he's been in prison for 37 years. He's got a good disciplinary record, he's got a good re entry. He has never been in trouble before this horrible crime. It is senseless. It doesn't make sense as to why he did it. Looking at all of those things, taking all of those things, he said, my vote today is going to be recommended to the governor to sentence to my evaluation. Mr. Freeman? Uh, as Mr. Barabella said, it, it is, it's hard for me personally to wrap my arms around why, why, period, as why. Um, you know, uh, usually there's always a, a reasoning behind these crimes, whether it be jealousy or whatever, uh, anger, something. But he, from what I know, I mean, he did not even know this lady whatsoever. And it just snapped and he did it. Uh, well, it it's a tough I mean, I, I really I mean, he's done excellent in prison. 
But at what point has he he done enough? My vote today, uh, I'm going to vote to deny. Mrs. Jackson? Uh, Mr. Derricks, you know, your case is unique uh, in the sense that, you know, when people say, I'm not the same person I was, you know, when I came in. But you actually are the same person that you were. You going, you had gone to high school, you had graduated, you participated in sports, you've never been in any trouble a day in your life. You were working, you were being responsible, except for the fact that you were using marijuana. And People using marijuana during that time frame, or even this time frame, does not rise to the level of making a person a horrible person. You know, I, you know. Obviously, when I looked at the case, I'm thinking, why, why, why? There's no evidence that you robbed the victim. There is no evidence that you committed any kind of sexual assault to the victim. And the only thing that makes sense to me is that you were under the influence of a hallucinogenic that caused you to respond in the way that you did. You know, I was a judge also for 28 years and one of the last cases that came through my court was a man who stabbed his own little boy to death while being under the influence of, uh, of Mojo. I've been a great father. And so I know that it is possible for someone to do something under the influence of a hallucinogenic that they would never do at any other point in their life. And so I, I don't believe that you know, you came in as a monster and somehow changed. I think you had been a good person. You were doing all the right things. And unfortunately for you, but even more unfortunately for the Nason family, you got a hold of something that changed the trajectory of your life. You have been a class A trustee for 30 years of your 37 years. You have done exceedingly well <laughs> during your incarceration. Uh, you have not negated in any way what you did. I don't think you really understood yourself why, except for the fact that I got a hold of something that I just did not expect it to happen. And so looking at all the things that you have accomplished over the course of your incarceration, the person that you were prior to the date of this offense is the person that I see today as well. So my vote today would be to recommend a commutation uh, of 99 to 99 years. Mr. Rice. Thank you, Madam Chairman. First of all, as the victim advocate on the board, board I'd like to apologize to Nisi's family uh, for the repeated appearance in uh, this pardon hearing room. But the legislative body of the state of Louisiana makes the law, and the law gives an offender the right to apply for a pardon after a certain number of years of incarceration. And when that offender is denied at different intervals according to the crime, he's allowed to reapply. And this body is only an instrument 
of that legislative body who was appointed by the governor to fulfill the wishes of that legislative body. But I know it makes you relive this situation over and over again, but it is Louisiana state law that we do this. I'd like to speak to the, to the offenders that thank you for your appearance. Thank you for the support that you've given uh, Mr. Derricks. Mr. Derricks? Yes, sir. There's three reasons why a person is incarcerated. To rehabilitate himself, and I have no doubt that you have rehabilitated yourself. You have performed very well during your incarceration. The second reason is isolation. We want to isolate the bad guy from the community at large. And retribution. Punishment for the crime that he committed. And there is no reason, rhyme, or I can't even think of an idea why you committed this senseless crime. You couldn't articulate to us this morning the reason why. And everybody that spoke today want to know why. Mr. Derrick, Mr. Derrick, I think you don't know the reason why, or the crime was so egregious that your inner being will allow you to articulate the reason why. But that doesn't matter because the crime was so violent, the crime was so egregious, you were aware that the victim was still living. He could have made a turn the opposite way and dropped off at a hospital. And you didn't. <clears throat> Based upon the violent, egregious nature of the crime, overwhelming express opposition from the whole legal community, the judge, the DA's office, law enforcement, the adamant opposition of the victim's family. My vote is to deny your request. Thank you, Mr. Rashay. All right, Mr. Derrick, you've got a split vote. Two to grant, two to deny. So you know the outcome of today's proceeding. Is your application for clemency has been denied? Good luck to you.
Mr. Lutch, would you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and DOC number, please, sir. Donald Lutcher, 210816. Yes, sir, Mr. Lutcher, good afternoon. Um, you're here today seeking a commutation of your sentence. Yes, ma'am. in May 1996 in the 32nd Judicial District, Terrebonne Parish. Yes, uh, you were sentenced to life for a second degree murder. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Let me uh, acknowledge we have some uh, folks here representing the victim. Uh, we have Tracy Allen and Casey Williams, both whom will be speaking. We also have Michael Trust Claire, Tippy Trust Claire, Paswana Trust Claire, and Validia Trust Claire, all who are here in opposition. Uh, your case this afternoon, um, Mr. Lutcher has been assigned to Mr. Roche. Uh, he'll be making a presentation and you'll be asked to answer any questions he may have. And I do see, excuse me, the pro projects here too. We'll call on him if you're Mr. Roche. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Lutcher. How you doing? Good. Uh, Mr. Lutcher, sit back, relax, and we're going to have a conversation, okay? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Madam Chairman, fellow board members, we have Donald E. Lutcher, DOC number 2108. One six. Mr. Lutcher is here this afternoon seeking a commutation of his sentence for a 1996 conviction for second degree murder in, this, in the stabbing of his wife, Sandra Plus Claire Lutcher, on April 19, 1992. He was first convicted in the death of his wife in 1993. But through an appeal to the Louisiana Supreme Court, the court ordered him released and a new trial was ordered in 1995. In January of 1996, he was found guilty again, this time by a jury of his peers and once again sentenced to life at DOC without benefit of probation, parole, or suspension in sentence. Since his September 96 sentencing, Mr. Lutcher has made two additional appeals to the Louisiana Supreme Court and both were denied. Let me see if I have my facts straight, Mr. Lutcher. In January of 20, I'm sorry, in January of 1996, you were released by code order, is that correct? Uh, I, was still in, I was still in jail, but I never was released. I was still okay. in jail. So this means to go back to your parish for the retrial. Yeah, back to the parish. But you were never released. Never released. Okay. And you didn't go back into DOC custody until your sentencing in September of 1996. Yes, sir. Okay, great. So basically, you've been incarcerated for about 31 years. 31 years. Okay, great. Uh, let me get back to my report. Okay. Mr. Lutcher, you, you've given different versions of the events of April 19th, 1992. You gave a different event back in 92 when you said you were at a Gaither shop in Gibson, Louisiana, and Miss Sandra was at Carmen's Sweet Shop 
and you were on the telephone, and uh, so you hitchhiked to Highway 190 near Common Sweet Cap, which was a ballroom, and you walked to the ballroom, and when you got to the sweet shop, you didn't go in to get your wife. There was a young man by the name of Loretta who was outside home and sweet shop and you asked her to go in. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Why didn't you go into the ballroom? At that time, I didn't, I didn't really feel I needed to go in there. You wanted to talk to your wife, so your wife was in the in a sweet shop. Why didn't you go in? That that uh I just didn't choose not to go in. Okay. Yeah. And when your wife came out, you talked about 30 minutes in front of the uh sweet shop. Yes, and sir. then then you walked down to a trailer, which was a short distance. And you talked for another 30 minutes. That's about right? Yes, sir. During your conversation, her brother, John Cusclair, and a guy named Greg walked up, and you said in the police report when you were arrested, when they walked up, they had their hands in their pocket, and you felt threatened. Is that about right? Yes, sir. Why did you feel threatened? Well, at the time it happened, I was I was drinking and I knew we had got into it a long time ago, so I figured they were gonna get into it, we were gonna get into it again. Yeah, but why would why would you be threatened? Because her brother walked up and a friend of her brother's name, Greg, yeah. walked up, had their hands in the pocket, you didn't see a weapon. Why did you feel threatened? It's just, I guess, just, uh, I don't know how to explain that word. What I'm trying to say, it just happened like that. Okay. So, yeah, you what I'm felt trying to say. You felt threatened. Yeah. So, you had an open pocket knife that you said that you always carried when you were walking somewhere. Yes, sir. And you pulled the knife out and you stabbed your wife. But she was the closest person to you. That's your words. Yes, sir. Why, why would you stab your wife when you were threatened by her brother and a guy named Greg? Well, I guess you could say I was trying to like scare them off, and maybe I thought maybe that would blow them off, scare them off by me I doing that. By stabbing your wife, I'm going to use your words. Yeah. Maybe I stabbed her once. Maybe I stabbed her twice. Maybe it was three or more times. Yeah. How many times did you stab your wife? Two, about three. So, so I would imagine that did scare her brother off. He just stabbed his sister, and so he ran away. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, at the time you were arrested walking down Highway 90, you didn't have a shirt on. Why? Hmm. That, that, uh, it may sound weird, but that I don't remember not even having a shirt off. Okay. You had bad jeans on and you had. You were bare chested, mm -hmm. and the police arrested you on Highway 190. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. Highway 90. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, then in April of 2021, you told a parole officer 
that you were living in Houston, Texas, and that you came back from Houston to try to talk your wife in to come to Houston to live with you and your family. Is that correct? Yes, sir. What a different story 30 years later. Uh, uh, you said you got in an argument with your wife. You got upset because she was seeing another man and you stabbed her to death. Yes, sir. Those are two completely different stories. Well, uh, what's the Tell us, tell this panel what the truth is. All right. Well, I got drunk that night and I went to the trail house or wherever we was. We got into an argument and one thing led to another and I stabbed him and I took off down the road. And so, the second, up, so the second story is the true story. Second story is a true story. The first one is my delight. When I first got picked up or wherever they got with me, I was trying to throw it off or get out. And that's, I came up with the right story. Just, just for information purposes, why would a person carry an open pocket knife in his pocket every time he took a walk? Well, I had, how should I put it? I had a reputation of carrying a knife and people knew that. So I always carried a knife in my pocket, like for my protection. So they wouldn't mess with you? Yeah, because that was, that was my reputation I had, carrying a knife. That's not a good reputation, Mr. Letcher. Well, at the time, I thought it was. Okay, okay. Uh, Mr. Lutcher is currently 60 years old, and he was 29 at the time he murdered his wife. He's been incarcerated for 31 years. Mr. Lutcher, there is some indication in my documents, you had pending charges at the time you murdered your wife. Is that right? Oh, no. Okay. I couldn't that, remember that. Hmm? Okay, you had pending charges. You were arrested for disturbing the peace by intoxication and entering and remanding on land after being forbidden. And you were arrested, and those charges were pending at the time you murdered your wife. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Why were you in Houston, Texas, when you had pending charges in Louisiana? True. I just I just went to stay there, I guess. But I didn't really didn't really know I had a charges pending. When I left Louisiana, so those charges were dismissed when you were convicted of murdering your wife. Okay. Mr. Lutcher has an extensive criminal history. He's been arrested as an adult 10 times. Six of those arrests involve violence, four misdemeanor convictions, and one felony conviction. Opposition in this case comes from the 33rd JDC District Attorney's Office in Terrebonne Parish and the Terrebonne Parish Sheriff's Office. Multiple members of the victim family are adamantly opposed to any clemency. Michael, the victim's brother, Laurie, the victim's sister, the victim's two daughters, Tiffany, 
uh, Trust Clan and Tracy Allen are adamantly opposed. Mr. Lutcher has a low risk assessment. He just enrolled in victim awareness and thinking for a change in March of 23. Why did you wait so long? You've been incarcerated for 31 years and you just two months ago and probably hadn't completed victim awareness and thinking for a change. Why did you? Why, why did you wait? At the time where I was in another another part of the prison, I was taking other classes and I really didn't think I needed victim awareness and thank you for a change. So I ended up taking a bunch of other classes and other programs that the prison you know, required us to take. So I took all of them. Good did you think it was important to take victim awareness when you killed your wife? And, uh, and children, our children are emotionally and physically affected by your crime? Well, at that time when I was arrested, I wasn't thinking about victim awareness and nothing like that. Then mm -hmm. I got, when I got up into in my incarceration, I said, well, it's time for me to change. And that's when I started taking all the classes. And when I got to another state of prison, they offer me victim awareness and thank you for a change. So I got off into it. How long have you been uh, out at Louisiana State Penitentiary? Sir? How long have you been housed at Louisiana State Penitentiary? <clears throat> oh, about 20 or 25 years. Okay. So give or take. Give or, give or take. So, so you've been at Angola for at least 25 years. <clears throat> yes, sir. Could it be you just enrolled in classes because you knew this hearing was coming up and you wanted to make sure that you had some programs under your belt? No, sir. No, sir. Okay. Like I said, I didn't I didn't really think about that class, those classes. I would think about the other programs I was in. Okay. So I wasn't really thinking about those classes. <laughs> tell me really... why. Tell me why an individual has been incarcerated for thirty-one years. He has no GED. He has no high school diploma. Why? Because each time I get into the class and get further, further, seem like I can't make it. So I just decide I'm not gonna get back into it no more. How many times have you enrolled in GED classes? I enrolled one, two, five, four times. Did you finish the literacy program? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's go to your institutional record. Uh, You've been in state custody for about 20, 27 years, but overall you've been incarcerated for 31 years. I see why you're still on the waiting list for substance abuse. Have you taken any substance abuse treatment or education in the last 31 years? Yes, sir. Tell me I've, about it. I've been a New Hope. I've been a New Hope class. And I, I've been a substance abuse. I've been a substance so, abuse man. The institutional record says that you're on a waiting list for substance abuse. All right. Yeah, I've been there. So. Okay. I'm going to call out some courses. <laughs> Have you completed living in balance? Uh, Have you completed living in balance? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Have you completed living in balance? I, bar I barely could hear him. Have you completed living in balance? No, sir. I'm still in there. I'm in there. Warren Ambo? Yes, sir. He has not, he has not completed living in balance. 
Taylor Bay recovered? Uh, no, sir. No, no, sir. Louisiana Risk Management? No, sir. What programs has he completed, Warren? He only completed anger management. Uh, he did healthcare army training and he did a point lookout project. Um, the last time he was enrolled in GED was in uh, 2016, September 2016, and um, he dropped the course for personal and voluntary reasons. And he do have hey, a point. I will get back to you later, Warren. Um, Mr. Lutch. Yes, sir. And I will tell you quite frankly, you have a, you like the good time programming that you need for your rehabilitation. You've been incarcerated 31 years, and I know sometimes things get in your way, but you've been at a state institution for 25 plus years, and you should have more programs than you have now. Uh, that's uh, let's see. He's housed in minimum custody. He only has four disciplinary write-ups in 31 years of incarceration. And that's a pretty good record. Uh, Mr. Lutcher, what was your last disciplinary write-up? Uh, November 2005. And that's the only class B write up you have. All your other write ups are class A. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, I see we, you worked for prison enterprises. How long did you work for prison enterprises? Stayed there about a, about a year and six months. Okay. And are you a uh, healthcare orderly now? No, sir. What's your, what's your present job assignment? I work on death row. I'm a chair walker. A chair walker, okay. Uh, tell me about your organizations. The Wonders of Joy, what is that? That was a program that they had, they came up with, a, a club they came up with that was just a regular club what was teaching school and everything, but nothing really applied to it. So they just left it alone. So they okay. just, started, just started just running like a club. Okay. New Hope Group. That's where I learned my my 12-step program. And that's when they, they, they taught me how to do a control my alcohol. How to okay. do yeah. Now, Question 25A of the annual report says, have you ever been revoked? And it states the offender was on probation when he committed his charge. So you are on probation but for pending charges and you are living in Houston, Texas. And I, I still don't understand that, but I'll leave that alone. Tell me about your transition plan. What do you plan to work and what do you plan to live? Well, my, my transition plan is I'm in hospice right now and I I take care of a lot of the people that's dying. So my plan is to get out and get in the hospice program and help the people that's dying that don't have nobody, even though they have somebody, they help them out too. So I'm able okay. to but I just asked you, were you a hospice orderly? And you said no. No, I'm a hospice caregiver. Hospice all in caregiver is two different things. Hospice, okay. Yeah. I thought you said you were a chair walker. I'm a chair walker at death row. I do my hospice work volunteer. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, how many hours a week do you spend in hospitals? Well, I go like the weekend and I'll stay like four, five hours. Like this morning, I went at two o'clock and I stayed till seven. Then I came 
over here to go to the board. I have a yeah. patient I sit with that's dying, so I go sit with them. So. Very good. In your institutional record, it's more fair. And the reason it's more fair because the classification officer says you have a great, you have great programs, but you're lacking in educational and vocational programming. You need to start working towards that GED, get some type of education. Sometimes it's a little bit more difficult for one person than the other person. But if you put your mind to it, I would suggest that you get back into the GED program. Yes, sir. Uh, let me get back to my report. So let's talk about drugs and alcohol. When when did you start using drugs? Well, I never used drugs, but I drank a lot. I was drinking a lot of alcohol. You never you never used marijuana? No, sir. No drugs of any kind. No, sir. Okay, you no, you. Your demon was alcohol. My demon was the alcohol. And when did you start abusing alcohol? I guess I was about 10 years old. And me and my little, my little buddies used to hang out. And we used to go to the store. We couldn't buy no alcohol, so we'll get somebody else to buy a little bottle. And we'll go to the store and drink it. And that's when I started drinking. And I was drinking regular. And like... I was drinking so regular, like when I got older, alcohol became part of my life. Everything I did was based on alcohol. I had a job, I was drinking. I would go out, I was drinking. Party, I was drinking. Wherever I went, I had something to drink. If I go to sleep at night, I wake up drinking. Mr. Lutcher. Yes, sir. How, how long were you married to Miss Sandra? About two or three years. So she knew about your alcohol problem? Yes, sir. Everybody that knew me knew about my alcohol problem. They know I love to drink. But I had wrecks and everything. Now you had, you had some DWI? Yes, sir. Now, why were you and Ms. Sandra separated? No, uh, I guess we just decided to separate. So let me ask you again. Why were you and your wife separate? Oh uh, I really don't have the answer to that. We just separated. Okay. But you were trying to talk her back to go to yes. Houston, Texas, please. Yes, sir. Okay. If and when you release, what is your ongoing sobriety plan? How do you plan to stay away from alcohol? Well, it's, it's not how do you stay away from it, how you just don't get, get off into it. That's the thing. I won't be trying to drink no more because I know what it did me and I know what it do people. So I'm going to have try to control that and you know like the like the steps say you know come to believe the greater power that you can help restore back to sanity so that's what i'm gonna be trying to do stay away from the alcohol not go to it so you're not an alcoholic anymore right uh no 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 i don't drink no more not since i've been incarcerated are you an alcoholic when I, before I got incarcerated, yes, sir. Are you an alcoholic, Mr. No, no sir, not right now. So you need some substance abuse education and you probably need some substance abuse treatment because once an alcoholic, you'll always be an alcoholic. Okay. It's a, Lifelong disease, 
that you had to treat constantly. All right. Warden Ambo, you have any additional comments, concerns, remarks, or observations? No, sir, I don't. Thank you, ma'am. Madam Chairman, I do have a recommendation, and I will share with my fellow board members at the conclusion of this interview. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Um, we'll hear from the board. Could we, Mr. Hunt? Hello, Andrew Hundley with Louisiana Parole Project, uh, confirming that uh, Mr. Letcher is a client of our organization. Um, the reason that we've decided to take Mr. Letcher on as a client uh, is because he's been incarcerated for around three decades. Uh, only one high court write up during his incarceration uh, showing uh, that he can comply with rules and expectations. Uh, Class A trustee, but uh, most especially, we were impressed with his maturity uh, and, and what's he, what he's demonstrated as a hospice volunteer and his community service and involvement with the Point Lookout Project. If he would be released, uh, we would provide him with reentry support immediately after his release. We would assist him with his sobriety, ensure that he had mental health and substance abuse assessment, and then he would have the tools necessary to um, to follow up with the, whatever those recommendations are, but also give him long term case management by a peer mentor and help him with his reentry into the community. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we have here speaking uh, in opposition. Could we hear from Tracy Allen? I'm here. Go ahead. Yes, my name is Tracy Allen. I'm Sandra Trust Claire's middle child. My thing is, um, when he spoke about them being separated, he didn't know why they were separated. She left him because he was abusive. And he took her life because he, she didn't want to go back. Leaving her with three kids nieces, nephews, that she don't even know, grandkids that she don't even know. And for him to want to be left paroled out, I don't think so. My family went through a lot and she didn't deserve what she had. She didn't deserve it. And to let you know, she did leave her mark here on earth. And you speaking to her. Looks, my mom was small. You wasn't scared. You did that because that's what you wanted to do. And I know my family that's here, over there that's willing to speak, um, they feel the same way. You took something special from all of us, a mother, an aunt, a grandmother, friend, everybody loved for no reason at all. And the end, my what I have to say is don't grant him the parole because he don't deserve it. Thank you. Thank you. And we have Tracy Williams here. I don't know if that was my I didn't speak loud. Yeah. Okay. Right. So our mother Sam and Trust Lab was taken away from us. Under horrendous circumstances on April 19th of 1990, where three surviving now daughters are tormented daily at the thought of what she endured in the last moments of her life. It plays out in our minds constantly, as well as we recall and remind and reminded of the fatal sequence of that event. 
We wonder when our mother realized she was in mortal danger. We wonder what her murderer said to her as he delivered 28 stab wounds. With two of those delivered with so much force that it punctured through her frail frame from her back to the front. Or did he realize she was in, or did she realize she was in imminent danger as he delivered that fatal style wound to her windpipe? We will forever be reminded of uh sorry. We will forever wonder for how long was she conscious, knowing she would die and leave her children without tangible love. Did he ever think about the future lives that his actions affected? Her three daughters, a mother, siblings, other relatives, a community that would be left to question the events of that day over and over and over. Due to his actions, our mother had missed high school graduations, college graduations, when she was never scared to say how proud she was. She has missed out on being a grandmother to find beautiful grandchildren. Grandchildren was denied the experience of the grandmother being part of their lives. They were denied kisses and hugs and prayers. The sequences of events on April 19, 1992, I know they could not be and would not be present in or in our milestone events, nor for the future generation. Our mother is gone, we're broken, she was precious. It was our grandmother's oldest daughter. The unbearable grief surrounds this event. Um, it's far reaching and devastating on our family and their health. Our grandmother died with a, heart, a broken heart, not understanding why our daughter was murdered. Her brother also succumbed to death by a broken heart, blaming himself for his youthful inability to save his dear sister from being murdered. Our overwhelming sorrow comes in waves, in forms of panic, and not in it. We can never talk to her, we can never hold her, we can never be held by her, and never be part of her life. We see closeness to our mother, we have to visit a grave site. We must sit in silence and wait for our sorrows to dissipate. We listen for angels to whisper so we can move forward. So his family should be grateful to visit him in prison, write him letters, or receive phone calls, and not at his grave site. <laughs> our lives will never be the same. Her death leaves an aching in our lives that we can never be there. The sleepless nights are too numerous to count. The, night, the nightmares are too painful to the end. The endless streams of tears haven't stopped, nor will they even time to. The selfish act of 1992, of April 19, 1992, devastated our family for and further reaching consequences. His selfish act destroyed her mother and her siblings. Our mother's collided a wound for her infectious smile and pleasant nature. However, we've been robbed of that since April 19. Instead, we hold tight to memories of what might happen. And we try to move forward, but a tremendous war would never be filled, and the heartbreak would never go away. We're sure that life in jail is hell. However, the punishment is not comparable to the punishment we've been doing for the last 31 years. Trying to wrap our heads and hearts around not having a mother in our lives because she was murdered, and she attempted to walk away from an abusive husband, an abusive man, and an abusive marriage. Not long ago, Sandra, trust that youngest daughter, posts her mother's story on social media and hope to just straighten someone that's trying to walk away from an abusive partner. And one of the defendant's sister had the nerve to tell us to get over it. It's been 30 years and we need to move on. Mm -hmm. How callous is that? Ms. Williams, can you wrap it up? Please? Yes. Um, but how can we move on without a mother, without the thought that the defendant was outraged enough so her mother that she attempted to walk away. They said time heals all wounds, but our family would say the statement is not true. Because 31 years, our family has tried to heal from 28 stop wounds that Sandra prospects is not true. Mm -hmm. In closing, we got to today to determine that the defendant should be determined to go, uh, allowed to go to his home to his family, to live a new life in a world where we 
of civil liberty from rules. As Plato has stated, we're tormented there, let us start that she endured. We say no, and we thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. All right, Mr. Lutcher, is there a brief statement you'd like to make before we go? Uh, I had wrote a a accountable letter for my for my actions to the family and I'd like to read if it's all right. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Donald Lutcher. I'm writing this letter to share and complete understanding of the crime I committed on April the 19th, 1992, when I took the life of Sandra Trust Claire Lutcher. I am very remorseful for my action and for what I have done. And and there was no right found in my action for taking her life away from her family, relatives, and friends and community. I apologize for the hurt and pain I've caused you all. I realize that you all have suffered because of my terrible mistake. I decided to take Sandra's life. Since my incarcerated, I've learned to take full responsibility for my actions through educating myself and participating in the state requirement courses. These programs have helped me to become a better man and ensure that this type of incident will never happen again. I am participating in substance abuse and taught me how to control my addiction and behavior. I further educate my learning by how to bring my anger under control by taking the course of anger management, which have shown me now how to stay in control of my anger and turn my anger into positive situation by using using different sorry about that i have learned from educating myself with one of the basic tools of knowledge of being accountable for my action and learning that life i took was caused caused everyone so much pain and hurt that can now be replaced i ever there no justification for my action and all what i did to miss sandra lutcher and i was wrong for that again i do apologize for all the hurt i have caused to you and I have to live with this for the rest of my life. Thank you for taking your time, for taking your time to let me read this letter. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, here to vote. Here. Mr. Lutcher, yes, sir. based upon adamant opposition, the victim's family expressed opposition, opposition from the entire legal community, the judge, the DA's office, law enforcement, an extensive criminal background and a light of rehabilitated program. My vote is and recommendation is to deny your request. Thank you, Mr. Mirabella. Thank you, Mr. Lutcher. <clears throat> uh, you probably need some more programs, but you've done a lot of things while you've been in prison. I'm very impressed with your hospice volunteer work. Uh, you're chill walker, uh, you, you've done anger management, you, you've done a lot of work while you've been in prison. The disciplinary record has been excellent. Uh, I'm willing to take a chance on you. You've got a low risk. Um, my vote would be today to uh, grant, to recommend to the governor that he grant a commutation to 99 years. Mr. Freeman? Uh, my vote today. You know, if you had more substance abuse treatment, it would be different. But I, I really feel that alcohol is the main enticer behind your actions. It's what causes you temper. And uh, quite frankly, I think it is what led to a lot of the disappointments in your life. So my vote today is to deny due to, deny due to victim opposition and law enforcement. Mrs. Jackson. Uh, Mr. Lester, I, I do wish you had um, involved yourself in some more programming. I do understand some of the things that you said, um, but I don't think you're ready yet. You've done some good things, and I want to commend you on those things. I want you to be part, but I just think today is not the day. I think there's some work that you do, so I'd love to. All right, um, Mr. Lutcher, you've received one favorable vote, three that were not favorable, so you didn't get the vote you needed. 
uh, today your uh, application for clemency is denied. So good luck to All right, good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Olfers, would you uh, introduce yourself? Tell us your name and DOC number, please. My name is Ronald Olfers. My DOC number is 517082. <clears throat> Olfers, uh, you're here this afternoon seeking a commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced in the 22nd Judicial District, St. Tammany. November 2006, you relieved, received a life sentence for second degree murder. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right, let me just acknowledge the folks who have joined us today. Uh, we have Andrew Hundley with the Parole Project. We have uh, some 
family members, John Alfers, Daniel Alfers, Lori Alfers, uh, Daniel Alfers, and Ron Alfers. Uh, and speaking on your behalf will be Lori and Ron. We'll call them at the appropriate time to do. Uh, we also have joining us um, by phone, Ms. Linda Roy, um, who is representing the victim and will call on her at the appropriate time also. Uh, your case this afternoon, Mr. Alfers, has been assigned to Mrs. Jackson, seated to my far left. Would you answer her questions, please? Good afternoon, Mr. Alfers. How are you today? I'm, I'm doing fine. I am a little hard of hearing and I'm, I'm having a little I'll different. Try to speak up, okay? okay? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right. How old are you, Mr. Alfers? I'm 70 years old. And how much time have you served in this case? Oh, uh, um, for 10 would be 17 years. Um, and the victim in this case was your second wife. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, tell us what happened to her. Basically, 27 years ago, I did something that was unimaginable. I caused the death of my wife. How did you cause the death of your wife? She and I, she drowned behind our, our house. Uh, we were having some mar uh, marital problems. And we started talking about where our marriage was headed. And it escalated into an argument. We grabbed each other and we fell into the waterway. And at that time, I didn't realize that she stopped struggling. And I. And you what? Huh? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. So your story today is that you all were struggling and you both fell into the water and she drowned. Is that what you were saying today? Yes, ma'am. Um, so why didn't you pull her out of the water? Because I knew, I, I did, I, I held her. I, I looked up, I looked up and I said, Debbie, I love you. And I held, I held her. And I, oh. Why didn't you pull her out of the water? We were, she was dead. She was cold. Her arms were cold. All I could do was hold her and call her. You and she fell into the water at the same time. Yes, ma'am. Why would she be cold? Why would her body be cold? Why would she be dead? Why didn't you go out of the water after the two of you fell into the water? I, we were struggling and I, I was holding her. I didn't realize I was holding her under the wall, but I was. And because what you're saying is making no sense to me. I'm sorry. I said, what you're saying doesn't make a lot of sense to me. What well, then if, if this was some accidental drowning, why did you call the police and report her missing? 
when you knew all the while she was down at the dock. Why did you do that? I couldn't admit to myself that I had done something so terrible. But you haven't told us the terrible thing that you did. I'm sorry, Ms. Jackson. What is the terrible thing that you did? I took her life. How? By drowning her. Intentionally? No, not intentionally. I did not do that intentionally. Uh, Ms. Um, this, is, this is like the third story that you told about this. First, you called the police and you reported her missing. Yes, ma'am. And when they came, you you know kind of got them down to the dock to look down there, and you found her in the water. And according to the police report, you then you know went in the water and you pulled her out. And um, the um, cause of death or, or the manner of death was undetermined. And then when the case was re-examined and it was ruled to be a homicide, you told a different story that you uh, were struggling. You pushed her into the water and you never said anything about you being in the water with her. You pushed her. She fell in the water as part of the struggle. And then uh, you left her there in the water. Ms. Jackson, I was ashamed of myself. I couldn't admit to myself what I had done. I couldn't, I didn't want to admit to anyone what I had done. And you're not admit, Ms. Olney, you're not admitting to anyone today what you've done. The yes, car I coroner's uh, examination that took place, um, I think in 2002 found evidence of you know blunt force trauma that would have been inconsistent with someone falling the short distance. I, I don't uh, honestly don't know how she got the head injuries that she had. That she had two or three bruises on her head. Um, and, and she could have hit her head on the bulkhead when we went in to the water. I don't know. I have no okay. idea. Okay. Um, what was this business about her taking $70,000 from an elderly person, running off to Miami with another man, running out of money, and then coming back to you and you took her back? Why would you say something like that? It was the truth. Uh, I'm not sure who I told that to, but um, it was the truth. And then you told him that somebody told you she had been arrested 27 times. I mean, it seems like you were doing everything in your power to paint her in a negative light. No, it wasn't that. Every, uh, My 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 previous wife, Debbie. Well, I wasn't going to talk very much about your previous wife, but she was also murdered in your home in 1979 in an apparent burglary attempt. A gentleman was convicted of that crime and served 34 years in prison and was ultimately exonerated and found not to have been to have been innocent of the charge. So somebody uh, served 34 years in prison for killing your first wife for a crime he did not commit. Yes, ma'am. You know, it's very unusual for a person to have two wives for them to both end up dead in acts of violence. That's kind of... Um, you know, concerning to me. So we'll just leave it at that. Um, you have opposition in the case from the DA, uh, the uh, 
sheriff's office, a victim's sister. On the other hand, you do have uh, a lot of support from your family, from uh, a lot of people involved in the reentry program. Uh, your risk is low. You've only had, uh, you've had no write up uh, whatsoever. You participated in a lot of programs. Um, tell us about programs that you've been most active in, Mr. Alpers. Uh, I'm sorry, programs what? That you've been active in. Uh, programs what? that you've been active in. Uh, getting it right, inside, outside, dad, um, financial planning. Um, a lot of, uh, the majority of the programs with the reentry program that I'm involved in, um, up until uh, two years ago, I was teaching a bunch of the classes, but I, I came down with cancer. And um, so I had to cut back on a lot of my teaching. The only class I teach at this time is the, the financial planning class. And you have been a part of the police officer since Yes, ma'am. And the police officer at the time of the second wife's uh, death? No, ma'am. Uh, why were you no longer with the police department? I had uh, cancer back in 1986 also, and I took a disability pension. And that was not related to the death of your first wife? There was not nothing brought up and you terminate. You were terminated. You have to appeal to get your job back. You don't get terminated for cancer. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't understand what you said. I said you were terminated because of the events surrounding the death of your first wife. Yes, ma'am. And you ended up appealing that um, dismissal and you were successful, um, but you were not terminated because you had cancer. You were terminated because of suspicions uh, revolving around death of your first wife. Isn't that correct? In other words, I was terminated in um, 79, I believe it was, for possession of stolen property, and that was involving my first wife. I was reinstated. The uh, detective basically uh, stated at the civil service hearing that my termination was just to put pressure on, on me because of an investigation of the death of my wife. Is they suspected you of being involved in the death of your wife? Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, my understanding of the higher up rank did from what I was told. But I was reinstated. And um, I guess about five years later or whatever, I came down with the cancer. And they uh, wanted me to take a disability, which I took. Uh, you have a number of letters uh, of support, uh, including people from uh, your family, the reentry program, some of the reentry mentees. I've all spoken well of you. Um, Warren Amber, what can you tell us about Mr. Alpers? Um, Mr. Alford has taken a plethora of classes. Uh, he also has facilitated uh, Inside Out and Getting It Right. Uh, he participated in Tyro Leadership. He's one of the lead social mentors. Uh, he's very dependable in that uh, area. And he sets a good example for the mentees. Um, he's a minimum A trustee that works at a, as a mentor in a reentry uh, program. Thank you, um, Warren Ambo. Mr. That's all I have. Just one question. Mr. Rashad, Mr. Alfred, 
Yes, sir. Alvin Rose here. How are you? I'm doing fine. How are you doing? I have one question. At the time of your first wife's death and your second wife, both of those individuals were on, in the process of divorcing you. Is that correct? I wasn't aware that my first wife was until after her death. Uh, my second wife, uh, we were talking, uh, you know, about where our marriage was headed. So both of those, both of those individuals were in the process of divorcing. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I, I, I would say that's correct. Thank you, sir. All right. All right. Um, I don't see any other questions, so we'll go to the support. Mr. Hunley with the Parole Project. Uh, Andrew Hunley, Louisiana Parole Project, <clears throat> appearing to the board today to inform you that if Mr. Ulfers is released, that our organization will provide him reentry support into the community uh, based on his outstanding disciplinary record in prison. Uh, what he's done as a reentry mentor um, and his, his low risk level. We have a high degree of confidence in his ability to reenter the community and, and to, to be a good member of the community. He has given a lot uh, to his local community at Angola, helped a lot of young men uh, rebuild their lives on the inside. And uh, we hope to give him the opportunity to do the same one day in the near future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Lori Alfers? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm Lori Alfers. I'm married to Ron Jr. I met Ronnie and Debbie 27 years ago and two months ago. So I didn't know them together very well. I spoke to Debbie quite a bit on the phone. And, you know, when all of this happened, you know, of course, Ronnie didn't tell us, but said he couldn't tell us, you know, of course, we what he had done. And, um, you know, but um, these four guys are victims. All my girls are victims. He knows that. And he, I have seen, I mean, we have the word with this, but I've seen real sincerity from him. You know, he is, I can honestly say, I mean, because it took me a long time to come around. And my girls, well, honestly, they didn't even know. They thought he worked for the CIA because my husband wouldn't tell them. But it happened to me. So they, um, but they have forged a relationship and they love him and we all love him. And I can promise you, you know, I keep hearing from supporters that he is a, you know, a low risk offender, a low risk offender, but definitely offended the court. He offended our community, he offended the state he decides. But this man has made tremendous breakthroughs. If he's given the opportunity, I definitely see him leaving a much better man, a better father, a better grandfather, a better friend. And when we go visit him at Angola, I was amazed because he's a quiet man. You know, so, but he's had lots of people that walk up and hug him and they tell us about the great things that he's done for them. And, you know, and I just, I believe he's worthy. I believe he's worthy. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you for calling me first. I really couldn't steal any of my notes. <laughs> I'm Ron Jr. Um, 
I was actually the okay. last person to speak to them. Um, she was basically my mother because um, she raised us the doctor's family with brothers too. Um, my daughter uh, was always at their house. Um, so, um, you know, we lost all of that. Um, after it all occurred, um, I supported my father. Um, it was my father. And then eventually, when um, he came clean to us, um, that he was the cause of, uh, <clears throat> of Deb's death, um, I went um, three and a half to four years without speaking to him at all. Um, and then one day, my, my, uh, my three daughters wanted to go see him. And uh, so I was against them going to see him. And uh, Lori talked me into giving my blessings to them to see him. And then, uh, but I, I said, I'm absolutely not going. Um, the night before, I, I decided I didn't have to move there um, without me, so I went. And then, um, ironically, at one point, all of them got up and had to go to the bathroom and left myself there with my father. Um, so, after quite an extended period of silence, he started talking, and um, uh, then they came back. And at any rate, that started me starting to um, go see him again um, and speak to him. And uh, the man that um, that I knew prior to that, and the man that's um, there today, is um, a different individual um, in reference to empathy and. Um, just there's no arrogance there. There's there's none of that. Um, he's also a very sick man. Um, I don't expect him to actually probably live another couple of years. Um, he's at the point now to he can't walk from wherever his dormitory is to the to the uh, to go eat um, without taking two or three breaks or at times having to get um, in the wheelchair. <clears throat> Basically, it's hard to get him out. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know the, the, um, with the time frames he's given to eventually get out, but I know from a health perspective, he's, uh, he's definitely at the end of his life and certainly not a threat to anybody because he can't even barely, you know, perform the functions that he needs to do every day. Um, We're obviously on opposing it, but we're victims. I mean, my, you know, like Lori said, you know, I hear from, from my kids for um, just because I didn't want them to have that burden. Um, and obviously, my brother and I, um, you know, uh, lost the second mother um, and the father. Um, because I got to tell you, I, I had nothing to do with the man uh, for years. I mean, he would call the house. Um, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't answer the phone. I would take the calls. I wouldn't. My children and Lori spoke. Um, but uh, I do believe that um, hopefully he, um, it's an opportunity um, to uh, to be that. Um, if he does, um, from a uh, where he would stay, what have you, is uh, we have a. Um, a second house on our property um, where you know, he would stay. It was uh, before Lori's mother died. We had that for her, and that's where he would move in and um, live by us. And, uh, so that's it. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you. All right. Uh, now we have Ms. Um, Linda Roy. Ms. Linda, are you there? We'd like to hear from you now. Okay. I don't know what I want to say. Ma'am. Okay, well, I don't feel like Ryan deserves to be out. Don't feel like he wants to do. Don't like he feels like doing. He's free. He's going to himself. He's going to do what he wants to do. And not be brought back to the dead. He's going to ask me. 
Now, we should go ahead. Think you should be with that family as well as living. If there was cool for the tell me some things. One day we went for Thanksgiving and she told me some things about him and Annie had kind of turned against her. A little while later, it was in the tip of it. I got a call. I got home from work one day and I got a call from Mr. Johnny, his ex father in law. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Roy. We do appreciate your participation. And I see we have the district attorney's office has joined us. Would you like to make your statement? Mr. Clark? Yeah, yes, I, I don't think I could hear you earlier. Okay, we're ready for your statement. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman Brian Clark, on behalf of the 22nd Judicial District Attorney's Office. Uh, my office in this case is opposed to Mr. Ulfer's pardon. Uh, this all, uh, crime involves a particularly brutal murder of an individual with a history of domestic violence, especially against this particular victim. Very cold and callous nature of the case. Um, there also seems to be a very much of a uh, distinct lack of remorse on a part of Mr. Alpers, especially his characterization of how the murder itself happened, the victim simply falling into the water and him walking off. Given the nature of this offense, the nature of the crime, uh, Mr. Alpers' history, including with this victim, and a lack of remorse or taking responsibility for this offense, the state would oppose any pardon in this case. All right, um, Mr. Olfers, is there a brief statement you'd like to make to the board before we go? I'd like to thank the board for giving me the opportunity to come before you. On September 20th, 1996, it was the worst night of my life and something I re relive all the time. I could have never imagined doing something like I did. I wish I had the words to say, sorry, how, how, how sorry I am 
for my wife, Debbie, her sister, Lynn, her father, Raymond. My actions caused so much pain for so many people, not only Debbie's family and friends, but my family and friends. It's caused pain for people I don't even know. Words cannot express the sorrow and regret I have. I may not divert the opportunity to start over, but I'm asking this board to give me a chance. I have support from friends and family, <clears throat> the support of warden and staff, and my church group. I'm just asking this board to please give me the chance to start over. To do the things right. Thank yes, sir. You. Sir, thank you. I think uh, we are prepared to vote. Mrs. Jackson will vote first. Uh, Mr. Alfred, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right. Mr. Alfred, I acknowledge that you've done some really good things while you've been incarcerated. You've impacted the lives of other. Uh, inmates who have uh, been able to uh, transition to a better life than before. And I don't discount in any way the good things that you have done during the course of your incarceration. But for me, uh, 16 and a half years uh, for a really heartless crime is insufficient. And it's ironic that the man who was wrongfully convicted of killing your first wife spent 34 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. And you've only spent, you know, less than half of that for a crime that you did commit. And I just don't feel like the amount of time served in light of all of the circumstances of, of your case is sufficient um, to warrant uh, a commutation. Mr. Roche. Madam Chairman, my vote is the same for the same reason. Mr. Mirabella. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Ms. Alfers, uh, you have done a lot of good things while you've been in there, but uh, I agree with Judge Jackson. It's just insufficient amount of time. Uh, I think you need uh, a little more work. Uh, good luck to you. My vote likewise is to deny. Mr. Freeman? Uh, I concur with my colleague. My vote is to deny. All right, Mr. Alfers, you've received four votes to deny your application for clemency. So today, sorry, your application's been denied. Good luck. Thank you. I appreciate you, Tom.
I think we're ready for Mr. Knowles. They're getting him. Um, I think they had brought Hampton's people in, and um, so it was several people, so they went, got them back out. We'll, he'll, he'll be in in just a moment. Okay, thank you. And Warden Hooper is going to be here speaking on Noel's behalf. He's not in the room right now, but he's coming back. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Knowles. Good afternoon. Do you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and DOC number. My name is Paul Knowles, Jr., 96144. Okay. And uh, Mr. Knowles, you're here this afternoon. You're seeking a commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced in Jefferson Parish, the 24th Judicial District in November 1981 to a life sentence for a second degree murder conviction. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And let me acknowledge you have guests there with you. You have your sister, Miss Margaret Conrad. She'll be speaking on your behalf. And you also have your sister-in-law, Miss Angela Knowles. Yes, uh, yes. Joining us by Zoom, we have Mr. Andrew Hun Hunley with the Parole Project who will be speaking. And we also have here in opposition a representative from the DA's office in Jefferson Parish, and we'll hear from him at the appropriate time. Uh, Mr. Knowles, your case has been assigned to Mrs. Jackson. Would you answer her question? Good afternoon, Mr. Knowles. How are you today? Grateful to be here. Okay, all right. Well, let's kind of uh, get into why you're here, all right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, first of all, how old are you, Mr. Knowles? I'm I'm 64. I'll be 65 in December. And how long have you been incarcerated? 42 years. Okay. So you were 22, give or take, when this crime occurred. Is that right? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I would like for you to explain to us, Mr. Knowles, what happened. Um, how did you end up? Uh, killing Miss Lynn Marie and, and just walk us through what happened to him. Okay. Me and a friend of a friend of mine were going out to a club. We went to Frank's house to see if he wanted to go out with us. Um, when we got there, he was loaded, drunk. Um, he had liquor, pills, all kind of paraphernalia like this. I was gonna leave. When I tried to leave, the door was locked. I, so I couldn't get out of there. I told them I wanted to leave. I don't do drugs. I didn't do drugs or drink. Um, when I tried to leave, he told he kept telling me, no, no, stay, stay. And on this on the side of the hat on the side of the room, he entertained a lot of parties and there was cutlery there. He did a lot of pies and cakes, things of that nature, pastries. There was knives, big spoons, big forks. So um, can I, can I can I stop you for a minute, Mr. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma uh, when we get your case, we get all of the police reports and everything associated. Okay. With okay. Case. So we actually have the facts of the case before okay. us. Okay. Uh, we spent a lot of time looking at the case and looking at the facts of the case, and so. Generally, when I ask you to tell us what happened, it's not that I don't know uh, the circumstances, 
I want to know, is the offender going to be honest? Is he going to be forthcoming and own up and take responsibility yes, for what they've done? And what I have in front of me is uh, an excerpt from a police report that after you uh, were questioned by the detectives, you asked to call your parents in Florida. Remember that? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And after speaking to your parents, you became upset and you told the three officers, I killed him. I killed Frank em Emery. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Use the knife that you got from the kitchen and stab Mr. Emery more than once. Um, he said, you said Mr. Emery provoked the attack by talking about your sister. He said they argued, Mr. Emery slapped him, and then you killed Mr. Emery. That's what you said uh, at first. And then uh, there was some indications that Mr. Emery had some photographs on from a sailboat that were, um, let's just say, something that you didn't want disclosed. And because of that, uh, he was killed. Okay, let me explain something here. Some of that was in the in the in the uh, trial mm -hmm. of the photographs, but that had nothing to do with uh, nothing to do with him uh, at all, as far as killing. No, and the knife. I might have said that at that time, but it was there was cutlery there, and I might have said kitchen, but it was like uh, they kept you know you had parties and you had uh, forks and knives and all that to cut up with. That's where the knife came from. And it, that's, that usually is kept in a kitchen. Well, you could say it was a kitchen maybe. I don't think it, you know, I just say the cutlery on the side, that's all. I mean, it could have been a kitchen area. At the time when all this happened, ma'am, I wasn't I real. When you, I just kind of freaked out, and it had nothing to do with my sister. Um, they had, there was drugs there, um, and what set me off was he had a syringe of something in it, and I'm terrified of needles, and I he, I grabbed the knife only to stop him from coming at me. That's it. I didn't mean for anything to happen. Um, you don't, I did, I took his life, man. Yes, I did. I didn't go in there and mean to, I didn't, it wasn't intentionally, it just happened. I, oh, I so, so wish I, I hadn't, it, but it did happen. Um, there was no, the, the pictures and all that at that time had nothing to do with that. I was openly gay. Um, and that had nothing at all to do with that. Somehow that, I don't know where that came from. That, you know, that was in the trial, but not for that. Well, the only thing that I can, can say, uh, Mr. Knowles, is that I'm, I'm reading from the court, and the statement about your sister came from the interview that you initially gave the police. So that's where that came from. Mr. Emery was talking about your sister. They argued. He slapped you. Then he killed Mr. Emery. There was no mention of some effort on his part to inject you with drugs with the syringe. And the only thing I can go by what I have before. In the okay. What? You do acknowledge. You do acknowledge that you stabbed Mr. Emery to death. Yes, ma'am. And what did you do after you uh, stabbed him to death? I really don't. I we left. Um, it, it's it was something that's so bad. I I did. I take full responsibility for it. 
I'm just asking you a simple question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma um, How did he end up in the bathtub? Um, I remember vaguely how we pulled him in there. I don't even know why. I don't understand that myself. I've had a long time to think of that. I'm unsure of that. Um, when it happened, I was just caught. I was, nobody knows what they feel like if they take a life. And this did happen. I did take this life. I can't get, bring it back. And it takes something out of your person when this happens. I'm so sorry. I, and I, there's some, I don't have answers for some of the things because at that time, I, I just don't know, ma'am. Oh I'm so. All right. Um, so let's talk about the last 42 years, Mr. Knowles. Um, tell me some of the, the things that you've been involved in over the last 42 years. Um, okay, the first few years I was here, when I came here, lifers couldn't in, get in school. There was a number of things they couldn't do, okay? Um, and I tried. Well, what have you done? When you were able to, what have you done? I got my GED in 98. And before that, I have right here, I took, a, some I took CPR class, um, experience of God, um, CPR, got my high school diploma in 1998. Um, That's, listen to me, Mr. Yes, Nolan. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, CPR is great, but CPR doesn't right. impact you know, your thinking or, or who you are as a person or help you understand yourself or how you came to murder someone. I mean, I'm not interested so much in CPR or even your horticultural diploma or your print for your plumbing apprenticeship. Right. We're interested in you know what what has had the most impact on you as a human being from programs that you have taken during your incarceration. Anger management. My GED, um, those have helped me with a number of things. Let what? me ask you to live balance. Is that correct? Pardon me. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Why did you take living in balance? Uh, because people, the I when I took other classes or tried to get in, the people that I talked to, the the uh, teachers or whatever, they explained to me you can get in these classes and it'll help you. You know, it can't hurt you. And some of them really did help. I learned a lot of things that when I was young, I, I didn't know. You don't know how a person feels, how you, when you take a life, their families, their cousins, his brothers. Um, I didn't know I was young. Um, and then things happened in here I learned, and it's a terrible place to learn things. You're supposed to learn them, you know, when you're growing up. I quit school when I was 16 years old. I don't know why, I'm really not sure, but I did. One of the worst things I ever did in my life. Um, I ran with a crowd, we'll say, you know, a bad crowd, maybe, I don't know. But I chose these things myself. And it wasn't until later on when I took some of these classes and I talked to the people and I listened, that I understood I just was on a bad, on the wrong path. Sometimes you don't know, you're just having fun or having a good time or something like that and don't know until somebody shows you a better path. Um, and then you see, well, hey, you know, you didn't I didn't have to be in here all this time if I had followed this or followed that, but I didn't and I regret it so uh -huh. much. Stop talking, okay? Just stop talking for a minute, all right? Yes, ma'am. Um, sounds like you took victim awareness and you learned how your crime impacted other people. Yes, ma'am. A great deal. 
How did that change you? I see things that now, in altercations, let's say, not to do this or not to do that because of how it makes other people feel. The chain reaction that happens when I do something wrong in that in that manner, or any manner actually, but I learned the regard for others that I just really didn't know before. Whether it was stupidity, ignorance, I don't know. Um, I, to the in the depths of my heart, I learned things that that are probably common, maybe you know, in the in the regular world. But some people don't know that for whatever reason. I don't know. Um, and I learned to wait, check things out, to look at stuff through other people's eyes also, that you're not just don't you're not just hurting you, you're them, that one person or whatever. There's a whole line of other people, your family, their family. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, what's your current job at the prison? I work. I work as an orderly. And and how long have you done that? Almost a year. And what 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 have you done most of the time as far as the job in prison? Okay, most of the job. I've been a clerk most of the time. Many years I've worked here as a clerk. And uh, you also uh, have a horticulture diploma. Yes, have you used that as at the prison? Have I used it as a prison? Not really, not yet. What about the plumbing? Yes, yes. I was a clerk in the plumbing shop for eight years. And I learned, you know, I learned certain things. I was a clerk, but being a clerk, do you learn stuff, you know? You've had 13 write-ups in the last 42 years. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And the last one, I think, was in 1991? Yes, ma'am. Do you remember anything about those write-ups? Some of them. One I remember I got, a, a, which was kind of crazy, but I had a calculator, a solar calculator, and I was helping someone else. Since I couldn't go do GED, I was helping some other people. And I got wrote up for it, for having a calculator, a solar calculator. I didn't know that you couldn't have that. Other people had calculators, but I had a solar calculator. Um, the, when I first came in here, for those first few years, I was just kind of, I guess angry was the word, you know? Um, very mad at myself, very, very in denial. And then one day I just, I said, man, this is not it. I got to stop this. And uh, experiencing God and Kairos, and I went to Kairos, changed, really changed my world. It changed my life. And um, I thought these write ups are stupid. One write up, they had a sex offense write up. I mean, a dude were playing around, but I was trying to kiss him. Wasn't his fault. Yeah. And this, this, I, I was only asking about the ones from 1991. Oh, 91. Okay, okay. Um, okay. It was a and it was a rule three on one occasion and rule twenty eight on the other. But we'll we'll move on from that. You have a low risk assessment. Your institutional record is good. You've been described as a model offender. So let's talk about your transition plan. If you were to be successful uh, at some point, uh, tell us. What you plan to do? Where do you plan to live? Where do you plan to work? How do you plan to support yourself? Okay. Um, I plan to, when I leave here, I'll go to the transition uh, house with Andrew uh, Hunley. And from there, you know, get everything I need there and learn from him and everything. Then I'll go to live with my sister in Suwannee, Georgia. Uh, I'll be an assistant to her. Putting, she's transitioning to a new job and to a new job and all that, and putting her computer and all that, getting all that together. Um, during that time, also, I will also want, I also want to do some horticulture work also there. Um, that's where I'll live in Georgia, and 
I want to do what I can. I want to, I didn't, I want to live a life, a good life. I want to honor if this board gives me a favorable outcome, I want to honor that every day of my life. I will do good. I won't, I won't let anybody down. Uh, you do have some opposition, uh, Mr. Knowles, the sitting judge, not the one that was the judge when the crime occurred. Also, the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office, the Kenner Police Department, and the Jefferson Parish DA's Office. And our victim um, coordinator reached out to attempt to find survivors of the victim and were unsuccessful in doing that. Or well, is there anything you can tell us about Mr. Noll? Anything you'd like to add? Yes, uh, like you said before, he has a low risk factor. Uh, he does personally work for me currently. Um, he does have some medical issues that he sees the doctor on a regular basis for, which are you know common for his age. Um, he's done all his programs. He's taken the 100 hours, you know, and he is going to relocate to Georgia with his sister. I think she's retired military. All right, thank you, Mr. Knox, and that's all. I don't see any other questions here, so we'll hear first from support, Mr. Hunley. Uh, Andrew Hunley with Louisiana Parole Project, appearing before the board to inform you that if Paul is granted a release in the near future, uh, he would be a, a client of our reentry program. Um, Paul was an easy client for us to accept uh, based on over 40 years of incarceration. Uh, over 30 years without a disciplinary report. He's been a class A trustee uh, for the vast majority of his incarceration and has completed uh, numerous self-help programs in addition to a, a horticulture vocational degree. Uh, he also has obviously, as you've heard, a, a very highly trusted job uh, at, at the prison working for Warden Hooper. Uh, if he is released, he'll come into our reentry program where we'll, we'll work with him with his initial transition. Uh, we'll ensure he receives a substance abuse and mental health assessment uh, and that he complies with all recommendations that our staff social worker give. Uh, we'll work with him on technology, financial management, and uh, working in, in getting accustomed to modern day social norms. And then at whatever time we felt comfortable uh, with his reintegration, we'd move him from phase one to our program uh, to live with his sister in Georgia, but he'd continue to receive case management services from us and we would work to ensure that he has the support he needs in Georgia to continue to be successful. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And next, Ms. Margaret Conrad. Yes, ma'am. And- for him. Uh, you stay where you're at. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can see, keep your seat. Oh, sit down. Okay. Okay. And also, I want to say that I have an ear issue right now. I have fluid, so I can't hear as well as I normally do. But believe me, it's getting better. <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, I'm ready. Just tell them. Go ahead. Oh, tell whatever I want to say. Okay. First of all, um, can, and I don't know how much you want me to tell you, but I'll about just tell minutes. you. Pardon? About three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. First of all, um, I know him. I wasn't here when it all happened. I was overseas, military, da 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 da. So I had no idea of all of the stuff that was playing out until I got back to the United States, and I it was just crazy. So anyway, all I can say is I know him. I have we talk. We've been. If there was ever a light in a dark place. This is the person he has gone. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, as well as brothers and sisters in life. OK, so and I'm telling you this because, uh, well, I'm, let me just keep going. So anyway, he has not only helped people here in the prison that nobody even has a clue. OK, in so many ways, because he goes outside of these boundaries. And the way I say that is because and I'm going to give you a quick example. We uh, my daughter. Short, short. Okay, had migraines, migraines, really bad. Da, 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 da. 
somebody in here in the prison thought that he was being punished because he was having these migraines and nobody could help him. Da, 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 da. My daughter sent him information about migraines. He went to this inmate and said, this is normal. This is what's happening. It sues the person. I could tell you story after story. Katrina. Okay, with, okay is that it? Or it's quick. Oh, well, that, would you stop talking to me? Anyway, all I can tell you is I cannot believe this is my sister-in-law who is... <laughs> Yeah, but anyway, I could tell you story after story. He's been here 42 years. It has been amazing, an amazing journey and the most incredible journey on the planet, as far as I'm concerned. So do you support him going home? Yes, yes. Okay. definitely that's... support him going home. Right. I come can't stay with you. And that's okay. it. He's coming to stay with me, and I can't wait because okay. he knows how to okay. do Excel and all these things that I don't. Okay. okay. So. Well, thank you, ma'am. I appreciate your enthusiasm. Uh, all right, we'll hear from the DA's office now, Mr. Meyer. Good afternoon, Randy Meyer, Assistant DA Jefferson Parish, and um, we're opposed to Mr. Knowles' request for commentation of his sentence. Um, in looking at what happened, the facts of this particular case, and what he's saying now, I don't believe he's being totally honest with the board, and that concerns me greatly uh, with him getting a commutation of sentence. Um, the, the facts is set forth at the time of the offense, only Mr. Knowles was in the house. The victim threatened him, uh, the pictures and, and uh, threatened his sister. They had an argument and the victim slapped him, at which time Mr. Knowles uh, grabbed a knife from the kitchen and stabbed him numerous times. Um, police found blood on the kitchen sink and on the kitchen refrigerator. And the kitchen sink blood matched Mr. Knowles uh, blood type. Uh, in his pardon application, it, it, it seems to me like, uh, you know, he, he's, he's trying to put this in a much different light, you know, almost to the, to the point of being more of a self-defense type situation that Mr. Knowles was coming at him with a syringe and he took a knife from the side of the table and stabbed him. And, and he said his co-defendant jumped on him, on, on the victim, grabbed the knife and jumped on the victim's back as well. Um, but originally, at the time of the offense, he was the only person in the house that the, the co-defendant had left uh, and came back and picked him up after the crime had been committed. Um, so I, it, it appears to me he's not being honest with us as to the facts of what happened. Uh, and uh, I think he, the, some of the programs that he's had, rehabilitative programs he's had are, are very limited. So for those reasons, we're opposed to his request today. All right, thank you, sir. <clears throat> so Mr. Knowles, there you are. Uh, is there a brief statement you'd like to make to us before we vote? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have no reason to lie. Some Maybe something I, is not remembered right, but I have no reason to lie. I've been here 42 years, and this is my only, I'm hoping to get to leave here. I have no reason to lie, none. If something is amiss that I didn't say something right or whatever, but I have no reason to lie, none whatsoever. I take full responsibility of, take, of taking Frank Emery's life. I murdered him. I am so sorry for that, but I have no reason to lie to you, none. At that time, half the stuff, I don't know what I said because I was so out of it, so terrified. Nobody knows what they will say or how they'll feel or how they'll be if they take a life. I please, I just ask for mercy. All right, thank you, sir. I think we are prepared for that, Mrs. Jackson. Uh, Mr. Knowles, I really do wish you had been a little bit more forthcoming. Um, the statement, um, but that's just one factor. Do you acknowledge that you took Mr. Knowles' life? Uh, you were only uh, 22 when this crime occurred. You are a first offender. Uh, you have a low risk score. You already have, have only had 13 write-ups. Uh, in the whole time you've been there, and the last one was over 30 
years ago. Uh, you have a good institutional record and you described by your supervisor as being a model offender. You have a good uh, transition plan and family support. And so uh, my vote today would be to recommend a commutation sentence of 50 years to immediate parole eligible. Thank you, Mr. Rushing. <clears throat> Mr. Knowles, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, based on the length of your incarceration, positive remarks from Martin the Grouper, and basically your transition plan out of state, I'm going to vote. To commute this sentence to 50 years. Mr. Mirabella? My vote is the same, uh, Madam Chairman, for the same reasons. So, Judge Jackson. Mr. Freeman. I concur with both of my colleagues, all three of my colleagues. All right. And uh, I also concur. So, you've received a unanimous vote, Mr. Knowles, to make the recommendation to your sentence be commuted to 50 years with immediate parole eligibility. Good luck to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, um, Mr. Hampton, 
Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you all. Would you introduce yourself, tell us your name and your DOC number, please? Jerry Lee Hampton, 74972. Okay, and you are represented by council. Council, would you introduce yourself? Good afternoon, Ms. Renata. Jane Hogan here on behalf of Jerry Hampton. I'll make a statement at the end with the committee's approval. And thank you. Um, Mr. Hampton, you're here um, today. You're seeking a commutation of your sentence. Uh, you have convictions in Rapides and Orleans Parish. Now, let's see. You have first, it was a manslaughter in April 1973. Um, you received a 16 year sentence. We have in August 1993. Uh, I believe in Rapid, second degree murder, you received a life sentence. And then in uh, 1984, there was a simple escape, uh, which you received a two year consecutive sentence. Does all that sound correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, let me acknowledge the folks who have joined us today in support. We have the Parole Project. Um, Mr. Hunley will be speaking in support. Uh, Mr. Hampton's sister, Ms. Viola Hampton, will be speaking in support. And we also have joining us uh, there at uh, the penitentiary, Ms. Yvonne Hampton, your wife, and Byron Hampton, your nephew. Uh, here to speak in opposition, we have a representative from the DA's office, um, Derek Johnson, and we'll call uh, on Mr. Johnson at the appropriate time as well. Your case this afternoon, uh, Mr. Hampton has been assigned to Mr. Mayor Bella. Would you answer his questions? Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Mr. Hampton. My name is, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Hampton. My name is Tony Mayor Bella. How are you today, sir? I'm doing fine, sir. Mr. Hampton, how old are you, sir? I'm, I'm uh, 69. Okay. And how long have you been in prison on these charges? 40 years. 40 years? Yes, sir. Mr. Hampton, I've, I've reviewed your record. Uh, it looks like you've done a lot of things while you've been in prison. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you for a change, victim awareness, uh, 100 hours of pre-release. You're currently enrolled in GED, is that right? Yes, sir. I graduated from literature, so they moved me up to GED. And uh, Malachi Dads, uh, Cage your age, uh, you're a Class A trustee. You, you, you've done extremely well while you've been in prison. Uh, I, I, I'm going to be real honest with you. I've got some real problems with your crimes. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what happened in 1973 in New Orleans. Uh, yeah, so tell me what happened there. Me and my wife, we was we were separating. I wanted to go back home to the country. She wanted to stay in New Orleans. And I wanted to take the kid with me. She told me I could. When I went to now, get now let, me, let me ask you this, because I didn't really understand it from the record. Uh, was uh, Kiva your daughter as My well? Daughter. OK, all right, go ahead. Sorry. So when I went to get the baby, and I, she opened the door, let me in. And when she let me in, she attacked me with a knife. We wrestled over the night, we fell on the bed, the baby got stabbed. And uh, and you actually went to trial or did you plead guilty to manslaughter? I pleaded guilty to it. And you worked out a deal where you went to jail for 16 years. That's up because did I was you wrong. Out on, I'm sorry. I was wrong. I shouldn't have done, I shouldn't have even went there. Because after proper authority, I should have never went there. So that I was wrong for that. Now, and how much time did you serve while you were in prison? Six years, six months, and 22 days. Did you take any kind of programs there? Did you do any kind of rehabilitation or anything else while you were there? No, sir. I didn't. I couldn't. Because I didn't, I didn't, I stayed until 74, and then I did cemetery at CIS, so I went to cooking school down there. And that's where I started getting the certificate and stuff like that. Now, uh, were drugs or alcohol involved at all in, in this first incident, 1973? No, sir. Have you ever done drugs in the past? No, sir. Alcohol, do you ever drink? I drink. So the 1973 
incident that had nothing to do with drugs or alcohol. You went there, your wife attacked you, and you ended up killing your baby. Yes, sir. Now you got out of prison. What did you do when you first got out of prison? I went, I got a job working at Delta Dex, sheet metal mechanic. I was a sheet metal mechanic for Delta Dex. I left Delta Dex and I went to Regency Motors. I did automotive work. Drugs or alcohol at that time at all? No, sir. Tell me a little bit about the bad blood between you and the King family, or your family and the King family. Tell me a little bit about that. They was having a dispute. My dad was involved. I intervened. I shouldn't have. I know I was wrong for that. That's why I'm shooting James. Shut James and kill him. Mr. Mr. Hampton, tell me how that happened. You say you wound up shooting him. Uh, did you go look for him? Did you find him? Uh, what happened? How did that happen? I didn't look for him. Well, did you have a weapon with you? Yes, I did. What were you doing with a weapon? I don't know. I was on parole. I shouldn't have even had a weapon. Weren't you prohibited from carrying a weapon on parole, having a weapon on parole? Okay, so go ahead. And that's part of my problem. Go ahead. Tell me what happened. I found out shooting James and killing him. Well, wh where did you find James? How did you and James get to the point where you ended up shooting him? We was there. We was there already. We was on the spot right there. there. Where were you? We was, in, uh, we was in our chicken shack. It's a restaurant. All right. Okay. So you saw him in there? Yeah, so he was there. And you were carrying a weapon? Yes, sir, he was. How long had you been carrying that weapon? Not long. I just had it that particular night. And why did you have it that particular night? Because someone had shot in my car and almost killed my daughter because she was sitting on the armrest. And so and when was that? That was that was during the that would happen that Thursday. And I wind up killing James that Friday. Okay, so where did you get the gun from? <clears throat> My brother-in-law. And so how did you end up at the chicken shack where James was? I had paid for some food there earlier and I was coming back to get it. And when I came back to get it, James happened to be there. Okay, so tell me how it happened. How it happened that you shot him and killed him? When he drew his gun, I drew mine, so we started shooting. Did you go to trial or did you plead guilty? I went to trial. And the, I assume your defense was self-defense? No, sir. What was your defense? Well, as you know, Louisiana don't care this uh, self-defense law here in the state. So we just went to trial. I don't understand when you say Louisiana doesn't carry self-defense. Certainly it's a, it's a defense to defend yourself. I didn't know that. <laughs> Jury found you guilty of second degree murder? Yes, it did. Was there ever a weapon found on uh, James? No, sir. Did he ever have a gun? I mean, there was no weapon found. He did. His sister took Nobody it. found one. His sister took it. You know, Mr. Mr. Hampton, I, I, I think I can understand, don't agree with it, obviously, but I can understand how that first crime might have happened. And it sounds like a judge uh, in a DA was, was sympathetic with what happened. And, and agreed to a 16 year sentence on a manslaughter charge. You get out. Then you go and you kill somebody again. You arm yourself with the weapon, you know you're a convicted felon, and you go in there and you kill someone, someone you had bad blood with. You see my problem? Yes, I do. 
Now, tell me a little bit about this escape that you had a couple of years after you got arrested for that murder. Well, I was in, I was, we was on the dock. We was on, out on the dock. And then a girl came in and we tried to leave and go have sex in the bathroom. That's what it, that was about. They charged me with, this, with escape. Like I left the parish. I didn't leave the parish. Went in the elevator. And you pled guilty to simple escape and you got two years. Tell me what you think are some of the more important. You had indicated in your, your documentation that uh, victim awareness was the most important program that you had taken while you've been in prison. Tell me why that is. Because victim awareness is a class. It teaches you to understand what exactly all the people that you hurt. This thing, I hurt a lot of people, you know, and for that, I apologize for that especially to the King family. I didn't know the impact of what this thing had done to, the, to my community. M M Mr. Hampton, yeah. let me back, back up a little bit. You killed your own daughter. You didn't understand what it's like to lose a loved one to violence? Yes, I do. But I didn't understand all of this until I you see these these classes I took. This made me understand. I'm not that same person 40 years ago when I walked in here. They changed me. I don't know what it is, but they changed me. I'm not the same. Well, I, I need you to try to tell me what it is that's changed you, because you're asking me to vote to I, to recommend to the governor that he commute your sentence. I need to know specific, I, not the pieces of paper. I need to know. What has changed you? What has gotten into your heart that makes you a different person today? That I can be feel comfortable that you won't go out and commit a third killing. Because what I've learned, all the all the opportunity I've been given here, taught me to be the man I am today. I I can think rather than react. I can always take time to think, you know, and I'm gonna make, I can make good choices now. I, at first I couldn't because I didn't have the opportunity that I have today. Well, tell me some things other than victim awareness. Tell me some of the other classes that have helped you. I mean, I you took Malachi dads, you took a hundred hours of pre-release, thank him for a change. What did those, what specifically did those things do for you to make you realize that you a changed person? Thank you for a change. I know I can stop and think, and that's the best weapon I can use. If I stop and think about it, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to make good choices rather than bad choices. Because everything that I do in life, I know I need to stop and think, think about where I'm going because there's consequences and everything. So think of a change is one of my things. You're a class A trustee. How long have you been a trustee? About, I think about 20 years. You lost it in 2005. I lost it a while and I got it back in 21 okay. days. Lost it for a short period of time and you got it back. Uh, you worked on the carpentry crew for 15 years, is that right? Yes, sir. And you were allowed to leave prison to go work in different places around around the parish or the state, is that right? Yes, sir. I did BOK uh, headquarters in Baton Rouge. And you worked work. on some schools as well, as I understand it? Yes, sir. Uh, you've had 22 write-ups uh, in the last 40 years in prison. The last one was in 2005. Uh, you got a good disciplinary record. You got a low tiger. Uh, law enforcement, obviously, is opposed to your release. Uh, the victim's family, two members of the victim's family support your release. 
I believe you've served uh, uh, enough time. Uh, Lionel King and Ms. Linda Harvey uh, support you. Uh, you were denied in 2015. What was the reason you were denied in 2015 when you came before this board? You remember? I don't believe I was ready until I got what I got today. I finished those classes and stuff. I think I'm ready now. I wasn't ready back then. I got what I need. Mr. Hampton, do you understand my concern that yeah. that you have killed two different people. I mean, to me, you know, when I read when I read your file, I said, "Oh my goodness, this man killed his daughter." And then I read, "You got only six years on a man, sixteen years on a manslaughter charge." I was a judge. I realized that there must have been some mitigation there, mm -hmm. but I also realized, as a father, how devastating that must have been for you and your family to have killed your daughter. And then you get out of prison and you go back and you kill someone else. Do, do you see, can you tell me why I should feel comfortable voting to recommend that the governor commute your sentence? Yeah, sir, so because when I came here the first time, we, we did, I, could, I didn't have the opportunity to get an education. I couldn't read, I couldn't write. So I left like I came in here. Today, I have all that. I can read and write and I can do math, I can do basically anything that no one else can do. I put, I tied myself to learn this because I don't want to leave here like I came here. So with all the stuff that I gathered, it made me the person I am. I'm a better person than what I was 40 years ago. Tell me a little bit about your family support. Who have you got supporting you on the outside? I have my wife and my son, Byron. My, uh, uh, I call him my son, but he's my nephew. And I have a uh, parole project. One, can you tell us anything about Mr. Hampton? Anything else about Mr. Hampton? Only thing to add that he is re, uh, in remission for prostate cancer. Uh, like I said, he is 69 years old. He does have a good conduct record. His last report was in 2005, and he is a low risk. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Mr. Hampton, you got in a, a fight with his brother, and then you shot. Yang? Yes, sir. Right. So, I mean, you, did you go there looking for the, uh, the brother and ended up running into Jane? I said the brother came looking for me. Okay, and, and you shot James in the back, correct? No. They said that you shot him in the back twice. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, uh, how many children do you have? I got two. Do you still have a relationship with both of them? Yes, sir, I am. Okay, thank you. Mr. Roche. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Hampton, let's go back to your manslaughter conviction. At the time, you said that you and your wife was arguing and tussling overnight. Is that right? Yes, sir. And you, and you fell on the bed and you accidentally stabbed your dog. Yes, sir. Okay. Reading the report, your daughter was stabbed in her right eye and the stomach area. Your wife was stabbed in her left breast, her back, and, a, and she had stab wounds in her head. Did you, did you get stabbed at any time during that altercation? Yes, sir. Where did you get stabbed? She cut my throat. Okay. 
but it, your daughter was stabbed twice. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And your wife was stabbed a total of three times. If you don't know, I don't know. Well, the report, the report said that you were stabbed in her left breast, her back, in the back of her head. I just wanted to know, basically, what was going on that you got stabbed, your wife got stabbed three times, and your daughter was stabbed fairly twice. We was fighting. I was fighting, trying to get the knife from him. I, I know. I know the baby got stabbed once. I'm not. A, I'm not aware that the baby was stabbed more than one time. Once the baby was stabbed once. After I got stabbed, I left out the house. I sat on the front step to wait for the cops, the police to come. I don't know what went on from that point on. I woke up at charity, and from there I went to the parish. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, um, Mr. Hundley, can we hear from the Parole Project? Thank you, Andrew Hundley, Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, appearing before the board today to inform you that if, if Mr. Hampton uh, is given early release in the near future, our organization is committed to provide reentry support for him uh, based on his age, based on the amount of time that he's served. Uh, based on the jobs that he's had in the institution, based on his disciplinary record, we, we feel confident that if he's given this opportunity um, for, the, for the rest of the years he has left, that he can be a law-abiding citizen with our support. Uh, we feel like he would have a, uh, <clears throat> a good transition back into the community with his family. Um, if, if he is given that opportunity, he will receive all the support that all of our clients receive. He'll have access to our staff social worker and he'll receive uh, reentry support for a minimum of one year from one of our case managers. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then we have Ms. Viola Hampton. Your, your microphone's on mute. Uh, go. Good afternoon to the board. I'm Jerry's sister. And I love my brother. He always had my support. I'm here for him. And I also have Lionel my King. friend, Mr. King. He didn't get here in time to register. We live in a small community here in Alexander. And we always, Miss Harvey, this is Lionel, we always been friends. You know, we never lost friendship. Never. And I love my brother. He got my support. For 40 years, I go to Angola rodeos, visit, and everything. But like I say, he made me strong. He's not the same person. So when I'm down and out, he calls me, and I feel better. But uh, that's all I got to say. I love my brother. And yes, he got me. my support. Mr. King, was there anything you wanted to say? Yeah, I, I thank you. I think everybody needs a second chance. So please just let him go. God forgives. All right. Uh, at this time, we'll hear from the opposition from the DA's office. Lay on the line. Yes. Good afternoon. How, how are y'all doing? Go ahead, sir. Yeah, my name is Derek Johnson. I'm one of assistant district attorneys at Rep East Parish District Attorney's Office. We're still uh, strongly opposed to uh, any um, kind of commission of sins for Mr. Uh, for Mr. Jerry. Um, we believe Mr. Jerry, um, you know, he had a chance. I mean, given the facts of stating today, he had a chance when he first was convicted of uh, manslaughter and he got out and, and did the same thing again. I mean, two lives were taken. Um, two lives that, that, needed, that didn't need to be taken because of, um, mistakes that he made in his life and we don't believe that it'll be right for him to be released today oh, no. thank you mr johnson all right mr hampton before we turn it over to miss hogan is there something you'd like to say to us thank you all for giving me the opportunity to appear before you all and i 
And the first thing I would like to say, I would like to, I would like to apologize to the King family, as well as the community, and as well as uh, law enforcement. Okay, thank you, sir. Ms. Hogan. Thank you, Mr. Natsa. Um, acknowledging that there are two very serious convictions in this case, nonetheless, Jerry Hampton is an ideal person to give an opportunity for release to. Um, there's a lot of things that Mr. Hampton does that he doesn't get certificates for. He is a man of few words. So if he was not able to tell you all the things that he does, um, there, there is plenty to tell. Um, in addition to the programs that were that were mentioned, Mr. Hampton learned how to read um, and graduated from literacy school just last year. He's working on obtaining his GED, which he could continue to make to work towards if he's granted release to the parole project. Um, Mr. Hampton also has a carpentry. He's able to build a house from uh, start to finish. He can frame. He can drywall. He can. He can do anything. He um, he has a there's a certificate in his record from uh, on the job training, 12 years of carpentry work. Um, he, Mr. Hampton isn't just in remission for cancer. He also had a heart attack in 2017, which brought him into the hospital for a week. And after that heart attack, he was given a no duty status. So if Mr. Hampton didn't want to work or didn't want to do anything to better his prison community, he doesn't have to. But nonetheless, he works as an orderly. He mentors to people. He's very active in his church. Um, if, if, if somebody is needed to help pour cement, Mr. Hampton goes out and volunteers. He, um, whenever the ACA comes to inspect the hobby shop at Camp F, Mr. Hampton kicks everybody out and cleans the entire hobby shop by himself uh, because these are things that he loves to do. He takes pride in his work. He makes absolutely stunning woodwork. There are some examples of which that I have attached to my brief. There's like, um, he makes things out of wood. He makes things out of stainless steel. And he is frequently donating the proceeds or he, he donates he donates hobby crafts to, uh, to charitable organizations. Um, if Mr. For all of these reasons, Mr. Hampton's not the person that he was when he walked into prison 40 years ago. And I, I recognize that there are it's not just one conviction, it's it's the prior one as well. But if this board's looking at the rehabilitation that Mr. Hampton has exhibited over the past 40 years, the likelihood of his success on release, which is high given his low risk of recidivism score. And the fact that when, like Jerry said for himself, whenever he went to prison the first time and came out, he was exactly the same as when he went in. He was um, uneducated, unable to read, unable to better himself. And now he has all those tools that he lacked when he first came to prison. Um, he has the full support of the parole project. His wife is here as well. Uh, they've known each other their entire lives. They were married and uh, reconnected in 2013. He has the, after this, the parole project, he has a transition plan that would not bring him back to Rapides Parish. He would live with his wife in Baton Rouge. Um, and given all of this, and also given the support of, of, the, of Mr. King, we would ask this board to commute Jerry Hampton's sentence to a term of years. All right, thank you, ma'am. All right, you. uh, here to vote, Mr. Marabella. Mr. Hampton, uh, as I stated uh, at the beginning of, of my questioning of you, you've got an excellent prison record, You've done very well. Uh, so. Right. I, I, I read and I saw all of the things that you've accomplished, all of the work that you do, all of the things that uh, you've accomplished while you're there. Uh, again, my concern is, is your crimes. I often say, you know, that's just one factor that we factor in. We look at everything else. Uh, but in looking at your crimes, again, uh, uh, I would point out that the manslaughter charge, apparently the DA and the judge uh, realized that there was some mitigation there. Why you were able to get a 16-year-old sentence, 16 year sentence on a manslaughter charge is why we were not you were allowed to plead to that charge, I guess. Uh, 
separately, both of these cases are sort of understandable, I guess. Uh, but together, they, they really do cause a bit of a problem to me. But on the second one, the one that uh, went to prison, you went to trial for and were convicted of, you've done 40 years. And uh, you've done well while you've been in prison. <laughs> Based upon the, the work that you've done, based upon uh, uh, your prison record, very good uh, disciplinary record, things that you've accomplished, I'm willing to take a chance on uh, My vote is going to be to recommend to the governor. Uh, you're 69 years of age. You've been in prison for 40 years. My recommendation is that uh, your sentence be commuted to, uh, nine, to uh, 80 years. So good luck to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, um, it's like Judge Maribel said, you know, it's not a one offense, it's two offenses, both very violent offenses. Uh, you know, one took the life of your daughter. Uh, so that's two two separate lives, three separate lives you've taken, and my vote today is to deny. Uh, Mrs. Jackson. All right. Uh, Mr. Hampton, um, my vote would be to uh, grant a commutation. You have done uh, really well. Thank and you. I understand the situation where you went into prison the first time and you didn't have the opportunity to take advantage of things to better you. And you've had that over the last 42 years. Uh, you've done well with your uh, incarceration. And in my vote today would be to uh, grant with a recommendation of commutation to Amy Mr. Rich. Madam Chair, Madam Chair Mr. Mr. Hampton, my vote is uh, based upon the age of the offender and the length of incarceration. And my vote is to commuted sentence to 80 years. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Hampton, uh, based on the remarks by Mr. Lionel King, my vote today is also to recommend the commutation to 80 years. Um, so you've received four votes to commute your sentence, recommend that your sentence be commuted to 80 years. We'll make that recommendation on the back. Good luck to you, sir. Yes, Thank sir. You. Thank you, ma'am.
Good afternoon, Mr. Williams. Will you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and your DOC number, please. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. My name is Lester Williams. My DOC number is 493591. Yes, sir. And uh, Council, would you introduce yourself, please? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Eddie Jordan, and I represent Mr. Williams. Hey, and my, bar, you... my, my Louisiana bar number is 01450. Sir, and um, generally, Council will uh, close out at the end for us. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Williams. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to get my last. And by See, the way, we, uh, we have one witness as well. Sir, St. Andrews? That's correct. Jonathan St. Andrews, yes. I was just fixing to uh, acknowledge his presence, and we'll call on him at the appropriate time. And that is uh, Mr. Williams' son. That's correct. Um, so, Mr. Williams, you're here this afternoon. You're seeking the commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced in the 16th Judicial District, Iberia Parish, in March of 2009. You received a life sentence for a second degree murder. Is that information correct? That is correct, ma'am. All right. Mr. Williams, your case this afternoon has been assigned to Mrs. Jackson. Would you answer her questions? Good afternoon, Mr. Williams. How are you doing? Good afternoon, ma'am, and I'm a little nervous, but I'm all right. It's understandable. That's understandable. Um, so we'll just get um, to some small things. How old are you? I'm 71 years old, ma'am. And how long have you been incarcerated on this charge? 18 years, ma'am. And tell us... Uh, a little bit about yourself back uh, 18 years ago. Uh, what kind of work were you doing? Uh, what was your background? Yes, ma'am. I had recently, re recently retired as <clears throat> a teacher in the, in the Cattle Parish school system. Uh, mm -hmm. at, at the time, I was not employed. Um, my wife and I were just basically enjoying life. Uh, I'd like to say first that uh, one of my primary reasons for being here is to identify the fact and declare that I am responsible for my wife's life on February 20th, 2006. Uh, hey, Alice. I what she did to to cause her death she died uh because of uh manual strang strangulation ma'am excuse me because you know your story has kind of shifted several times you know your story has sort of shifted several times you know from what you initially told the police so what you put in your application, so what you put in uh, your statement when they did the pre-parole uh, or the pre-clemency investigation, it's kind of changed. You know, when I read your clemency application, one of the things that struck me is that basically you just stated some details about her injuries but you never indicated how she got those injuries. You never indicated what you did. Uh, at one point, you said that she had been vomiting all day and you were trying to get out of the bed and you just tried to throw her back in the bed and she hit her uh, self, you know, hit on the side of the bed and that's how she got injured. And now you're acknowledging that you strangled her to death. So why so many different stories? Oh, uh, ma'am. <clears throat> uh, basically, uh, what happened, uh, uh, I've narrated this thing down to four sequence of things that happened. We began by having a nice evening, just talking, having fun. Then 
Secondly, basically, we had a uh, an argument that was prompted by me. I shouldn't have not said anything to her. Then she got ill. She began to get in, she began to uh, vomit very bad. Uh, a couple hours after that was followed by myself. And throughout that process, I tried to assist her, taking her back and forth to the restroom. She not, did not want to, and I did not want to go to the hospital. Uh, and it, later on, we were visited by my mom. Uh, they refused, they didn't want to let me go and wake her up. And uh, she, like I said, she had several falls back in, uh, she fell probably four to six times. The last few times were very, very hard. And the last time I picked up, I laid on the bed. She laid on the bed after my mom and them left. I laid with her and I was still throwing up. Later on that evening, the last thing I did, I got up and I asked, I said, Sin, how about let's get up and go try and take a walk. Maybe we'll feel better. She did not respond. And I asked again, she did not respond. And then uh, I was still sick. And so the next thing I knew, I was uh, being read, I, I think it was the next morning, by the police officer told me that I was being charged with my wife's murder. The last thing I spoke to my wife, I didn't know she was injured or anything. Oh, Miss Williams, you just got telling me she died from manual strangulation. That means somebody put their hands or something around her neck and compressed her neck until she died. I was using, yes, I did use my hand to, to help her. Yes, ma'am. And that's, if that's what you want to tell us today, I'll let you tell us that. Now, yeah. You had a drinking problem, correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma In fact, you were convicted three times of driving while intoxicated. Is that correct? That is, that is correct. Yes, ma'am. Right. And you also have a history of domestic violence. Is yes, that correct? All right. Uh, in uh, two, me, in two, and on January 15th of 2002, you pled guilty to three counts of simple battery, and that did not involve, uh, it was involved a woman, but it did not involve uh, your wife. Remember that? You pled guilty to three counts of simple battery. You got probation. You were told that you couldn't go back to bars. You couldn't drink alcohol. You had to come anger management and you were not to have um, contact with the victim. Remember that? Yes, ma'am. I don't remember the, the events, you know, in sequence. Uh, I will admit that I've always suffered. I didn't admit before, but I do admit that I've always suffered from an anger problem. And uh, who, who, yes. was the, who was the victim in in the case where you have the three counts of simple battery. Okay. Why you gotta look at the paper? You don't know who you... I just don't remember exactly what time. There were so many events that I, uh, you know, I acted I'm, rationally. I'm talking. How many different women have you been um, convicted of domestic battery? Well, I had problems in my first marriage. My second wife. What was her name? Uh, my, my first marriage? Mm -hmm. Oh, you asked about my first marriage, ma'am? What's her name? Desi Williams. Okay. And did you have some domestic violence charges involving Miss Williams? Yes, ma'am, I did. Okay. And, uh, and was the victim who was murdered? Is she your second wife? Yes, ma'am. Right. Okay. Sent me. Sent okay. Me. Now, this is Emmy. Um, in March of 2004, you had an aggravated assault conviction and you were ordered to com complete domestic violence program. Is that correct? Uh, yes, ma'am. Did you complete the domestic violence program? Yes, ma'am. But then in March, March 14th of 2005, 
You got a second degree battery, which was a felony. You pled guilty to it. You were ordered to have no contact with the victim. That was on March 14th, 2005. You remember that? Uh, yes, ma'am. That involved my wife. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then on December 16th, 2005, you were arrested for domestic abuse battery. And again, you were ordered to have no contact with the victim. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And then uh, two months later, you were arrested for your wife's murder on February 20th of 06. So they had an arrest in December of 05. And then in February of 06 is when you were arrested for your wife's murder. Is that yes, correct? Ma that's, yes, ma'am. That's correct. And according to the autopsy, she was strangled to death. Is that yes, correct? Yes, ma'am. Right. Now, I do see, Mr. Uh, Williams, in the 17 years you've been, almost 18 years you've been incarcerated, you haven't had any write-ups, which is a good thing. Um, you are a men B uh, trustee. I see that you've taken living in balance, substance abuse. Um, I'm not seeing a whole lot of programs, but you have Thinking for a Change and AA. So tell me uh, what you've learned from your substance abuse classes about your, your drinking. Yes, ma'am. Number one, uh, at first I knew I had a problem, but I would not, I refused to admit it. But now I do, I was in denial and uh, I'm no longer in denial. I'm, I am in recovery, in recovery. And uh, I, I, I have not had a drink since February the 20th, 2006. I was abstained from alcohol use and the use of any uh, mood altering substances now. Have you been incarcerated since February 20th of 2006? Yes, ma'am, I have. Well, I, I know that there is some availability of, an, of alcohol, but it's not as if you've been on the street and free to go to bars and liquor stores. Um, so are you an alcoholic? Yes, ma'am, I am a recovering alcoholic. Uh, Yes, I am. Yes, ma'am. And tell me some of the other programs that you've taken that you think have helped you in some way. Uh, I've taken anger management, and uh, it, 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 along with the job that I have, has helped me to recognize uh, and admit that I, I did and I do have an, an, anger, an anger problem. What job do you have? Uh, my job uh, falls in the title of orderly, but I work. I have worked from 2009 until now in the, the Interfaith Chapel as a musician. Uh, in the, uh, I work with the Catholic ministers as a uh, Catholic peer ministry. Uh, as a music teacher. How has that helped you with your anger management? Because, uh, well, basically I work in church all day. Uh, I've had to unofficially and sort of exercise my talents in terms of being able to control uh, the way I respond. I respond to people that's suffering the same way I am. I'm not as aggressive as I used to in uh, responding to truck problems and troubles when they come my way. And then I have guys that, for some reason, they come to me for advice. So I have to try to listen to them, which I wouldn't do. In, I wasn't too quick to do in the, uh, before all of this happened. Now I'm willing to listen and try to uh, not be so aggressive dealing with people in a negative way. 
is I have feel that I have to, I have an obligation uh, to provide as much support as I can and be as humble and as helpful as I can in a positive way. And uh, my thinking is not the way I used to. Everything had to be my way. And I've learned that I've had to humble myself and learn to listen to a lot of people before I just act on emotions like I used to. All right. Well, thank you very much, Warden. What can you tell us about Mr. Williams? Nothing else. He's low risk. He has zero disciplinary reports since he's been here. Uh, he just based in a few programs. All right. Thank you. Did you not? That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Russian. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Williams. How are you, Mr. Williams? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'm sorry. Al from Rocha, how are you doing this afternoon? Oh, I'm still a little nervous, sir, but thank you. I'm, I'm glad I'm here before you. I'm, I'm going to read some information. And along the way, I'm going to ask you whether it's true or not true, OK? Yes, sir. On November 16, 2005, you were arrested for domestic abuse battery on Cynthia Williams. And you were incarcerated until February 13, 2006, when you had a revocation hearing. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And in that revocation hearing on February 13, 2006, the judge decided not to revoke you. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And he ordered you and made new conditions on your supervision that you live with your mother, Ms. Pearl Williams. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Right. Pearl Williams, right. And you are to live at that address and you are to remain drug free, alcohol free and submit to drug screen. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you are to have no contact with Miss Cynthia Williams. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And he said you can be released today to your mother. Exactly. Yes, Is that sir. right? Yes, sir. And seven days later, your wife was dead. Yes, sir. And you were ordered by the judge to have no contact, and you went immediately to live with your wife. Did you say you had spent the last two or three days alone, and you were using drugs? and you were using alcohol. Is that correct? I was using alcohol, sir. Okay, you were using alcohol. Yes, sir. In direct violation of the judge's order. Yes, sir. If that judge were to revoke you, your wife may be still living. Yes, sir. Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Rishay. All right, I don't see any other questions. So now we'd like to hear from Mr. St. Andrews. You can keep your seat, sir. We yes, can see yes. you. It's fine. Okay. You can go ahead and speak. They can see you. Okay. Yeah, I can see you. Um, I just wanted to uh, say that, you know, overall, uh, uh, my father, Mr. Williams, there, you know, he actually is an overall, you know, good person, you know. You know, with regards to what mistakes uh, that may have that may have that he may have made, you know, over time, you know, and for myself and many others, you know, he's kind of been a, you know, he's not kind of, he's really been a really great influence, uh, almost like a superhero to us all, you know, because of his influence, you know, I also became an educator, just like my sister is doing the same thing, you know, so, you know, and they'll. You know, and as a return, hopefully, to society, you know, he would definitely have all the support uh, of his family, 
you know, in France. Yes, sir. And thank you, Mr. St. Andrews. Um, Mr. Williams, before we turn it over to Mr. Jordan, is there a statement you'd like to make? Uh, yes, ma'am. Good afternoon again. I would like to thank the pardon and poor board for allowing me to appear before them this afternoon. Thanks to Warden Cooper and any other administrative personnel in our presence. My attorney, Eddie Jordan Jr., my son, Jonathan, for appearing before you this afternoon. This here is not totally about me, but about the victims who have been impacted by this horrible crime and the death of my wife, Cynthia Williams. I want everyone here to know that I accept the full responsibility for the death of my wife, Cindy. To my brother-in-law, Kenny McDonald Jr. And to Cynthia's family, my two children, Anthony and Antoinette, who were born to me and my wife, and to my mother, Pearl Williams, who is 98 years old, and who's prayed with me ever since this tragedy occurred. And lastly, to my family members, friends, and my community, I want to apologize and ask for your forgiveness. I would like to acknowledge members of the Louisiana Pardon and Parole board, law enforcement, and healthcare professionals who were impacted as a result of my action. I also ask for your forgiveness. I take full responsibility for the death of my wife, Cynthia, and I'm extremely sorry, remorseful, and grief-stricken because of her death. It has been extremely painful for me to think about the level of trauma, grief, suffering, and pain my victims have experienced and endured. I not only feel sympathetic toward their suffering, but I am also empathetic. However, I will never be able to understand the level of suffering and pain they have endured. To Anthony, Antoinette, Jonathan, and Joy, the loss of a mother for, for to the family is a tragedy and tremendous loss. Once again, I ask for your forgiveness. I would like to mention to the board that I have learned the true meaning of the word mercy. Mercy is love that expressed when someone experiences suffering, poverty, brokenness, and or sin. I am a broken man. Today, I appear before this board and ask you for mercy in making your decision and another opportunity to return to society. I declare today that I will be the man that God intended me to be, respectfully, Lester J. Williams. Thank you. Yes, thank you. All right, Mr. Jordan. I, I too want to thank the board for getting it's an opportunity to uh, to appear before you and 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 to consider uh, Mr. Williams' request for um, for a commutation of his sentence. Uh, I don't think that the board 
fully understands that Mr. Williams is, is a person who started out uh, uh, many years ago before this incident as, as a, uh, a man with education. Uh, he, has, he had a bachelor's degree and also a master's degree in, uh, in music. Uh, it sounds to me based upon what I've been able to glean from the file here that uh, Mr. Williams' family was actually uh, a very loving family. Uh, they were married for some 26 years or so before, before this terrible incident. And um, it was a loving relationship in that there were two children born of that relationship. And as I understand, Miss Williams also had uh, substantial education. So here were two people, uh, a mother and a father, a husband and wife, who, who both were, were doing well financially and educationally. And yet uh, we have a, a terrible tragedy. And, and I think much of this can be attributed to uh, Mr. Williams' alcoholism. And I, I submit to you that that is the reason why uh, his understanding of what happened uh, it involves gaps and, uh, and incoherent type of uh, response to, to exactly what happened. Uh, alcoholics do not fully recall uh, things that happen, and uh, they are subject to blackouts. And to Mr. Williams' credit, he's he's addressed that he was in denial for for quite some time, and it it apparently the alcoholism not only affected his his conduct and relationship to to the death of his wife, the killing of his wife but it also affected his relationships that took place before uh, this, this incident. And I would, I would suggest to, to the board that that is the real problem that Mr. Williams faced. He was a, a productive individual. He was working, he was employed, he had education, he had a wife who was, had education. Uh, my understanding is that she had a background in, in psychology and uh, she was very productive. They were working at the same school. Mr. Williams was a band director. He was a leader at that school. Uh, he, he was responsible for shaping uh, the lives of, of young people. And all indications are that he, he was doing a very good job in that, in that area. But alcoholism took over his life. And it caused him to not, not comply with the court's order. And, and it's true that if, if he had not been an alcoholic, I do not think that he would have done the things that he did. And he, he would have complied with the judge's order to stay away during that time period. I, I would suggest to to the board that that's the case. So he 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 violated the court order, and uh, as a result, uh, his wife lost her life as a result of what he did to her. Um, he's now taken responsibility for that complete responsibility. That impact statement is is just a clear, strong statement that he alone is responsible, no one else is responsible. And he's taken, he's taken control of his life by taking uh, the courses on uh, alcoholism, on substance abuse. And he's, he's admitted that he's a, an alcoholic, a recovering alcoholic. And I think that that would do, do him well if he went, when he returns to society, that he knows that he he cannot ever touch alcohol again, and that alcohol is something that that would cause him to lose control of his life again. 
So he successfully completed that program. And it's it's not a surprise really that he has not had a an incident or a write-up during his entire 18 year period, 18 years, is that it? Uh, here here at uh, Angola, um, he hasn't been subjected to to alcohol or or any other kind of substance. And yes, unfortunately, sometimes people do even here uh, get in. They they sometimes uh, become involved with substance abuse, and yet Mr. Williams has not. And that, that is an indication of his commitment to being a different kind of person, a new person. And, and, and I submit to the, the board the board that he would not uh, get involved in, in crime again. He would never commit the, any kind of crime, particularly this kind of offense, but no kind of crime. And, and all the indicators here or that he is a, a strong candidate uh, for, for uh, clemency because, um, because of his age in part. A person who is older is not, does, is not a high risk for recidivism. Uh, he's 71 years old and he has significant health problems. Uh, the fact of the matter is that his health problems make make his his uh, lifespan uh, uh, shorter, and so he would not be expected to live another twenty or thirty years, or or, or even a shorter time period than that. Uh, all of that indicates to me that he's going to live the rest of his life in a way that would be in keeping with, with the rules of society and the laws that, that we have here and that he would be a productive asset to his community. Uh, he has a family that's supportive. Uh, the board knows that he would go back and live uh, with his mother. Is that correct? With, with the son, I'm sorry. And uh, he, he also is in a position to, to uh, to earn a living. He has uh, a certificate in pesticides and also uh, another certificate in, in ministry. And, and these, are, these are courses and programs that he's taken since he's been at the prison. So he is not going to be a burden on society. Uh, he's going to be productive. He's going to be positive. He's going to earn a living. Uh, he is not going to get involved in any kind of activity that would uh, that would make the board uh, feel bad about their decision. Uh, he's he's not he's not engaged in any kind of substance abuse. And and you would say, well, any a person would always say that they're not engaged, but he's got 18 years of proof that he's not going to to get involved in substance abuse again. And again, I go back to the fact that alcoholism is his primary problem, and it really made him lose control of his destiny, of his life, and he, he is not that person today. And I ask, I ask the board to, to consider uh, giving him mercy, to show him mercy, and give him an opportunity uh, to to come back to society by by commuting his sentence. Yes, sir. Thank you. I do Thanks. believe the board is prepared to vote. Mrs. Johnson, I like we have a motion for executive session. Is there a second? Yes, I'll second. Uh, Mr. Marabella, is there any objection? All right. So we have a unanimous vote for executive session. Stand by. We'll be back shortly after discussing confidential matters.
Pass it. All right, uh, Mr. Williams, we are back in regular session and we are prepared to vote. Mrs. Jackson will be voting first. All right, Mr. Williams, um, you know, this is really, really unfortunate case. Um, you're 71 years old, um, but you've only served about a little over 18 years on this sentence. And as I look at your history of domestic abuse, your history of driving while intoxicated, when I look at all of the places along the way where the court system tried to intervene to put you on a different path, and yet in spite of all the times you appeared before court for either driving while intoxicated, or domestic abuse battery, uh, none of it, none of it seemed to deter your behavior. And so as I look at the case as a whole, uh, because of your history of domestic violence, because of your demonstrated record of disregarding court order. And the insufficient amount of time served on this charge, I vote today is Thank you, Mr. Roche. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Williams, based on a long history of domestic abuse, <laughs> law enforcement opposition, opposition from the victim's family, in 17 years and four months for premeditated murder is insufficient time served. Therefore, I'm going to deny your request. Thank you, Mr. Maravella. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, my vote is the same for the same reasons as my colleagues. Mr. Frank. I uh, agree. And um, Mr. Williams, I, I do agree with my colleagues. I think your attorney did maybe some good arguments and did a good job for you, but you know, you, you have an extensive history of domestic violence. Um, my vote today also is to deny. So today, sorry, your uh, application for clemency has been denied. Thank you, Warden. That concludes our business. We're adjourned. It's 328. Thanks for helping us out today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.